Hello everyone and welcome to this very, very special episode. All of my episodes are special. This is especially special because this is the first time I have a recording guest, Loki. You're back. Yay! <laughs> I am. <laughs> Crazy. I didn't think I'd be doing yeah. this again. Yeah, well, after last time, oof. Nah, it was fun having you last time. <laughs> uh, you have a new website since last we talked, don't you? Yes, we did. I now have Loki Souls. Yes, we did. You did. You have a website. Oh, listen, listen. You, you talk about the collective we, okay? <laughs> okay, let me ha- okay. Let me have this. Don't, I don't need everyone to figure out that it's literally just me trying to figure out for months on end how I can get this thing set up because I've never done a website <laughs> before. Yeah, it's a real operation you got going on there. It's uh, like a group full of people. Yeah. <laughs> all the little elves that work in the background. Oh, I wish. I and, uh, so hard. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you specify... On the website, you specialize, I should say, in translations of various Souls, which is FromSoft games. Yeah, at this at this point, it's becoming FromSoft games. Right now, we have Elden, now yeah. we have Elden Ring and Sekiro and like so many, right? So, um, yeah, so I, I cover a lot of FromSoft RPGs and stuff like that. Um, last time we were on here for Demon Souls, right? So, um, I basically just cover. What are the the major errors in the script from the localization side of issues? Because a lot a lot of times what happens is you have the Japanese script, you have the Japanese community, and they have their their theories, and then you have the English commu- community, and they're coming up with their theories, and there's a huge dis- huge disconnect. Um, and this has sort yeah. of been mended over time as the localizations have gotten better, but these errors still sort of persist. And you can kind of see a Demon Souls. I've always said Demon Souls and Dark Souls have the worst of it, um, and they've gotten collectively better. We're ho- I'm hoping that Elden Ring is going to have the best script yet, and that I'm not going to have to <laughs> to complain about too much there. But Bloodborne is somewhere sort of in the middle, where we're not really at the DS3 levels of meh, but we're not at Dark Souls 1's arrow of bleh. So. Yeah, yeah. You know, if they ever get their shit together, you'll be out of a job. Oh, I, I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> I won't, you won't hear me complain. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't do this thing because I want to. I do it because I am compelled to. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that, that was definitely that was definitely the the issue, right? So when I started when I started out doing this, it was mostly just because I wanted to shed a light on this. Like, I ultimately don't care if you agree with my opinion on some specific theory or something like that. Ultimately, what matters is that there are problems with this translation and you need to be aware of this. And if, like, if you want to, like, then plug your ears and ignore it, la la la, I'm not listening, that's fine, but if these are problems that are going to be addressed. And it becomes, it's because it's especially important to a lot of the lore, uh, to the lore community for a lot of people because this stuff affects how you understand events, how how scenes play mm-hmm. out, how care, how you interpret characters, like tons of things can change into because of localization blunder. So it's very important that we're very careful on what the original script says and what the possible intentions were going into writing it. So, yeah, yeah, with uh, with no uh, ill will towards the localization that we did get, though, right? Oh yeah, no, I have nothing against them. Per- like I, I've always, I've, I did an entire post actually commenting on this. My issue ultimately is purely on if you're going to if you're going to essentially pay in a localization company in order to translate your game and bring it over to the West. I ask that you please make sure that it's of a certain level of quality. Like everyone makes mistakes, right? We can always accept there a few a few blunders. Some of these are just inexcusable and oh and when they accumulate, they start becoming a bit more um, systematic as it were. And it just it becomes yeah. this problem where it's like you, you have to do it. And like I said, the localizations have improved over the years. I mean, look at Demon Souls original compared to the Demon Souls remake, which wasn't out when we were last chatting. So now we have a huge yes, point of true. comparison. Like half the errors in that were fixed. I would have liked the other half to got it fixed as well. But <laughs> listen, progress, progress. <laughs> I love how uh, the Moonlight Knight Vito was also called Beto, and we had what Rizaya and Lizaya. No, oh, yes, so yes, like. The one. Yeah, there wasn't even. I, I, well, I, I'm actually curious if there were even an edit. There was actually an editor in the the localization teams um, for Demon Souls and Dark Souls because it honestly doesn't feel like there was Qual- quality yeah. control was definitely not there. Well, yeah, I imagine because like especially with Demon Souls, that's like what is this? This is some niche fantasy RPG from Japan. Uh, just get the B team on it. Well, yeah, well, a part of it, I think, is is that um, you don't exposure. I like one of the things that I think is really driven because I'm like, they're not listening to my criticism. Like, like no one's like no one's like going, oh, this guy on the Internet, Loki, is, is complaining about us. We have to get our act together. No, no one's listening to that. What they listen to, I think, and I've always said this, it's always been suspicious to me. As soon as Dark Souls 1 got wild popularity, you start seeing an increase in the localization quality. So 
I think that a lot of times, the more and bigger the games get, the bigger and more popular from soft titles get, the more that everyone sort of feels like, yeah. hey, you know, there's more eyes looking at this. We should, uh, we should uh, take extra care. Yeah, you shouldn't uh, sell yourself short, though. I noticed. Uh, so here's a little. I don't know if I've talked about this on the channel before. I was well aware of Demon Souls being in production before they announced it, like the Demon Souls remaster. Because after I released the Demon Souls videos, including my talk with you, the first one, a lot of Blue Point staffers mysteriously started following me on Twitter. Oh wow! So, yeah. So you shouldn't sell yourself short, Logie. Oh, that's that's cool to need. If I played any small part about that, that's cool to know. Anyway, I, I I have no disrespect for all the people who work on that. Most of my criticisms are purely on professional level. Like I'm sure, listen, I don't know what goes on in their personal lives. Not interested, and I don't want anyone like <laughs> harassing them over anything like that. Like just make sure, like if there's problems, there's problems. They get addressed. They get addressed. Yeah. So, uh, without with this preamble out of the way now, the stuff no one cares about. Uh, the, uh, the segmenting of this video is going to be very similar to the segmenting I did when I did the, uh, original sort of story conversation with the Sinclair Lore podcast about Bloodborne, also on this channel, where it goes from, like, the prehistory of this world to the sort of generally more recent history, that being Bergenworth and the Healing Church, then the main narrative of the game, and I imagine we'll bounce around a lot because... A lot of characters and phenomena are relevant in multiple time periods. Especially when like they Willem. overlap, like history, especially like when you yeah. to, like the main history, you suddenly have like all these factions and things, and they're kind of overlapping with each other at different points, so. Yeah, yeah. I'm also going to be allowing you to take the reins more on this conversation than me, because you know a lot more about the translations than I do, uh, so you better get control effing your way through, through oh, your data oh boy, fast. Oh boy, we're, we're, that's gonna that's gonna be a long one. Okay. Just bear with okay. me on the timings, everyone. <laughs> well I'll, I'll I'll edit it. It's just it's 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 a it's, it's an issue for me exclusively. <laughs> well getting the prep work for this done was definitely a a, a chore, so thank you. Well that's true. That's true. <laughs> okay, so the prehistory of Bloodborne. Uh from the English game uh, let's just begin with, like, the great ones. What we know about them is that these are sort of celestial creatures, creatures that come from the dreamlands, if well, I'm not mistaken. Well, they weren't always. This, that, that, that's the thing that people need to, I think, gets overlooked a lot, is that they were originally human. That's sort of the idea with the great ones. Every every one of them. Yeah. Like they, well, the, yeah, they oh. were originally from Is. That's the idea, is that... And you see this, um, if I recall correctly... Um, so, like, when we go to the chalices for the root chalices and things like that, you can actually see that when it talks about l the idea that is touches the cosmos, and one of the things that um, the English sort of puts as, which allowed the Great Ones to function on transcendental planes of thought, the Japanese is much more clear, and they say, thus, they say that it is where the higher ones had once acquired transcendent thinking. So the idea is that oh. the, the Great Ones are the, the, the civilization of is. That's where this all began. Is were the original experimenters who succeeded in creating um in reaching sort of enlightenment or they achieved insight um because that's another thing is the idea the concept of of insight um in english is supposed to reflect this idea of enlightenment in japanese and it, it's a concept that miyazaki has used before he's used it in dark souls in in relation yeah. to logan he's used it with freck and things like that in reference to freck as the visionary he's the one who opens the way sort of opens the doors to enlightenment sort of concept so this isn't an, uh, a, a new idea for Miyazaki to explore, but well, it's this one where he has this concept that there were all these humans in Is that were sort of exploring and trying to get in touch with the cosmos. And this is how they acquired the ability, they acquired this higher level thinking, which made them higher beings, higher ones, so to speak. And that's sort of the, mm. the idea of the great ones, the Japanese term, is literally refers to um, a being which is in a higher place, a higher status, a higher position, and all of this sort of gets wrapped up into being both metaphorical and literal. They're both, like, physically higher, they're in the sky, the cosmos is in the, you know, the cosmos is in the cosmos in the sky. Yeah. And then, <laughs> so, um, you have this idea that they're physically above you, they're intellectually above you, they're emotionally and spiritually above you, so there's just these, these, these beings, and this is why they get sort of, um they get sort of grouped up and associated as gods for that reason because they have all this power right. and, and thinking and, and intelligence etc 
I had this uh, theory. I don't know if I... I probably didn't create it. I was probably told to me by someone. Mm. And I quite liked it, which was that human beings may even have originated as beasts and given human form by the Great Ones to better serve them. That means if if you... If, uh, if all the Great Ones were originally human, then that probably doesn't line up, does it? Probably not, because if you actually look in Is, I think at least the Darn. story dungeon version, you actually find a few uh, uh, scourge beasts, as they're called in English, in the in the dungeons, if I recall correctly. Like, there's only like three of them. It's a very small mob, but it gives you this idea that um, despite all this kin and all this stuff related to great ones and like sort of the choir and things like that, um, there's this small aspect which sort of gives you a sign that they went through a beast scourge themselves at a point, and that's uh. that's sort of a, the, these like few little beasts you find are supposed to be a remnant of that because obviously they've gone past that far long ago they've already they reached a level where everything was about kin at a certain point and they were creating lots of kin and then eventually except for Ebrietus, they achieved um the ability to become great ones and that's the idea and this is the, the thing with the great ones this is why the fumarians had to be created as a result because um to become a great one most of them the idea is that they when you become a great one your your thoughts you quote unquote you go to you sleep forever you die right and the idea is that your mind gets transferred to the cosmos your consciousness your spirit etc what we would consider yeah. the soul and when that becomes when your spirit now is sort of in a waking dream in the dream world now you have sort of this this level of autonomy and control in that dimension and your physical body is just sort of left quote unquote sleeping and so the thumerians are there to left take care of your physical body while it sleeps that's also a uh, a concept bloodborne it's still in the game but it was a much bigger deal like originally rather than touch the lanterns you would go to the hunter's dream by like sitting in a chair and going to sleep uh you can see leftovers of this idea with like mikolash who is like he's sleeping in the real world? Well, he's a mummified corpse. Yeah, yeah. But the idea is that he's just like he's like a Sukaushin Butsu, where he like sort of self mummifies, yeah, and then he's still Ram awake in the dream well. world. Yeah, it's the same. Is idea. Rom's, yeah, is, Rom is kind of. Oh, oh yes, that's right. Under the uh, under the Grand the, Cathedral. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. Rom, Rom is the same idea that Rom. You have Rom's corpse while Rom's spirit is in in the in the lake. Um, which there's a lot yeah. to talk about with that lake too, but that'll be for later. But like, yeah, so it's the same idea. The gr the great ones, the original great ones, so Flora and like sort of all these different ones we'll be talking about. A lot of them existed um, as like humans of is by all indications, and then they became, and then they became, they sort of most of them except for Ebrietus. Ebrietus is the only one who who has reached this sort of status of a great one, but only in the physical world. Her consciousness didn't transfer over. Um, to the yeah. to these cosmos. As a result, she her body ends up physically transforming along with her thinking that's remained here on this plane, and that's resulted her becoming the sort of Cthulhu abomination we see. And now she's sort of just left behind, like looking up at the sky, being like, ah, because this is another thing that people don't realize, and this becomes obvious as you read through um, some of the lore and things like that, is that the, the great ones, you can you see them in the sky all the time. They're, they're the stars in the night sky overhead. They are the stars. So, um, and I'm sure players oh. of Elden Ring, this is going to sound very familiar, but that's going to be something uh, separate. But the idea is that the great ones are Man, actually Man, Elden there. Ring is so, <laughs> Elden Ring is so big, you're going to have such a fun time going through that. <laughs> you beautiful, beautiful boy. <laughs> Sorry, it's, it's keep giant, going. It's a giant script, but yeah. The... <laughs> With, um, the great ones are stars, yeah. Yeah. So, like, this idea with the great ones are, in fact, the stars. And when you go to the, um, when you look at some of the stuff that they talk about in relation to the stars, there's, like, the, um, the Celestial Emissary, for example. That is, the enemy in the Japanese version is much more accurately known as a messenger from the star world. So it's this idea mm. that, so it's this idea that there's this entire, the, the idea is that the cosmos, the, the star world, the world of the, this sort of dimension of the stars, is where they're the ones sending down these, these emissaries, these quote-unquote angels, basically, to sort of spread their message or talk or communicate and things like that, right? So this idea that the, the stars send signs, the stars send meteorites, as we see, like this idea... Um, what is it with the, uh, the, what's it well, called? Well, I mean, the, Rom summons it, the living failures summon them. Oh, well, you know, like, A Call Beyond is a good example of this, though, right? Because yeah. the idea was that the choir were trying to communicate with a star, and the star basically said, no, it sends a meteor storm in response. And they're like, hey, <laughs> we can use this as a, we as a weapon, and they're like, okay, <laughs> failure's the mother of success, I guess. <laughs> But yeah, no, like, as a failure. That, 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 and the, ease. <laughs> yeah, it's like, ease. <laughs> yeah. 
East is older than Lauren, then. East is where oh, everything sort of starts. Yeah, yeah, because what happens is, and you talked about this in your your your, um, your commentary as well, with Bloodborne, is that this idea is Bloodborne is stacked as a as a setting. So it's it's sort of like um it's sort of like archaeological stratigraphy taken to like its absolute um, limit in the concept is that okay you have Yardam then you have Old Yarnum, then you have Yahargul then you have the gods the, the underground ruins the labyrinth the chalice dungeons whatever you want to call them um, and mm-hmm. that's got you got like up the upper th- you got like upper Thumer then like middle Thumer then you got lower Thumer then you get to Loran then you get to Is and Thumero Ill and all that and the idea is that every there, I think if I remember right, they're split into five depths, and like the idea is that the depths are supposed to increase your difficulty, but it's also used to give you an idea of the history of these places. Mm-hmm. So, and it help, and that helps you get it. So, one of the things that that is kind of impressive about the Chalice Dungeons is that because of the way they're designed, you can't really get a lot of that sort of in depth. Like, okay, we're gonna gonna create all these very specific like objects and items, right? So things have to be more general because of how it's all yeah. um, generated. But yeah, it's much. It's just very modular with these these rooms and these assets, and we just sort of shuffle them around. Yeah, so things become a lot more general as a as a yeah. byproduct of that. But one of the nice things about that is that when you're um, when you're sort of looking at some of the more general history type of things, they were actually able to pack a lot more in. You see the same thing with the messenger baths. They give you like lots of weapons and things that you can um, buy, and each one, um, each like weapons you can get, sort of at each depth sort of gives you an idea of okay so in this dungeon this is associated with these weapons and this dungeon is associated mm-hmm. with that you can kind of get a, a fuller idea of the history of those places and well, again there's yeah. like, a lot more we can talk about as we get into like stuff like Ludwig and things like that anyway but like so when we're talking about like is Loran and stuff like that the general history seems to go there was is and then we got into um after the great one after the humans of is became the great ones they had other humans which we we can presume is probably like lower classes stuff like that from just basically like the the type of um cultures that we see emerge and you have these sort of they become sort of like their human servants become grave keepers and they become they is becomes a graveyard so they start turning into start entombing the bodies and taking care of them and all this stuff and then eventually they start um they start saying hey we want to have our own kingdom so that's where thumera ill comes in um and one thing that's worth pointing out about thumera ill is that um it's the japanese is pronounced more tumeru um, and or tumor, mm-hmm. and the idea is that um, it's a play on both. Uh, the Japanese fan base has come to the conclusion it's a play on the word tomb and sumer, which or the 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 sumer Sumerians. civilization, like the idea of the earliest human yeah. civilization. I thought you were going to say tumor, like a cancer. No, 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 no. <laughs> tomb as in tomb, like the the actual like you know underground, like a grave, like sort of like tombing something. So that's the idea yeah. with there, and the idea seems to be because the idea is that it's like one of the oldest civilization, known civilizations that sort of um, become like a living graveyard. And the idea with ill, well, that that's kind of obvious in this game, right? <laughs> So, like, um, yeah. the idea is, like, sort of this tomb of, with the disease and things like that. And we can see this, that they start blood drinking and all these things. And then you get to Loran, and Loran becomes the second civilization that gets built on top of it. Because as time, as, like, if if Is and Thumera Il are sort of, like, these graveyard civilizations that are sort of buried or dead, then eventually a new civilization is going to be founded on top of it. And then eventually that's going to get bury, buried and everything. And then another civilization gets found on top of that. And we see that the Thumerians keep building and building and building for a bunch of history. And then finally we get to Yarnum, and Yarnum's built now on top of that, and it's the current setting that um, has become the site of all the craziness that started with Is. Yeah. In the Chalice Dungeons, we have um, the Hintertomb Chalice Dungeon. Does that have any significance, or should we move on to the Thumerian Canehurst War? Um, it's interesting in so far as that it, it the idea with the Hintertombs is that they're known as like the, the remote or the secluded graves in Japanese, and the idea is that they're basically the perimeter um, part of the Thumerian civilization. So if Yarnum is built, if if the if the gods' graves, quote unquote, uh, are yeah. the tomb of the gods is basically right under Yarnum, then we can think of the hinter tombs as right under the places around Yarnum. So like Forbidden Woods, um, Hemwick, Canehurst, uh, places like that. These are places where you could expect a lot more of sort of hinter tombs like uh, uh, graves yeah. and culture to have uh, risen up. From memory, Hinter is German for behind, but I don't quite, rem- I, d- I don't remember if that's true. It's something true. like, it's yeah, been... it, well, it, it's like, it's, I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be a play on the word like Hinterland, so it's like the idea of like, it's something, because yeah. the idea with the, the, um, the idea with like, uh, say, Forbidden Woods and Hemwick and places, those are part of the, the frontier grave, if I remember right. 
and the, when you're when you're warping around in Bloodborne from the the tombstones in the Hunter's Dream, and it, the idea with the frontier graves is that those those are supposed to be the remote regions. So these idea that are outside of Yarnum and sort of like in the remote yeah. territories. Yeah. And this is the same right, idea. Then. The idea is that the basically Thumerians have their own sort of frontier remote regions, and that's the Hinter Tombs. Yeah. Yeah, all right then. The Thumerian Caner's War, which we see remnants of in the Chalice Dungeons, with the uh, with the fluted armor sets, which yeah. we also see illustrated in the Canehurst paintings. Uh, so the the why does the war start? Is it just because Ka- the Canehurst sect decided to have a queen, and the Thumerian sect didn't like that, or? It seems like there was some sort of um, there was some sort of political divide. It might just be they weren't happy with how things were being run. Um, there's also because what we have to see is that there were a lot of signs that um, Thum- Canehurst seems to be a very much a reflection of Thumerian society in general, and that there's this higher class that they like to have the mm-hmm. highest quality blood that they drink. For example, we see some of the same um, lost child children of antiquity. Um, in the Thumerian Ill and like deeper into the Chalice Dungeons um, where all the sort of upper class people is, right? Like it's the capital where all the, the, the nobles and the royals are sort of supposed to be concentrated. So you get this idea where the, a lot of people with these this um, more corrupted quote unquote blood show up. And the idea with Canehurst is that it's this civil, it's this, um, it's this remnant of nobles who seem to have sort of the, well, it's in the name, right? With Cain, the idea is that they betrayed their brethren and they ended up going out. Oh, yeah. oh, <laughs> I always thought of like a, a walking stick, like fancy no, no. people with top hats. No, 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 it's, it's, it's the hill of Cain. <laughs> so no, it's because <laughs> it, they're on, a, they're, they're traitors on an island. <laughs> Okay, okay, that makes way more sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It might also... Do you think it has something to do with the... Um, no, surely not. Like, the immortality of the royal bloodline. Because surely that comes after Lawrence goes to Canehurst, right? Well, no, well the, 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 the idea with the immortality comes from the idea of the corrupted blood, right? Is the idea is you have these more wills, more vitality, and it eventually leads to this this sort of... This corruption we see manifest in the in the Thuma- in the Thumerian and the, uh, and the Canehurst queens. This idea of some mm-hmm. sort of immortality that they possess. Um, with with Canehurst, though, when we look through like the translations of some of their their objects and items, for example, like off the top of my head, I can think of what, well, like the uh, like those uh, the mist stuff, or well, I'm, ju- I'm trying to find the exact I- item. I think M- mist is a good place to start, though. So let's see if I I should have it in my thing. Yeah, okay, yeah. The, so, like, for example, when we talk about the, uh, the the secret myths that are supposed to be handed down only in ca- in the castle, but we also, of course, see it around Yarnum, and that relates to the Healing Church, and around in the Chalice Dungeons, because that's where they got it from. And the idea is basically mm-hmm. that the, the Cainter sect were a bunch of these no, a bunch of the nobility who seemed to have wanted to be the ones in charge and and perhaps were coveting the blood for themselves but then they got kicked out and they basically had to form their own little kind of quote unquote kingdom on the on, they get to be their own little kings of the hill um <laughs> up, up above and um, over time, this seems to have, they had a fascination with um, foreign cultures, so this may have also played a role into there. Because again, you have to keep in mind that you basically have these societies which basically make their living just drinking blood, like blood drinking from their own underground for centuries upon centuries. And they're basically just sort of... Um, just sort of living outside of the sun's light, and there may have been. And we see this again with same with Yarnum is this idea of these these civilizations that kind of want to live up up under the sky instead of just sort of like digging forever, <laughs> building tombs and more tombs. <laughs> yeah. And the when we get to sort of the the modern day Canehurst, like up before the main events of the game with the Healing Church. Canehurst seems to have more or less degenerated into basically just this sort of... They have some of their, their Thumerian traits, but they become extremely muted over time. Um, yes, because they're uh, they're no longer getting any of the old blood into them. Right, right. Because well, cause it, it, cause it, what, hap- what needs to be understood, though, is that the sunlight plays a huge role in sort of the lore oh. in a very indirect way. Like, again, this, this might sound... No, this might sound familiar again for people who played Dark Souls and Demon Souls, especially if you've read my theories on uh, Demon Souls' origins. From but... Software has three ideas, and they just <laughs> repackage them over and over again. Well, yes, they do. I, in in my Bloodborne commentary, I was like, "Here's the thing. Here here are like ideas they go back to, and if these six things show up in Elden Ring, I wouldn't be surprised. These six very specific things." 
And every single one of them I got right. <laughs> Everyone. Exactly. Uh, but yeah, so I'm, it's, it's the I'm same I'm sorry, thing, please. No, but it's the same please thing because you're, you're right. Because yeah. what happens with sunlight is that once again, we have this idea of the sun being a very huge part of the cosmology. In this case, you only see, for example, two moss, uh, two moss and things like uh, the different flowers and stuff, which are supposed to be like spawns of of dead blood, right? Like, the idea is that this stuff sort of generates out of the blood. But it only seems to happen in the tombs, or as we also see, in caves. So areas with extremely low to zero light. So the mm. lack of sunlight is a huge, has a huge effect on allowing the arcane in blood to manifest. And we see this again when, when you put um, when you put things under sunlight, it becomes lost over time. So there's this very clear idea that um, Kanehurst, by being out in the sun and like no longer is it sort of in this cloistered area where it can have this high concentration of, of Thumerian blood that it was able to leech off of from the lower classes or whatever, or the dead. It's become this sort of thing where they 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 they, lo- they just lose those traits. It's still there. It's still in their blood, right? Like they're mm-hmm. still having. They're still drinking blood. Like the Kaners has a long history of blood drinking. They're vampires, basically, right? They're the <laughs> for the setting. But the idea is that they're that because they've been sort of above ground, living under the sunlight for so long. It's helped mute things. And this is again, again something that um, this is something that unfortunately we don't have a lot of translation on. But it becomes very, when you look at the environmental storytelling, it becomes very clear. Just look at the patterns that you see with other items and and uh and characters that's very interesting about uh elevation playing a role in this because we have in like dark souls 2 we have the sunken kingdom and like the sunken king who's better translated as the king of those things which sink into the ground kind of uh we have like well, well the of idea with the, the sunken uh, king is that he's the king of the deep bottom right like it's this idea yeah. of this the, the idea is that like sort of you have this very deep underground and like the idea of the poison that become that poison which is released because of the the events with the sunken king and his, the death of his kingdom becomes sort of the basis for when um uh mytha creates her little po- harvest valley in order to sort of harvest that poison use and then she turns into a dragon snake monstrosity bathing in it so like like all, yeah, but of... it's. It, I'm more so just talking about the idea of like they they go back to this idea of things which rest in deep like deep places of the world and how like like how you were saying the arcane is able to sort of mold itself and manifest itself better in Bloodborne where sunlight isn't. That's a very interesting take on this idea. Uh, if it is a carryover idea from previous games where you have like the abyss where you fight the four kings. Uh, or yeah, Miyazaki likes this idea, especially, and you, you see this with From Software in general, where they like to have the they like to go with very simple general symbols. So this idea of you know, yeah. like heavens are in above, hell's down below, right? So you try to create this sort of gradient where the the more up you go, the more brighter, the more heavenly, cleaner everything gets, and the deeper down you go, it gets more dirty, ugly, demonic, vile, like. And then, like, you obviously get to, like, the lava-infested area, because, again, like, you, you associate deep ground with lava and things like that. And um, it, it's a very consistent theme. It shows up in Sekiro, even, where you have, like, the top of the waterfall. It's, like, the uh, the Sakura dragon, this heavenly divine being. But if you follow the flow of the water through the land and you reach, like, the lower ends of the water, you have people who degenerate it by eating, like... The sediment of dirt and ch- crap like that. Oh yeah, yeah. Miyaz- Miyazaki loves to loves his uh, he loves his sediment and uh, uh, stagnation, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> he has like a Jenga tower of ten different ideas, and he just restructures it differently. <laughs> well, hey, it works. <laughs> yeah, it's also the idea of like the the uh, the transient sort of nature of boundaries, both sort of philosophical and physical. Where, um, f- for example, um. In Dark Souls, this is very, like, you get fire, and all of a sudden you have binaries, and you, you see, like, Gwyn's kids, he has, like, the Nameless King, and he has Guinevere, it's, like, super masculine, super feminine, then you get Gwendolyn, and it's, like, wait a minute, the binary is sort of breaking up here, and, you like, all these, all these very clear lines in the sand that the world sort of operates under, it's even seen in Elden Ring with, like, the Golden Order, it, 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 things become sort of muted and transient over time. 
and this sort this is the source of a lot of the conflicts in those games. Well, the idea because the idea is that always that there has to be like there's this order, there's this way of things of how things can or or, or ought to be in the minds of the characters versus how they can or ought to be in the set in the larger setting, right? Like Gwyn has absolutely his, Gwyn imposes his order over the order of the world, and this creates a huge amount of conflict because Gwyn's order is by its nature not as permanent or orderly as as he he would uh, he would want it to be, and this creates it exists conflict. only in. So far as he's able to violently or like or manipulatively enforce it upon others to believe in it. Yeah, exactly. And it be, and as we and as we see up until Dark Souls Three, it becomes this point of like it, it, it's it's you're, it's he's causing he's caused more damage in trying to force uh, things to be the way he want he selfishly wants it to be than how it should be naturally. Like regardless of what, of what you the merits of the Age of Fire are in the, in like sort of a grander philosophical discussion, it is ultimately always going to be temporary in the grander scheme of things. And no amount of haranguing and force by Gwyn and his uh, successors is ever going to change that. Absolutely. Berg and Wirth started digging around in the Chalice Dungeons and they discovered old blood. We're now in the uh, history, cha- history channel, history segment of the uh, conversation. Yeah, Berg and Wirth, of course, an interesting... Bergenworth's an interesting one for various reasons, but... I imagine we'll stick on Bergenworth for a little while, because Bergenworth is... It's kind of like the nexus that connects the happenings of the game to, like, the the prior history of the game. Well, it all began with Willem, right? So, Willem... Mm. Willem is, like, your typical rich, affluent socialite from, like, just... Like, imagine him as, like, your, your typical rich Englishman, right? Like, he's got a lot of money in the Victorian era. Well, what's he gonna do with that money? Well, he wants he. He's well, gonna go we... and sh- shoot a zebra right, right. or a giraffe. Well, well, well the, the common thing in the in the in that period of time was to go out and do like amateur archaeology. Some people would go out in their backyards because they had their vacation home, and there was this beach with lots of seashells, and they could collect. And hey, look at all these cool like seashell collections. It's got these ancient fossils among them, or whatever, right? So like, <laughs> or you, or you. Some have, people or, would go to Egypt, or yeah, yeah, they're, they're uh, like, digging up these yeah. things, and they're like, they they find this ancient, uh, ancient dried mummified hand, and they throw that out. They're like, oh yeah, gross. Oh look at this though, this this pretty like shiny little object thing in there. And now, now modern day, everyone's like, no, if only we had the hand, we could DNA test it. Oh. <laughs> Oh my god, I just realized, like, you look at the story of Bloodborne and you're like, oh, Birkenworth found some old blood in some dungeons and they decided to drink it. That makes no sense. But in reality, when people found the mummies, they had, like, unwrapping parties and they would eat mummies and they created paint from them and crap like that. Yeah, exactly. So, like, it's the idea that you have this decadent, <laughs> rich society. And Ber- Willem is is this person as a character. We see he's got these two manservants with him and, like, one of them we see dresses very nicely so you can tell he has a serves a very well-to-do master and obviously he founds an entire university. You need some capital there. But, um... But the idea is that Willem basically, he hears about these, you know, Yarnum is supposed to be this place that's located in the far, it's located in like the far east, like a hinterland. So you can kind of think of this as probably like, it's got a lot of obviously like German influence and stuff. So I, I think a good parallel would be to think about it as like this, like this remote far east German prov- uh, like little town. Um, well, not little, but, like, the idea is that it's, like, this town in, like, the forest of, like, like East Germany really far. So it's kind of close to the to the Orient. So you have all of this Eastern influence coming from not Japan. Because <laughs> there's always a not <laughs> Japan in Miyazaki's games. Oh, of course. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then, so you have a lot of these influences coming into the, the this quote-unquote little, like, uh, uh, town there. And then you have all these um, Western influences, obviously, which are predominant here. But they're all separated because it's this own, like, it's almost like its own secluded little village where it has its own little culture that's preserved for since ancient times, etc., yeah. right? And but it's also sort of, uh, it's also sort of, sorry, it's also sort of a pre-Bismarck uh, sort of unification of Germany where you have, like, Yarnum exists as its own sort of sovereign state, even though it is just a city and some of the land around it, right? Right, right. Like, you see some other cities like Yarnum in the background, like, around where Forbidden Woods is supposed to be, and it's supposed to give you the idea that Forbidden Woods is sort of, like, a nexus point between, um, uh, sort of the outside world and and that, and you see influences of that in the village in Forbidden Woods. But the idea with, with Bergenworth is that Yarnum had all these, this graveyard in the Forbidden Woods, right? Like, this graveyard, and the one farthest from, from Yarnum it has all these giant graves, right? And these graves are supposed mm-hmm. to be graves to the el- their elder gods. You actually have concept art um, 
in the Japanese version, they literally just say, here's the grave to the Elder God. And you can see corpses bowing, like they're sort of like prostrating over, bowing like, oh, please. And sometimes they have uh, runes that they've received from answers from their gods that are sleeping there. So the idea is that you have these these humans who have been buried here and because they're, they became great ones, they get these giant ass graves. Um, <laughs> And the idea is that these, you can even see the back of the graves. They're like being eaten away by phantasms, like these tiny little slugs. So like, yeah. if you, if you, if you, if you think of it like that, you have Willem's like, oh, there's these, these graves to gods or types of thing. Like I've heard about this quaint little story about Yarnum, right? It's got this weird culture. They got these kind of weird little like cultural habits and customs and things like that. And like, it's this little out of the way place, but you know, that's kind of a neat thing. I could kind of like, you know, go expeditioning on, right? Like that could be a fun little thing to do. Right. And that seems to be what happened with Willem. With Willem, and then he he investigates the graves, and you can actually see this if you go from Ber- if you look at Bergenworth, like from the back of Bergenworth, which is basically just Willem's residence. That's the area we explore there. Um, it's yeah. just like a big like observatory and like res- personal residence for Willem. If you go from the back of Bergenworth and travel um, through it, you'll notice all these giant graves. They're all kind of like crooked and they're they're broken, right? They're at different elevations and stuff. So it's like okay, they haven't been well preserved after all these years. But then you go a little farther back and you go down this little hallway, right? And you find this little enclosure, stone enclosure. Someone built stone walls and a little gate for you to go through. And inside is this perfectly erected um gravestone right right up front i think there's like one like one village local villager like standing there like staring at or whatever right and that's this where, is you, where f- you uh this is sorry this is where you summon those guys prior to the uh right, right, the right. it's around that area right like that boss fight yeah. yeah like around that area you find that enclosure with this grave and that's that seems to be the grave that willem first investigated like he found one of the god's graves he said oh this is good preserved i'm going to build an enclosure to keep animals and stuff from like getting involved and right all that, so that way I can kind of have some control over keeping this little archaeological dig site secure. And that's where they discovered the blood. And then it's like, okay, now we, we've got to look more. And he starts digging more, and we see underneath Bergenworth there's this, um, there's this this little uh, lid, right? Like this little uh, what's it called? A little like a uh, basement, uh, like little like hatch yeah, that like you can a... open. Well, you can't open it, but the idea is that you could open it. Like if a trap door like or something. One. Yeah, yeah. It's supposed yeah. to be this hatch that's kind of like the one you see in Odin Chapel, where you use that to get into, like, the sewers for Odin Chapel, and that takes you to their little its little gra- underground graveyard next door where you fight, uh, what's his face, the Father Gascoigne. So, Father Gascoigne, yeah. Right, so it's the same idea, right? You, there's a hatch you could open, and it could take you underground. And we know from concept art and things that this was definitely supposed to be like a cave level, but you can easily infer that it was going to be something similar where you would go underground, and this is probably how they got access to the the uh, the Chalice Dungeons originally, right? Like, the idea was that you were going to... Um, they, they were digging, and they were trying to look into investigate more into this. Ooh, this is kind of interesting, this blood stuff, kind of useful. And then he goes and he finds this entire tomb complex, these underground ruins, right? And he's investigating, and his uh, his servants go mad as they do this expedition. Doing so, <laughs> Willem's like, "Hey, there's a lot of there's there, there there's a lot of interesting stuff down here." And then he basically founds the University of Bergenworth, and Bergenworth means um, uh, burial place. Something worth. stone. So the idea is that it's burial the, the, place. Yeah. So burial place worth or the value. He's trying to show the value of the tombs of the graveyards that he's found oh. in Yarnum. So that's the entire. I thought purpose it was of. just. I thought it was like Berg, B E R G, like stone. No, no, no. Bergen means like a burial place, a grave, a tomb, etc. So oh. the idea is that it's trying to show you the, va- the the worth, the value of these Yarnum graves that he's found. So the ones both above ground and, of course, the ones below ground, which are probably more relevant to him now, especially after he finds Iz at the bottom. So, hmm. so yeah, so this right. is, yeah, this, th- that, that's where it all starts, really. And uh, he, of course, gets students. Does he like? Okay, this is like a bit of a Lawrence aside. What is his backstory? Is he just like a kid who who meets up with Willem? Is he also like an aristocrat? Do we know any of this? We don't really get much on a lot of the students at Bergenworth before they were students, right? Um, but obviously, Willem is someone who comes from a well-to-do family, but it's it's a lot less clear. Like you could probably assume most of these guys are probably like decently well off, considering they're sending their kids to some remote university so far away, right? Um, mm-hmm. so they might all be people who might have been doing so, but it doesn't ever become relevant enough to infer properly, I think. And we don't have anything in the translations that give us, like, good, like, instances on, like, are they, like, noble scions or something like that? So, unfortunately, we don't have a lot on that front. What we can say, though, is for sure, is that pretty much, like, Bert, like, Willem as a, as a character, his big focus is trying to understand and use the blood, because he sees its potential for humans. Well, 
I, I shouldn't say the blood. He sees the potential of the arcane that the Great Ones uh, access, the power of the cosmos. He sees that as something that could be very influential in advancing the human race, right? Yeah. So, so he's this this person who really sees... Um, I, I would compare him again, like compare again to like modern day elites, like your your Elon Musk's, your Jeff Bezos, your Bill Gates, like these people who they have lots of money and they like spending on charity and they're like, oh, we're gonna build these 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 new technologies that are gonna let you put a chip in your brain. It's gonna help you advance, like so sort of advance human potential in human society, right? It's the same idea with Willem. He just sees it through like this arcane magical stuff. But it's like, well, how yeah. are you gonna get um how are you gonna get like so many people behind this weird arcane magical stuff? Well, first you have to understand it. So that way you can help like share it with people and understand it. And then you also want to put it in a way that's going to make sense to this Victorian era, sort of everything now has to be about like science, like everything has to be sciencey, right? So we're going to now make yeah. this into this academic sort of field that we're going to be able to, to translate and control. And again, this goes back to Logan and um, Freck, this idea of a man who tries to take art, tries to take the powers of the gods. And it's like there are these divine mysteries that we have, and we're going to turn them into arts of man, with which man can control and we can disseminate across. So Willem is just seems to be the culmination of that concept that Miyazaki finally gets to express. Yeah. All right. How long ago do you think uh, the Birkenworth excavation stuff? Like, uh, is that like what twenty years before the game begins? A little bit more. more. I would less? say I would say probably anywhere between like um, I would probably as far as like at least half a century, possibly like get like forty, fifty, maybe like sixty or seventy years. I would Ooh. I would go no further back than a, a a century if I wanted to really push it. But I would say it's probably closer to half a century because we have lots of characters. Like Eileen talks about how she's get how she's starting to get how she's getting old. Um. Yeah. Uh. German's been German's been stuck aging in the butt nightmare for who knows how long. Like he's like, oh, Lawrence, I'm old and useless. <laughs> like the Japanese script, it's especially sad because he's like, oh, I'm old and useless now. I can't do it. Like he's like, like he's just really like this guy who's just like, listen, just just stop. I like I'm in, this isn't the immortality I was promised. <laughs> <laughs> we also have Mikolas. He Mikolas. Uh, I think his slider indicates that he's like middle aged, but he he's been in a nightmare for some time too, and it's. Like, even if he fell asleep when he was an 80-year-old man, like we see in uh, Braidor, and we even see in German with the boss fight to that, you're not really tied to your physical age in the Dreamlands as well, much yeah. as you are well, in the, the physical well, world. in general, like, one thing I've seen, and we'll, we talk about, we'll talk about this more when we talk about the um, Mensis, is that a lot of people seem to try to associate Mikolash as, like, a student of Mensis. I've never gotten that impression reading the script. Um, no, I isn't he like he's the leader of Mensis, right? Well, he's the lead. Well, yeah, he seems to be the leader of Mensis by all indications, but not, not in far as he's a student of Bergenworth before he became the leader of Mensis, I should say. Oh, he's not a student of Bergen. Not as far as I can see. Like, it seems the idea with Mensis is they just LARP as students. Like, they take the uniform and they put it on, but they aren't actually students themselves. Like, one, like for example, I, maybe this is because it's called the School of Mensis in English, but it's actually not the idea that they are... It's not school in the sense of, oh, let's go to a little... It's our little academy type of deal. It's school as in, like, a faction or, like, a school of thought, right? So, yeah. like... So like uh like so it's something in terms of like they have this focus and we we've talked about this before the idea with mensis is that mensis is supposed to be if I remember right it's Latin for month and the idea with Japanese yeah. is that the term for for month is the same kanji used for moon so it's the idea is that they are basically the school their school of thought focuses around the moon and we see that in their rituals and trying to get the blood moon and all that stuff so that's the yeah. idea behind them but the, the idea is that as a faction they they are they don't seem to like it doesn't seem like nikolash has any connection to um to the to Bergenworth. Um, yeah, to Bergenworth. Like uh, only so far as the choir also has a connection to Bergenworth, right? Like it's the same Do you idea. think then do you think then that his sort of uh his disparaging comments about Rom maybe are given to him by Lawrence. It, it, well, because here's well, here's the thing. A lot of what we see when it comes to like, Ber like the Bergenworth generation is they're the ones who experienced a lot of stuff. Like they're the people who went to the fishing hamlet and were there when Rom and stuff happened. What happens though with say um, later generations? You have the choir who inherited their thinking straight. Like they, they're a direct line to Willem through the student, through Lawrence and the students, etc. So like the general, well, let's yeah. just say the the traders, right? The traders who left Bergenworth to continue doing blood. Um, blood experiments, and then you have um, uh, Mikolash and company. And Mikolash and uh, the Mensis school seem to generally get their ideas. They get some from Loran. They borrow some of it from Lawrence and his per per like personal efforts and things like that. They take a bit from um, Rom and uh, 
uh, costs, and then you have like sort of all of this sort of gets mixed together in sort of this this strong anti choir basis. And and uh, we've talked about this before in that uh, the choir and uh, the choir and Mensis their their big divide like both of them accept that blood is incredibly critical in order to reach transcendence, right? Like they're both they're both in agreement mm-hmm. on that. The problem is the order of things. They the idea is that. Um, the choir thinks we need to do all this blood experimentation so we can in, in, uh, sort of rise ourselves to a certain level, and then our gods will then t- communi- get communication with our gods, and once we get in contact with our gods and we have some sort of tell them, hey, look, look at us, they'll drag us up and take us the rest of the way. And the Mensis' idea is sort of the opposite. They have this idea where it's like, okay, we need to communicate with our gods, and they'll give us the secret so that way our blo- we can make our blood experiments go the right direction. But both of them agree that the blood experiments are are the, the critical step needed in order to jumpstart into becoming great ones right because those are the the, that's the medium for metamorphosis and what happens with with bergenworth is that willem's like uh no we're not doing this anymore (laughs) he 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 sees the first he sees the first beast and he's like uh no (laughs) this This was a mistake we're putting a stop to this but it's also interesting because you have like uh lawrence becoming a beast and like that's like Oh, look at what happens when you just recklessly experiment with the blood. You just become a dumb beast. And then you have Willem, who's like, well, look at what happens when you just sit down and meditate all day. You just sort of become a mushroom. Well, yeah, so it's well, this idea of, like, you, you're both just sort of stignif- stiltifying. None of you are really getting to where you want to go. Well, yeah, well, this is the idea. This is sort of the tragedy of Willem. And this is something that, again, doesn't get picked up, I think, in part because of the localization. If we go look at the, um, uh, what's it called? The, uh, the eye chords. Yeah. If we look at, let me pick, draw, drag it up. As a man, yeah, here we go, here we go. So if we look at, uh, so like if we look at the I chords, for example, you can actually see that um, one of the things when you get from Willem, I think this is provided by the uh, the fake Yosefka, right? Like you kill her and she provides you this I chord. One of the things that the the English one kind of says is. Um, the idea is that, okay, you get this eye cord. Willem wanted this, so that way, to elevate his being and thoughts to those of a great one by lining his brain, brain with eyes. The only choice he knew if man were to ever match their greatness. Well, the nuance is a slightly different in Japanese, and that it, the idea is that, okay, he sought this so he could get the thinking eyes, yes. It's for the sake of harboring eyes within the brain and acquire the great one's higher thinking, or perhaps, so again, this is supposed to be a signal of, okay, let, we'll try to specify and get a little bit more, like, be a little bit more precise and accurate in what we're saying here, for the sake of competing with higher ones as man. So the idea, this is again one of the things that people don't realize is that Willem didn't want transformation at a certain point. Like oh. he, he that was his thing. He 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 gave up on that line of thinking. Like if he ever had this idea that okay, we should transform, he gave up on it real quick cuz he saw what happens with um with beasts and all that thing. He did not want this. His idea is that he wants to compete with the great ones as man. He wants all the powers but none of the downsides of transformation. So that's why okay. that's why stuff like say um, Carol is such an ideal. This would if Carol introduced something like the what's it called the little like the the, the cast iron thing, but it's for runes. If he yeah. introduced that invention to Willem, he, he it would have been his ideal, right? Because the idea is that Willem's like, oh, it doesn't involve blood, no transformation, no metamorph. It's just putting that power straight into your brain. So and just, it's also it's it's again this idea of taking the divine sort of arcane and codifying it within a scientific man understandable framework. Yeah, yeah, it's to make them arts of man. That's the idea. Willem does not want to be a great one. He wants to have the power of a great one. That's a very yeah. important difference because once you understand that, all of his actions you see afterward make sense. He bans the blood. He says, no more. We're not doing this blood experiments. We saw what happens with the beast thing. Like, this just, this isn't, this, this is why he has this big adage. Like, no, okay, blood, you know, we're born by blood, makes us human, and then we lose our humanity. Like, always fear blood. Like, blood is not something to be messed with. And so he doesn't want to deal with any of that on that front. And this is why he, the same thing you see with him with the, the phantasms. He puts some phantasms in himself and we see he turns himself into a seed bed. We see this idea with how they're like growing these like little like yeah. mushroom things out of his back of his head, and he's like, he he he's he's been basically stuck like that for a while from by all indications his own desire, his own force of will of saying no, I'm not going to transform, I'm not going to transform, I'm not going to transform. But as we can see long term, that causes his brain to stagnate as well because when you're trying to basically his body's turning into this thing that's inhuman, but it's not letting him go all the way, so it just sort of kind of leaves him in this weird limbo spate, and eventually like his own brain starts losing control over his body at a certain point and so you can see the same like tragedy of willem and that he wants to try to he wants to try to have all the ups he's trying to discover the the secret the little the secret like formula in order to get all the upsides of of being a great one without ever being an actual great one (laughs) because he doesn't want to be a cthulhu monster he wants to be a man (laughs) 
Is there any indication in the game that you can um, that you can cross the boundary into Great One, sort of the mentality and the powers of a Great One, without crossing the physical boundary as well? Well, so far we don't see that in the game as far as I can recall. Um, and there's nothing in the descriptions that ever sort of make that... Like, it, it may be theoretically possible, like, again, but, like, whether that's practical is another matter entirely. Like, Willem definitely wasn't able to do it, and he seems to be the only yeah. one that, that was able to do it. Like, he was the person who was like, okay, we need more eyes within, we need to think. Like, it's all about, like, this sort of mental enlightenment, right? Like, it's this idea of we will just sort of think our way into having this higher being in discovery. But the problem is that we discover is that you can't sort of separate the blood from the person. Even if you don't drink blood and right, right, and all that, like, with the blood transformation stuff, like, you, your body is, ma- your, your, you are blood, right? Like, like, your body is 70% at least blood. So, um, and depending on your interpretation of the cosmology, probably more. But the idea is basically is that bl- blood is sort of part of you. It makes you what you are. It is you, effectively. Um, yeah. And sort of, so, sort of this idea of, like, the physical transformation that comes with blood and the sort of mental transformation that comes with blood, they go hand in hand because it all comes from the same source. And this is what makes it so difficult is that Willem is trying to separate those two out. And it's just, it, it, it becomes too hard for him. Um, and then what, one other thing that we, I think this is probably a good point we could talk about with the Rom and the fishing Hamlet incident at this point is that, um, Rom sort of becomes a, 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 a turning point where Willem starts losing control and he never really gets it back. Um, we see like, we see like teetering around there, but it never becomes this point where he's able to keep, what, what, it's sort of like you open Pandora's box. Like he's able yeah. to, to ban blood. And we see like, it seems like this is how he gets in contact with German. Cause it's like, oh, hey, there's this, this specialist over in Yarnum who, who sort of deals with beasts like this. Maybe he can help us do that. And then like Gurm's like, oh, this is some interesting stuff. Immortality, almighty power. Hmm, you know, I, I might be interested in following, <laughs> you know, I'm getting up there in years. I might be interested in following this, huh? <laughs> German specializes in uh, hunting beasts, doesn't he? So we have beasts in Yarnum before the introduction of the blood? Is oh, this yeah, just, yeah. Like, this, this is something yeah. that we have. There, there's old beast legends. So, like, one thing that doesn't get translated very well is what's it called? The the church pick or whatever? Um, it'd be more accurate to call it the church stake. Because the idea, it talks about old stakes in, in the old beast hunting legends and things like this. So, it's, again, uh. it's, it's playing on that old idea of, like, you know, you stick, like, a stake in the vampire heart or whatever, right? So... Yeah. Same same concept here. It's the idea of, oh, like, there's these old legends of things that are very much, like, our real-life legends about, like, hunting vampires or werewolves. And you, you take this, like, wooden or silver stake and you have to put it, jam it through the heart and, blah, blah, you know, like, all this stuff. Like, same idea. Yeah. And the idea was the church converted those legends into a practical item. And that goes into, like, holy blades and things like that. But... It's the same idea right. is that there's these these constant references in the script to, like, this time of, of beasts sometimes going. For example, we have the example with, um... Uh, the the league the league are an example of like these foreigners like yeah they're chasing this beast back to Yarnum right we have these like constables of like this neighboring again goes back to Forbidden Woods is is close by to like these these other human settlements that can travel to Yarnum rather readily yeah these constables are like chasing the beast back and then the beast ends up uh getting one back on them while they're in the forest and kills them and then like uh Volter ends up uh killing and eat like he ends up eating the eating the beast as sort of like this sort of like revenge play and he ends up discovering his own runes and now he's a hunter in the league right so yeah same same and, sort of concept is that beast and like same thing with yamamura or uh in uh in uh in uh in the DLC. nightmare yeah yeah in the nightmare yeah. same idea right like he's this guy who like a beast like killed his family or something like that right and he's got he's on a quest for vengeance against this beast um, cause the idea is that these beasts seem to be those who get, it seems like beforehand, Yarnum basically just like drove out the beast, right? And he just let other people deal with them. <laughs> like, he's just like, ah, ah, no, it's like John became a monster. Arr, get him out. Like get the pitchforks and the torches and they're like, Arr, chase out the monster. <laughs> and the monster goes running off and then you get like consoles who are like, no, go back, go back, go back. Back you, mo- you file monster. And then Yamamura's like, oh, it ran back home. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hunt it down and kill it. Like. Yeah, you have this very, it's a very clear, like, uh, cultural history of, like, Yarnum's always been drinking blood, and they've always had a beast problem, and so, so eventually, you have someone like, um, German show up, and, oh, well, the idea with German is, th- this is something that's actually very interesting that people don't seem to pick up with German and the, the first hunter of hunters, um, who was probably also one of German's first apprentice, or at least, like, partner in, in crime, basically. Eileen, then. Oh, no, before Eileen, we're talking about Eileen's master type of deal. Oh, um, oh, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, like, the 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 Blade of Mercy and the Burial Blade, right? Um, 
they're supposed to go like they're both made of meteoric iron um or siderite and the idea is that um the implication is of course is that basically they got access to a meteor which we've talked about this before is the idea is that like a, mm-hmm. the, the the great ones are the stars and the stars when when, when they get pissy they just send meteors in response like <laughs> <laughs> uh screw you hey 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 Okay. Ah, you uh, yeah, now I have to censor that. Damn it! No, no, fine. Let me, keep cut. No, let me. Let me. No, read. it's fine. I'll I'll keep it in. No, no, let me redo it. I got this. this okay, about, okay. See, I, I warned myself. I, I I was even careful. I was like, ah, I, I won't say. <laughs> no, no, screw. Still work. Doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> so you see this idea with the stars. So you take the star. You take the stars. They're the great ones, and the great ones basically, whenever there's a pro- problem that they don't like, they just send they send a meteor in response. They're like, ah, go I'll go off with the habit and yeah. all that stuff. So what happens with um. What happens with uh, with German or in the first hundred hundreds? You can imagine like this person who's living um, who's living in this town um, who sort of sees all these be- this beast problem, and that that seems to be German's prime motivator for for so much of his life is like he wants to hunt the beast. He wants to get rid of the he wants to get rid of this beast problem that exists in Yarnum, and and part of that is for him is going through and being like, okay, well, how am I gonna supposed to do that? And like so. You can imagine this man is like sort of like praying to the gods. Oh God, send me a sign, whatever. And it seems like his prayers reached one of them, and one of them said a meteorite response. It's like, no. <laughs> and then, uh, but we, we and we see this rather consistently is that the gods, ba- whenever the the great ones basically send their response, it always seems to somehow get interpreted in the most positive light for the people. Like, oh, God has answered. He's telling me to take this iron forge into a weapon and go hunt the beast myself. <laughs> <laughs> and. <laughs> And that seems to be the idea with German, and they create this these weapons out of meteoric iron, and they start hunting beasts, right? And then, well, the, the suddenly the hunters, we start seeing some of the hunters that he of his apprentices start having uh, issues of their own, um, and they start becoming beasts, or they start becoming drunk on the blood of the hunt, right? And then we see one of his partners, um, who also has the blade of mercy, becomes the first hunter of hunters, and he's a for he's a foreigner. German may be the same way, but these are people who sort of come in here, and they're like, okay, I'm going to. I'm going to now basically hunt all the the hunters who become drunk on the hunt, so that way we can all sort of like preserve this little harmony. So that way, I check the hunters, you ch- you check the beasts, and like everything sort of works out. Yeah. Right, and then the, the, then uh, then German sort of gets on the train with Willem and becomes interested in this sort of like this all powerful. And uh, as we see, he eventually gets <laughs> Will Willem doesn't go the way he kind of wants things to go, so he ends up leaving along with with Lauren. So. It's yeah. like, well, it's like, listen, sorry. <laughs> listen, sorry, this uh, guy's, I, I like this guy's ideas better. <laughs> listen, listen, I've killed a god. I'm in it, like, in for a penny, in for a pound. Well, this, okay, so this is a good thing to talk about. Is actually that god we're talking about in question is cost. So this is actually yeah, something really fishing about hamlet the fishing hamlet massacre. Like I want to ask you, uh, before we get too far on this, the fishing hamlet massacre, it ends, or, like, it, Maria throws away her weapons, and, uh, goes for sort of a simple life she doesn't like the uh the blood connotation of the weapon of uh the uh of the con- conventional canehurst weapons which yeah, is why she's very she... atypical for her clan very yeah true. so she assumably leaves then because like she what is it she sees german join lawrence in this sort of yeah we really need to use the blood which she isn't on board with or well, well, what we have to understand is how did maria meet german and how did a lot of this start and this goes because I, I, this is another thing. A lot of people seem to think that the Fishing Hamlet massacre happened like when the students were still part of Bergenworth. No, no, no. That wouldn't fly with Willem. That, that was all. That was Lawrence. <laughs> that, was, that was after they left and everything, right? So, um, like, Mar- it, the, Maria seems to have been picked up as one of German's apprentices because she's really into the the beast. She likes the beast hunting aspect, but she doesn't like the blood blades and sort of all this sort of use and over uh, overwhelming reliance on blood. And obviously, uh, German, at least ostensibly, seems to represent, like, everything she likes of this idol. This man who just uses conventional, normal weapons. He's sort of like this old rogue who goes in and challenges the beasts of his town, whatever, right? Um, and mm-hmm. this seems to have been this seems to have been a apprenticeship forged in the wake of Lawrence coming to Canehurst and uh, making connections there. So sort of before that, the Bergenworth had done a expedition type of thing to Fishing Hamlet, which makes sense because the idea is the Fishing Hamlet is some fishing village out um, nearby. Like we see north of Yarnum is a ocean, right? So like there's this idea there could be any number of villages which are just dotting the coastline somewhere there, right? So, yeah. So the idea is that it came in. The, the village was just a normal fishing village. Um, seems to have done whaling and stuff. Um, but it looks like they were they weren't just whaling normal animals. They were also whaling um, cryptid type of creatures. And we see these same skeletons in the um, the chalice dungeons again. And it, specifically, these are things you find in like 
the the remnants of like the sewer system in like the dungeons and stuff so like you see them mm-hmm. in like these old these pits and like sewer grains and like all these things and there's like they're just like at the bottom of the muddy uh landscape and you see the same thing in the fishing village so it looks like they were wailing um these large like arcane creatures which were transformed by costs um just by influence of being like around the great one and stuff like that right so yeah Eventually, they come in contact with Koss, and this is something that I, I, I didn't realize until I was going through the script, why people had this idea, but this idea that Koss was sort of this, the, a corpse that washed up on the seashore one day, and they all decided they would worship it, right? Like, this was an idea that I found was a, had a lot of credence in the English community. That isn't actually what it says in the Japanese script. It isn't said that Koss washed up on the seashore, which is, I'm pretty sure, what the, um, the parasite item you get from killing the orphan, uh tells you it's actually that she was abandoned on the the shore and this is relates to her death right she was killed on those shores and her body was just left there on there so it's not like a beach whale scenario right like very important distinction yeah exactly so the idea is that it's a living cost who gets in contact with it and the idea seems to be that cost wants a kid well like all the other great ones (laughs) getting a kid is very hard (laughs) So one of the Koss's idea seems to be she's going to uplift the villagers and try to create basically her perfect uh, husband, uh, sperm donor, let's say. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. And uh, that obviously doesn't work because this well, catches the attention of the Bergenworth defectors who decide to, uh, they well, have they have their own plans, basically. Well, 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 well this is the idea, right? Like, the idea with the with the, the fishing hamlet, and you can see this a lot in their, 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 their they have their priests dedicated to cost, and they have this, like, electricity arcane power that they manipulated as a result and all this stuff. And they, the cost gives them, like, food, gives them food and things like this in order to subsist on, and that transforms them, and cost is like, okay, it's all coming together. We don't know how long cost has been planning this, like, she's been maybe been playing the long game she's like okay it's all coming together and eventually she gets herself pregnant but as we see there's um there's the there's spies from the church uh amongst the villagers like you know that random beggar there like he's you know that harmless little beggar in the shadows of the village you know just waltzed into town one day seemingly you know constantly like just there like begging for for you know just a coin in order to get by for one day you know he's not suspicious whatsoever (laughs) Wait, then, who are you talking about there? The so if you if you actually recall in the nightmare, there's a point where you find a fishing villager, um, and you see him. He's brutally going down on a corpse there, and when you actually kill him and get to the corpse, you figure out it's a corpse wearing the church spy outfit, the same one that Simon and company wears. So it's the idea to make him look like this unassuming, raggedy old beggar that just you know oh. he's he's on the street corners or whatever. But this is the church's spy. These are the church's spies, and normally they're used in order to get a heads up on the beast scourge. Though, as the description acknowledges, how can you really tell if, before the symptoms show up, right? So it's like, yeah. it's sort of, it's sort of like well, who whoever the, whoever they if they think it's if they think it's a person, you're dead. You better <laughs> doesn't matter. <laughs> that if you also actually explains have it. how. Uh... That also explains how Simon knows about the fishing. Oh yes, yes, yes. That, probably, that's sort of the yeah. idea, right? Simon is from this early. He's he. The idea is that he is from the Japan. I think he's in the English. He said like one of the first hunt hunters of the church or whatever. Um, the Japanese is something like he's he's a hunter of the earliest era in the treatment church, right? So he's from yeah. way back when. So he's someone who was if he wasn't involved in this incident, he's at the very least definitely heard about it by the nature of his work and his colleagues and associates, right? Because he's one of these spies. Um, and he's one of the, the ideas that, yes, you have these beggars that are just, you know, just unsuspicious little, unassuming little guys on the street corner, you know, like type of people that anyone in society overlooks, right? Like they're below your notice. They're below your eye line, Right. Yeah. Um, but really they're, they're reporting in and they're like, uh, they, they report back to the church. Hey, cost got pregnant. <laughs> and that's the idea huh. is that Lawrence is like, well, German, I have a job for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the, the umbilical cord from the fishing hamlet, that's not the court that Willem sought. Uh, no, 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 not that one. That one seems to be developed in the fake, uh, the fake, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, Yosefka. That one seems to be something that was created in her experiments. Okay. So, like, she produces it, like, she's the idea, oh, I can see, I can, like, she produced that in herself. And this is something that needs to be, like, this is something that's sort of worth talking about. The choir actually is perhaps the most successful in getting their plans across, at least. Um, more definitely well, more until so than school the, uh, until the ritual destroys everything. Well, to some extent, like, I don't know if they would have ever succeeded per se, but they, they definitely see more success than Mensis as far as getting what they, uh, getting what their end goals are. At the very least, they, they for the most part, the question is just if the Great Ones are ever going to actually respond, because they seem to think of the Great Ones as these benevolent deities who really want to help when it's like, no, they just want babies. <laughs> you, you, you just, you just exist to give them babies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, but like, yeah, so the idea is that, um, 
it wasn't that the, the that umbilical cord was something that Willem wanted. He wants umbilical cords in general, and we see in the um, we see in Bergenworth that there's a lot of experiments on trying to create Great One babies artificially. Um, and this again, this seems to be actually something the DLC explains as being a response to what Lawrence does, because because the idea is that Willem and company they already went to the fishing hamlet as part of their expedition, right? That's where Rom gets in contact with Koss, and stuff goes down that causes Rom to become a great one. And this is where, like I said, Willem starts losing control because he can't really get his students to not want to be interested in studying the giant spider. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, hey, hey, you're our former colleague. Uh, you're now a giant spider thing. Can we study you? And they start having, again, more interest in transformation again. And you can't really get around this. And the more that Willem sort of is staunch about this, this is where Lawrence and company are like, okay, we're leaving. We're, we're, we're going to go out on our own and stuff. And, and Willem is basically, and this is something that else people don't realize. Bert, it wasn't like um, Lawrence and company betrayed them. So now like they don't have anything to do with each other. Bergenworth and Yarn and and the in the Healing Church were still um, were still uh, overlapping. They were still in c contact together. That's the point of the Gatekeeper, right? The idea is that the Gatekeeper is Bergenworth's watchman. It's mentioned in a note. And um, when you have the when you have the Gatekeeper coming in, uh, he's supposed to just sit there. He's one of the old man servants, right? He went mad and whatever, but he's still he's still loyal to Willem. So he's doing his job, just sitting around, basically listening for, hey, what's the password? Oh, you know the, the you know the whole fear of the fear of the blood, right? Okay, so I can let you in, and then you can go to Bergenworth, and you can sort of exchange notes, basically, right? So the idea is that they're still in communique, and that's the idea with the the church giant you see in the um in the uh what's it called the the classroom building, the lecture hall or whatever it's called. Yeah. It's yeah, like same idea. It's like you see him among the research tables, and he has fi flaming fists. So this, again, it's this idea of, hey, um, Bergenworth, here's one of our church giants we captured and enslaved. Uh, could you like study and maybe figure a way to give us like better beast hunting weapons so we don't waste all this silver making giant axes for them? And they're like, oh, okay, we study him, and oh, what if we give him like flaming fists, and he could just like punch the beast to burn them to death? <laughs> I think his internal idea is like Franken knocks, or something <laughs> like that. They're all called Franken something. Yeah, that, well, they're obvious, like Frankenstein, like ripoffs type. Like every, every, every uh, like it's very obvious. Like when you take the the what was it, gothic horror, and like uh, which I'm amazed it hasn't been done. If it, if it's been done before, I'm amazed it hasn't got as popular as Bloodborne did. This idea of merging gothic horror with like literally from like literally just the next era, like a few decades later, the uh, the cosmic horror of like Lovecraft. Yeah. Yeah. It's a uh, it's you you see a lot of it in like uh, COC like Call of Cthulhu modules. They have, like, era-specific ones, some take place. I, I love uh, cosmic horror in the American West. I think that's a really fun sort of idea. Oh, well, <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting <laughs> thing to think about. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, um, yeah, I also like, uh, this is sort of an aside, um, the idea that Bloodborne opens as, like, this gothic horror game. Then it transcends into the, like, this, it unfurls and reveals itself to be, like, this cosmic horror story. But at the end... It it go it winds back down to being gothic horror again, where it's just you need to cite like you need to bring peace to this ghost that still exists. Right, but well, another thing that's worth pointing out is that um, and that's the idea with Kos, right? Kos's Japanese name is Ghost or Go, like yeah, ghost. that's a ghost. So, yeah, so that's the idea. Um, and one of the funny things about um, when you go into the 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 idea of the great ones is that they have the trappings of like cosmic horror but they're really not they're more like uh they're more like your traditional demon or or fey creature right like this mm -hmm. this sort of entity which can be mischievous or villainous it can be sometimes helpful for you but you really don't want to rely on them right like compared to yeah. like say the idea of cosmic horror is these unknowable creatures of like beyond like of beyond our comprehension that they just drive you mad like a lot of like Miyazaki seems to riff on like, like sort of like rips a, a lot of this uh those like trappings for it but then like when you get down to it the great ones are more um a lot more uh mundane i guess i should say compared to like the yeah, cosmic well, proportion monstrosities like you said earlier they are just human right like that's the idea right like that because that it goes to their origin they were just human and they have very human motivations they received the they they, they received the enlightenment and the desire to become higher beings like that's the idea with is right like it's always goes back to this idea of of, of of sort of surpassing human evolution and becoming this grander being. You see this in Demon Souls. You see this to some extent in Dark Souls. Mm. And you definitely see this in Bloodborne. This idea of trying to become beyond man. And what does that mean to become beyond man? Well, the Great Ones figure it out and they realize it kind of sucks. Because now one of the main purposes for humanity to sort of procreate and create and leave something a better generation of you is kind of hard because now you've jumped to the almost to practically the end of the evolutionary line. 
So yeah, and this is the idea is that now I- I Miyazaki compares this to the idea of how uh, more advanced civilizations that has become it, the birth rate has seen a huge decline, obviously in Japan, but in the West in general. This idea that there's this huge, just this idea that these adva- uh, the more we advance as a civilization, the less we're having babies, or for whatever cultural or social or personal reasons go into that. And Miyazaki's just sort of applying that now to this idea that on an evolutionary scale, they've now hit the end where it just becomes extremely difficult now to produce a true heir. This is the idea with phantasms too right like what what is the difference between say a phantasm uh like say uh, a great one producing a phantasm versus say producing a actual like a great one child so to speak right well the idea is that the phantasms are self-produced they are a part of the actual great one there are aspects they're like they're like the vermin you find in the blood of beasts yes exactly they're like this by it's a self-creating byproduct right so like if a great yeah. one if a great one needs to serve it, it could just pop out a piece of itself as a phantasm, right? And it becomes its own little thing. But it's basically just a lesser aspect of it, right? And the same thing when we take the the remnant of Ebrietus and we could summon a piece of Ebrietus from that, even even after we killed her or whatever. So it's like it's this idea that these these are sort of like just self created little pieces you cut off of the great one essentially and like say with cause like all these parasites exist within her body or whatever and you can like take one of those and make them a weapon and combine them with other phantasms and all this stuff so yeah same concept and then um that, that, that's sort of the idea is that it becomes this very human motivation for the great ones themselves it's like okay well what are we going to well what are we going to do well we need we need now we need a lesser being to help come in but we have to somehow make this lesser being not only be able to give us a ch- child either impregnate us or we impregnate them or whichever it is we also have to make it somehow so that it creates that it has to be something way that it can create a something different but also in some ways better or new right like some something that's sort of like us or maybe even better than us and that becomes incredible that's part of the reason why it seems the evolutionary angle is so difficult um Mm -hmm. because you you can't yet you have to have it like you can't be too different from us but you can't be too close to us either yeah otherwise you just sort of get um a degenerate sort of evolution well well Well, otherwise uh, otherwise otherwise the great ones wouldn't deal with humans at all they would just be screwing each other so (laughs) yeah yeah all right so look there yeah so um lawrence leaves bergenworth takes all of his students, uh, probably some stay behind. Well, yeah, uh, we see a fair number do. Like, those are all the people that become yeah. the monsters we see in the, the lecture building, right? So, like, we don't know how big it is, if it's a majority or not. Like, at the very least, he took a sizable chunk, right? Like, Carol seems to go with him. Like, a bunch of a bunch of these students sort of kind of are in his same boat where they're like, yeah, we want to keep on using blood experiments. We're sorry, master. <laughs> <laughs> um so they go they go off and as we as we know from alfred they go to uh canehurst because canehurst mm-hmm. has canehurst again much like the much like the the fishing hamlet scenario um there's this peaceful this idea of like a peaceful interactions with this other culture that's nearby that has a history with the great ones that we can take advantage of um and obviously these the bergenworth is an archaeology and a history uh place so it makes sense that they understand and they've looked into researching the general history of these places if only so they get more legends that might help inform them about the the about the ruins under under their feet right so yeah and and i want to talk a bit about that it, so originally uh i used to think that what happened is this is the chalice dungeon and then you the canehurstian tribe or sect they sort of you know they dig up and they build the castle over this I no longer think that because, like that that tunnel near the entrance to uh, mm. that sort of smack in the middle of the courtyard, you wouldn't you wouldn't like that would be a courtyard. So I, I'm thinking surely the uh, the Lawrence and the and the gang they duck that whole thing up to get into the chalice dungeons. Well, here's the thing: we know there was a building there because we can actually see remnants of like staircases and stuff that led there. So there definitely okay. was something there. And my thoughts and my conclusion is that it's a mausoleum. And we see this stuff in relation to Hemwick and some Hemwick content with like, um, if you've seen some of Lance McDonald's content, you've seen some of this, this idea of seemingly we collect different items like uh, coffins and things like that. And we would assemble them in this sort of uh, carriage. And then we would see it probably with the idea. And we, it seems like they only modeled the inside because probably the idea was that you would just go inside the carriage and like sort of like stow away and it would take you to Canehurst. So it's probably this idea of oh, Canehurst. So like how probably, we enter, like how we go to Nido. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's probably yeah. this idea of like, and you've talked about this before, the idea of probably starting in Hemlock at a certain point. It was probably some idea like um, you would come back later on maybe and do that. Again, this is a bit of speculation on my part. But it seems to be the idea would have been something like there was a mausoleum there 
um, where that would have, like, where you would bury a lot of the nobles of the Canehurst clan, and by extension, they would have access to the tombs where, like, their Thumerian ancestors would have been buried, would have been, right? Okay. okay. So it's probably something like, there probably was something, I think, I think that's fair, I think that's fair to say. What I agree with you with, with the idea of the, the, the courtyard is that you see a lift that's a shortcut to the library, and that's very interesting because that seems it's very likely because it's like okay, so you enter the courtyard, right? Okay, we can go through the main entrance. There's like also this building that goes to the mausoleum, but we don't know if there was an entrance to that. It seems like it was just access from the ro- the the building because all the the remnants are connected to the remnants of the the building where we find the queen. So it's like the royal building, basically the royal abodes, let's say. Mm-hmm. So like you have that. It's like okay, well, there's also this lift you could take that takes you up to the, the their private library huh it's like that's kind of interesting for like if you're just a new visitor well it makes sense if you think about how lawrence comes in and he's like hey i want to make friends with you we got this blood stuff hey you know you've got this great history maybe we want to kind of look through your library sometime okay we'll give you ready access we'll maybe, build this lift here yeah maybe maybe kill you one day and steal your <laughs> child you know <laughs> anyway <laughs> Hey, hey, Lawrence, Ixne on the child. Eh? <laughs> exactly. But exactly. But that's the idea, right? It's like they go to to uh, Kaners and they're like, hey, are you interested in having a blood baby? <laughs> and <laughs> and and uh, and our Kaners queen, Annalise, seems to have been very enthusiastic about this idea. Yes. Yeah. And, and they were all they were like, OK, sure, we'll, we'll help you with your research and all that. So like while while the the while like the mit the. So, like, the Japanese um, for the blood ministers is more accurately blood treaters, and the idea is the healing church is the treatment church. This idea of, like, you're getting medical treatment with these people. And mm. the the idea is that they were... And you hear this in Japanese dialogue with German. German knows the, 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 tre- knows the healing church primarily as the blood ministers or the treaters, right? Like, his idea is like, ah, oh, yeah, the, the, tre- the, bl- the treaters as the treatment church is now called or whatever. Like, for him, he's like, okay, like, these are the, how I knew them because they didn't start out as a church. They were just like, they were like your resident uh, snake oil salesman. It was like, hey, we've got this great new tonic that could totally be able to save you and cure all your illnesses. It's called blood. <laughs> Heal what ails ya. Exactly. Why you, you, you good man. I'll pick a random man from the crowd. Why you, sir? And it's like a guy wearing the same clothes. Uh, like he, he's also wearing the healing church garb. The, 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 no, it, it's the it's the spy garb. Just <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is, you sir, you random beggar, but strangely handsome. Perfect. Come on, here. With, <laughs> be like, hey, has that guy been around? I don't know. <laughs> so Who's like, yeah. Guy? But like it's the exact idea. It's like they come in and they have this this new fancy new blood treatment that's totally going to make things revolutionize the medical field. It's gonna be better than anything you've had in your culture. That's all about healing and and and, med- and treating yourselves and all that, right? With blood and things like yeah. that. Yeah. So they 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 come in and this is where things. This is where like Yarnum sort of falls under the spell because like hey, we don't trust foreigners, but you know they bring some good blood. <laughs> 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 and then the idea with um. Do they distrust foreigners prior to Lawrence, though? This this seems to be just a general... Yes, it seems to be just a general... um, People don't like Yarnum because Yarnum has this vampiric blood-drinking quality, and Yarnumites don't like them in turn. So (laughs) it's sort of this idea where bigotry for bigotry, right? There's a lot of... There's a lot of... I mean, when people don't like Yarnum, Yarnum keeps shoveling their beast problems into their neighbors. Well, yes, fair yes, enough. Yes, yes, fair enough, right? <laughs> we don't like you drinking blood, and we don't like that all these beasts seem to strangely come from your neighborhood, your direction. <laughs> fair There's also fair. that weird red moon that sometimes just hangs over your 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 city. <laughs> this is t- <laughs> yeah, you know what? Y- y- Yarnum's just a weird place. <laughs> just don't deal with uh. it. Anyway, but the the idea is that yeah the, the 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 idea is that they're coming in at the the students of Bergenworth they're coming in and they're these 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 medical treaters right like they're these new doctors that are totally mm-hmm. going to make things better for everyone in Yarnum and they basically this is how they get the influence to start turning into the church and you can actually see this in old Yarnum there's two churches there's the church of the of, I think what is the English called the Good Chalice or whatever the, the idea good is that chalice, the, yeah the yeah, the, the, the idea of the chalices by the way is they're supposed to be holy grails like that that's the Japanese term like the holy cup the holy grail and again uh, okay. it's, yeah so it's a reference to that um and against this you know the whole the, like you know the, the cup of christ sort of idea right and the idea is that that's the church of the cup so there's no it's not like that doesn't seem to be the actual name of the place um it's just that's how people identify it because um because that's where the the, the old church where they had one of these thumerian chalices that seems to have been brought with them in their religious practices and things like that again this goes back to like again inheriting thumerian culture and things as the the, the layers keep rising right 
Yeah. So the idea is that there's two churches. There's this one church, which and, and we see ends up getting burned. And then there's this other church that we go through where we hear like all the beasts like praying, like, oh, like all this little, like weird, like singing they've got over like the, the crucified or whatever. Um, uh, yeah. Scourge beast. Yeah, no, yeah, not the, scourge beast. Is it a scourge beast? No, no, it's the bloodthirsty beast or, or yeah. Right. Or yeah. Yeah. The blood starved beast. Yeah. Blood, right. Right. Sorry. I'm thinking of the Japanese. Yeah. The English is blood starved, right? Blood starved beast. So, um, Again, that if you look at there, you see the same coffins and same ritual blood on the altars and stuff. So this seems to have been the original church where the healing church was operating out of. Um, and they yeah. were, you know, taking the bodies and it's like, hey, look, you know, these beast problems. We got to, you know, we got to kill the beast. Well, you know, we, we're going to take these these court these corpses off your hand and, you know, we'll just dissect and research them real quick. <laughs> So say, hey, what say, are you what are you guys doing with those uh, corpses you're taking? Hey, don't worry about it. How about that, huh? <laughs> hey, uh, you want another blood vial? Well, if you insist. <laughs> <laughs> so like, yeah, so like, it's 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 all a big scam, right? It's a it's a huge scam. Is that the 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 blood ministers are basically Kanehurst is trying to create a blood baby, right? So they're trying to yeah. get this blood, and they're t- using some of the blood. It's sort of like how we see with Hemwick, how Hemwick sort of gets used as a way. It's like, hey, Hemwick, can we give you bodies for you to cremate and get body parts and all this crap? You know, you give us some of those ashes you got there. Those are some those are some really useful things for our bullets. <laughs> <laughs> so same, same idea here is that um Kanehurst is getting a lot of that blood it's being used in order to help create the blood baby and all these things in exchange you have all these experiments that the blood tr- the healing church is able to do out of the, doing so germ in, in his mind he's always going to think of them oh yeah it's lawrence and the blood because he knows them personally before there was ever this church thing right and he knows it's a yeah. scam so he's like oh yeah they're now <laughs> called the healing church or whatever but you know like whatever yeah so oh. um that goes into what we're well. Um, that goes then into the idea that old Yarnum used. Th- there used to be old Yarnum, and then we see the the latest version of Yarnum up above. So there's new layer gets added of the there's the old city, and now there's Yarnum up top on top of the valley, and you get the cathedral ward, which is basically this little church town. So it's sort of like its own little Chinatown thing where it's part of Yarnum, but it's ki- part not part of Yarnum. It's sort of like somewhat of its own like independent little like sort of state kind of thing. Yeah. And we see that again it's the same a, yeah. idea where it connects to a lot of uh, a lot of um, it connects to a lot of different places. They have again you see the, the the clock tower that's in the old church tower. It's this celestial tower with the special little like face that's all for like communicating with the stars. Same thing gets built now up atop with the grand cathedral and all this stuff. So yeah. Yeah, so all of this is now tying together as we're going through the history. We're getting closer and closer now to the the big event, which is, of course, uh, Koss is pregnant, and then German comes in and just... <laughs> German and his hunters come in and start uh, causing problems. And yeah, then, and they do it They do it in the name of Bergenworth. Or the fishing hamlet assumes well, the, it the was his, the Bergenworth. Well, the fishing family... Because here's... Again, this goes back to my point. The fishing hamlet knows it as Bergenworth. Because they don't know about this... What he, They don't know about... They're, they're their own little, yeah. like, isolated village. So they don't know... They don't know assumably, any Yarnum or Healing Church or any of that. So they have nothing assumably about Assumably, they, they remember German and, yeah, and they're, Lawrence they're, they're, when they so, came with Willem. No, no there's... Yeah, they're seeing... Uh, not, not even... It may not even necessarily be German, per se. It could also be Lore... Because like, we don't know... Because here's the thing... Um, it's very likely that a lot of the the because something you have to understand is a lot of these quote unquote doctors they're also hunters right because that's the idea with church hunters right they're also the doctors so to speak right like the what at least the the higher ranking ones in the white clothes these are people and even the lower rank ones we see they also have like they they wear these medical gloves for surgery and stuff because they got to get hands on so the idea is they hunt these beasts and then they start like dissecting them on the spot if they can right. So yeah. it's not just your tape. Your, it's not just okay. We'll take the coffins. We'll take the coffins off your hand. It's also oh hey, you know, before let's just you know get it, you know get it as fresh as possible, right? Like oh, it's still it's still alive. It's that that liver's still alive. Let's look into that and study that. Like like this is the type of ideas that they're really trying to you know cover all the stops, right? Yeah. And so it's okay. very likely that you have Lawrence and company were probably present as well as German and his hunters. And they're going through. And so as far as the villagers are concerned, oh, it's Bergenworth. It's those damn Bergenworthians. They, they came in and they're, they're, um, they're now destroying our village, right? So in their mind, it's all Bergenworth because that's how they identify it. Because they remember when Willem and Rom and, and Lawrence and company were probably coming in before during their initial expedition, <laughs> their original field trip to the, I like, to the fishing hamlet. I like the idea of the fishing hamlet being like, ah, the... The burial worthers. Who could have ever predicted that the clan called the burial worthers would be bad? <laughs> <laughs> Burying them. Uh, well, I mean, to be fair, uh, German's weapon is the burial blade. So, <laughs> yeah. Sh- sh- yeah that's, a, that. that's a. That's another thing we should talk about after we talk about um, 
the after we finish up with Kainerst is uh, the transition from Germans hunters to Ludwig hunter Ludwig's hunters. Yes, that's that's a very because actually actually that's worth talking about right now because this is where it becomes really relevant. So okay. So, like, one of the things that becomes very obvious is, well, one, German and company um, can't deal with the beast problem, because as the blood experiments continue, the beast problem expands. Who would have thunk? Yeah, and it, it stops being about nimble weapons with, like, sharp edges so that you can dissect them, and it just becomes hammers, big swords, just put these things down. Well, not even that, because, like, the idea with, um, like, German and company, like, German has to get, like, creative, because he has these, like, nimble, like, weapons made of meteoric iron, right? And that's supposed okay. to be, that's supposed to have power, which helps with the beast hunting. But then you get the normal weapons, and they're, like, saws, and these things that really can help dig and tear them apart. It's sort of like a dead space scenario, right? Where it's like, okay, well, what do we do with these beasts? They're immortal beasts, which seem to constantly, like, we see this, right? Like, when some people transform, um, even if you kill them early, they might still be far enough along that they'll revive as like these like half beastified yeah. corpses on the ground right like we see this with the quote unquote drowning cor- I, I actually I don't know if they're called that in English but the idea is that in Japanese a lot of these are corpses which were drowned they drowned in the waters or they drowned themselves in the waters trying to be like oh no I'm not gonna transform I'm not gonna transform well it's like too late you're already infected basically you're talking about the uh, people in the sewers no, yeah, like you see them in the sewers, you see them in the the village, like in the village, there's this giant oil field thing, right? Like where they have all these guys yeah. and they, they put them in there and they're going to like throw down Molotovs to just burn them all. <laughs> yeah. And like, well, that doesn't actually happen with you. You just get burned because you walk through the oil for whatever reason. But yeah, the idea is like, we're just going to set it all, we're going to dump them in this lake of oil and then set it all aflame, right? Like, is this idea of like, and like, even if you, if you go further out in the Forbidden Woods, you see even more of these corpses and you see that it's near a camp with a bunch of pigs and stuff. So it looks like you have a bunch of these, um... There was a bunch of these people who escaped the mob, so to speak, in the village, and they started camping out there, but they were transforming anyway, so they drowned themselves in the waters nearby there, and now, like, this pig is coming through, and he's like, oh, uh, I smell human flesh to eat. Yeah, and that must have been very useful for the uh, for the healing church, that you just have these pigs located all over the place to clean up after your missus. Well, well, same thing with the crows, right? Like, the crows are, the crows have gotten so fat, eating so much yeah. human corpse, they can't even really fly anymore. <laughs> like, there's just... I think like, that's... Oh. From, a, from a gameplay perspective, I think it's kind of cooked that there's not a single flying enemy in all of Bloodborne. They have flying enemies in Demon Souls and Dark Souls, and, like, but Bloodborne is the only one of these games that you always have a long-range weapon. Like, you are guaranteed to have it at the start of the game, and there's no flying enemy. Uh, I don't know if that's part of the design or they just didn't want to deal with it because um, I think if you see the community's reaction to Elden Ring flying enemies, I think you can understand why. <laughs> yeah, sh- well, okay. I love the flying eagles. People, put your hate put your hate in the comment section. I won't <laughs> read it. <laughs> <laughs> but no, yeah, but- so, uh, so uh, Ludwig takes over when German is trapped in the hunter's dream. Uh, no, 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 because what happened, so the Hunter's Dream thing is, is it's like a thing, because the idea seems to be, okay, we got to deal with the, these, uh, these uh, hunting problems. One is- mm-hmm. idea to do this is to have, um, is to have the Hunter's Dream be set up, because it creates, like, it sort of prevents you from dying, so to speak, right? Like, it creates a certain okay. mortality buffer for hunters, right? Like, you die, you just go back to the dream, and then you'll manifest again. Now, there's a huge question about what happens to your body, but, you know, we're not going to answer the <laughs> It's like, it's like, uh, like, is my body just sort of left behind? There's like a million, is there like a million of your hunter corpses just around the yard? And people are like, God, <laughs> this guy's got a lot of twin brothers. Anyway, but like the idea is basically you go to the hunter's dream and then you just manifest back into reality again after like your soul goes back to the dream, right? Like you're, it's sort of like a nexus situation, except in the nexus, um, the nexus, had, yeah, well, nexus, actually nexus had the same problem where you would, uh, your corpse gets left behind a lot. But, uh, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> That's neither here nor there. The idea basically is that um, uh, Lawrence makes uh, he 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 does a ritual using the umbilical cord of Casa's orphan, right? And the idea is that we're going to try to get uh, we're going to try to get um, what uh, we're trying to get, get Flora involved, and, Fl- and the the Flora is like, okay, uh, you give me a baby, I will give you whatever you want, and like Lawrence is like, okay, I will get you that. Here is your insurance. W- German basically agrees to basically be put under house arrest in the dream forever um, until okay. the deal gets worked out, right? Um, well, that never works out. So German <laughs> ends up just sitting there, and that's another thing you have to understand is that aging still happens like in the dreams and stuff like that. Yeah. So. Uh, like, this is why German's like, oh, I'm too old, I'm useless now. It's like, German, as we see, he reverts himself to the last time he felt he was able to hunt, at least well enough, right? So yeah. he goes back to when he's still an old man, but he's an old man who can still fight. 
But the Gurman we see now, he's this guy who who can't, who's not, who, if he was in the physical world, he'd probably be dead. Because he's just too old, he's too feeble. He, 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 his, he, he's given immortal life, but not immortal youth. So he's just continually aging over time. And this okay. is like, or, this is sort of his suffering that he's going through. Until Originally, then, no, I, or, uh, I'm sorry, originally I had thought that Lawrence got the cord from Annalise to give to the Moon Presence. But what you're positing now, then, is that the mo- the pre- the court they gave to the Moon Presence is the court they got from the fishing hamlet, and that L- Lawrence then goes to Kanehurst to try to get Annalise's baby. No, 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 because no. Kanehurst never had a baby in the first place. That's the idea. No, but but he's he's trying. To, he he may not know that or. Well, Why no, no, then do no, no, they no, destroy no. Kanehurst? Kanehurst? The, so the Kanehurst and everything, they're all working together already, right? Okay. So they're already working together on making a baby. And perhaps Lawrence is betting at this time that, you know, I'll have, you know, okay, so we want to experiment on the orphan, considering that we're using the umbilical cord, you know, that doesn't really tell us much on whether or not the orphan ever sur- even survive is even alive at this point or whatever. But it's like, okay, I will give you a living baby. And so you have um, Annalise here who's creating this blood baby. So we're just going to feed her this corruption from blood and stuff like that. And eventually she's going to give a, produce, somehow that's going to eventually give us a blood baby, right? That's the idea. Okay. And then, okay, so we're just going to keep on doing this with this 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 old Thumerian descendant and things will work out somehow so maybe at this point Lawrence is still betting on uh Kanehurst thing working out well this doesn't work out long term for various reasons but it seems like after um after the after the uh after the uh, the actual fishing hamlet and everything acquire, it seems like the healing church, generally speaking, basically ignore like ignores them, starts ignoring them. Like they, they basically start ghosting Kanehurst because they got their own baby that they're experimenting on. Maybe that something good will happen with Kanehurst in the future, but they don't really help support or do so because they got what they wanted, right? They got the baby they want to experiment on. Bergenworth's now trying to catch up. We see they start trying to create artificial babies to try to keep up with the demand, so to speak. Because now everyone Bergenworth's like, oh well, they got their baby and they got to study. Well, we we've got to now find it. And as we can see, Willem doesn't succeed um all the the babies fail they figure they figure out the cord thing the three you need three thirds cord but the idea is that um uh Bergenworth basically falls apart after this point because again it seems like the influence of Yarnum was too great like it's like oh Lawrence is catching up it's clear this blood thing really does work and they start going crazy with the blood and turning into kin monsters mm-hmm. and all that stuff so um okay. Rom's out of the picture by this point too so like things just Things just aren't looking. <laughs> things just aren't looking up for Birkenworth at this point. But Yarnum, Yarnum's like, okay, we've got all the, this research material we can have. We had this orphan we were able to study and all this stuff. So now we're able to at least get what we want. German on the side is going to basically become like the sort of like administrator, right? Like his job is basically to sit there, teach and mentor the hunters who are coming in, right? And they're becoming sort of the part of this immortality thing. Like we said earlier, Maria throws away her weapon because she's like her entire um her 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 image of German as this like great heroic admirable figure is shattered because now she sees that he's willing to basically do anything um to get what he wants including like yeah. murder entire including genocide an entire village so she like basically is like okay I can't do this anymore like if this is what it means to be to be working under him I can and she she doesn't seem to ever cut ties fully she still obviously helps uh the church as the um the administrator in the cathedral for the experiments at that point but she still mm-hmm. Um, she's still got this, um, she's still got this sort of hope in her, but, like, it's obvious that she, she's completely tattered and broken as a woman at this, as a, as a female hunter, I should say, at, at this point. And she just, yeah. like, her, her, you know, we also have to, we also can't, it's sort of, we're also sort of dancing around the idea that there's probably, like, a bit of a, a, of a, of a, like, a casual romance happening here between, uh, the two, which, uh, <laughs> sort of Maria, complicates things even further. Maria and German, then? Yeah, yeah, yes. Ger- Maria and German, uh. I mean. So like, okay. so yeah, things are getting like obviously like you got, a lot of personal feelings are clearly invested into this, right? Okay. Yeah. So you have sort of like uh, Maria, sort of German is sort of like this person who she had a very personal admiration for, and this is something that is worth discussing. Let me bring up the item, mania. Bring it up. Bring it up. Bring it up. Yep. Uh. Yeah. Okay. So the hunting hat. So, like, Maria is distantly related to the undead queen, but had great admiration for Gurman, unaware of his curious mania. Now, the word for mania here is, um, mad passion, more literally. And the idea is it refers to, like, stuff like, okay, like, he had this incredible... She didn't realize that he had this incredible fanatic enthusiasm for what he's doing. He's like, he's will, he, like, it's like, if Lauren says, hey, we need to, we need to go through, kill this village and take their baby, he's like, I'm there behind you, chief. And Maria's <laughs> like, uh, 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 we're, we're murdering, like, innocents. He's like, no, I'm there behind you, chief. 
Find me, find me that great one. I will hunt it down and rip that child right out of her womb. Uh, uh, and like she's like, oh no, no, no! And she she throws her weapon into the well, right? But she never ever. So so there's a lot of personal feelings involved in this, and like her entire image of who German was is shattered. But and we can kind of see obviously German cares a lot for Maria when we get to the doll and things like that. So like yeah, there's this idea that they had this very close personal relationship that probably was romantic. And uh, that sort of gets extremely frayed after this incident. And Maria is never able to break relations, but it clearly leaves her torn and possibly suicidal in the end. So, okay. Um, so it we're was, going. It, yeah, it so, was my understanding, though, that the court we find in the workshop in the Wigan world that, does that court not reference Annalise? Uh, no, no. In co- content, it did. Like I think, um, I think in like before the game got its like day one patch or whatever. Yeah, like that. I think that was left in the English description. The Japanese description was already correct at this point, but the English oh. description still had reference to this. And this got cut out. Um, in I think it was the day one patch or something like this. Someone, someone might be able to in the comments might be able to correct the exact timetable. But yeah, there that was something that was um that's that's you could find in the files, but was lost. And this was probably a remnant of when this is where you're getting the idea of probably there was an actual blood baby, right? Because there was probably an earlier draft of the script. And then eventually they said, no, 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 we can shelve this. It makes more sense if we have this for DLC ready, this idea of costs as like this, this sort of like, this is where the baby came from. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. That, Cause it seems, and that seems to have been something that wasn't caught probably cause it was in the English description, not the Japanese description until they had to do the day one patch or whatever. It's like, Oh, wait a second. We got to fix this. All right, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, 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 that's, uh, that's something that really needs to be clarified. So, like, Annalise never gets her blood baby in the final game, in the final iteration of the game that we get. The idea is that the 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 healing church basically abandons them at by that point. Like, they got their baby. Maybe Lawrence is betting on like getting one out of her still, but they don't ever really support them, and this comes back to bite them later. But for that's now, more just a plan he has, sort of on the back burner. Yeah, like, possibly. And uh, quite, and again, and like I said, if if he had any plans for it, it wasn't shared with him with the rest of the church because they ba- basically Kanehurst goes ignored, and they they uh, Annalise uh, has a bit of a bone to pick with the church as a result after this. So we'll get to that. So now we go into. Um, like you say, uh, German is now has this a bunch of immortal hunters now, right? And as long as these hunters stay committed to their job of hunting beasts, everything's going to be gold. Now, German exists as sort of like the, he talks about himself as being like, he's the guy who, let me pull it up again. What was it? That line. Oh yeah, so he's the he's the advisor, right? So he's his job as the advisor is to oversee and make sure everyone's staying committed. And well, as long as they stay on the path that's been set for them, it's good. But if you start having people like Jura who are like or Maria who are like, oh well, I can't really do this anymore or whatever. And we don't even again, I'm not, I'm not even saying Maria necessarily got involved in this at, in any way. Just again, just giving examples, right? If you have people who aren't really ready to commit anymore, and you see this in the the final game, right? Like he says, "Oh dear, well, what was it? The hunt, the blood, or the horrible dream?" In in the Japanese, it's more clear. He's saying, "I see. So you were swallowed by something too? Was it the hunt, the blood, or maybe the nightmare?" And it's again the same idea was that if you become drunk on the hunt, like again, this goes into the hunter of hunters thing, right? Like so the idea is that, okay, if you're Im- if you're a mortal, how are the hunter of hunters going to get rid of you then? And you see this in yeah. the lore of the game, right? Like, the idea is that, okay, well, the Hunter of Hunters dresses like a crow, because the idea is that in his homeland, they do sky burial, where they, they basically leave your corpse out, and the birds come flying down and, and pick and eat it up, right? Like, that's the idea, basically. And he's, from be, the, uh, he's from the Shrine of Storms, probably. Probably. No, no well, well, the idea with him is that the... Um, is that he seems to be from like a Tibetan type of like a not Tibet type of idea in the East, right? Because he's he's clearly seems to be he's a foreigner. He's uh, sky burial is very popular in places like Tibet. So like it seems to be like he's from the he's again another one of these Easterners who seems to have come in and migrated to Yarnum for whatever reason. And he becomes his partner as a hunter. But now as a hunter of hunters, he now makes his whole shtick is okay. I'm going to dress up as a bird, and I'm going. To, uh, crows are obviously very prevalent in Yarnum, so that seems to be why he chose to pick the crow specifically so it's like okay i will be the the local bird which will now um sort of set your burial and send you off to the next world whether that next world is heaven in his mind or the hunter's dream so this idea is that the hunter of hunters he kills you and he's like let's say you're a blood drunk hunter you get killed by the hunter of hunters you get sent to the hunter's dream well your his blade of mercy has now done that to you now german's blade of burial a burial blade or the blade of funeral 
is supposed to be the one that gives you now your next send off and that he says well you know what you were consumed by the, the the blood now you're you're no longer focused on hunting the beast anymore you're no like you're no longer a you're, you're now a liability basically so then yeah. he kills you in the dream and by doing that he severs your connection to the dream and now you're stuck in the world then the hunter of hunters can now kill you for good okay and send you off to heaven or whatever in his religion right yeah. So that's the idea, basically, is that you have this system where now Gurman basically can now kill you and cut you off. And you know what? We respect the work you've put in, so we're going to leave a gravestone in your memory in the dream, right? And that's where you get the giant graveyard, right? Of all these past hunters who were who were able to be immortal helpers, but for one reason or another, they ended up having to get cut off. Gurman had to kill each and every single one of these comrades of his <laughs> in order to sever them off. And then, like, you can see why Gurman's so messed up after all of this now. Yeah. So, like... Yeah. At, at this point now, you have this entire system set up just for dealing with the beasts. But it's still not enough. The beasts, because of all these blood experiments, are getting bigger and stronger and scarier and more horrifying. So it's like, um, well, what, what are we supposed to do about this? Like, this is too much even for German system to handle. Like I said, these are guys who are there. Um, German is a type who created this really creative weapon out of Ciderite. But now you have, um, what's it called? The... Uh, the, the regular hunters who are using all these these saw blades and all these things that really grind in and they get in they kind of carve and saw off like parts and butt because they're more because there's these immortal beasts which are very tough they're very strong they're very big and now they're getting bigger and stronger so how are we supposed to cut how are we supposed to saw through all this all this massive meat well the idea seems to be that this was left for Ludwig to have to solve basically now Ludwig well maybe you can give me the introduction here on how how I should frame this okay so. Ludwig, as he's understood in the English community, is he's the guy who comes in after German to lead the hunt. German, he dealt with a small beast, he was at the nimble hunters, and the armors of... Uh, mm, well, no, not, not, it doesn't maybe matter so much about the armors, but the idea is you're nimble and you have a fast weapon, whereas Ludwig, because his beasts are bigger, he uses just gigantic weapons that are much, much more strength-focused... Uh, and, yeah, and uh, he eventually becomes a blood-drunk hunter as well. He yeah. sort of succumbs to the blood-drunkenness, and in the nightmare, um, he, so, yeah, that's, we can see that. Mm -hmm. just, just a quick aside, do you think that's an actual representation of what he looks like? Or do you think that's just... Uh, his face, somewhat. Um, you can, if you compare his face to the his real body, and that's represented, well, I guess... I guess talk about reality when it comes to the dream worlds is a bit complicated <laughs> to discuss. But basically, the idea is that the quote unquote real Ludwig, um, if you compare him as the what's it called the uh, the, the mad uh, the madman something madman I think in English right something like that yeah but the, anyway the the, idea, the, the lost madman or something like that yeah something like that so the idea Forgotten. is that like what, yeah the mad the madman character you meet in the hinter tombs that is Ludwig. Um, yeah, and he—if you compare their faces with the Ludwig we see as a beast in the in the Hunter's Nightmare, it, it, it's uncanny. Like you say, nose bend, same like twisted thing. Like the horse choice was very, very, very accurate. <laughs> but like, yeah, well, it, uh, so every, Yarnamites are described to have like asymmetrical bodies in general, but this one specifically—I I, I couldn't it just, find anything in the script actually that mentions this. Maybe it was like it's a, in the. It's in the promotional material. There yeah, was no, a yeah, because I couldn't find yeah. anything in the actual game that talks about this. Um, and my general impression was that he is just a. Um, and again, maybe this was something that was in promotional material because it changed over time. I don't know, but I, I have, I have, don't get any impression that he was a Yarnamite himself. He just has this. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, again, maybe that something changed or what or what have you. But again, I think I think this is just a carryover of. Um, it might be a carryover because it's not anywhere in the actual script. Um, and I don't see it being reflected very well with Ludwig himself, other than the fact that he likes recruiting Yarnamites, which, again, makes sense because they're the only locals, really, for them to work with in the first place. Because, again, you, know, like, yeah. you have all these academic types who are obviously, like, they're, they're not really, uh, they're not really, uh, in, in it for the, 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 <laughs> the hard hunting. Nah. Right, nah. but anyway, the, but the idea is, like, definitely, like, yeah, you can see he has the same twisted face features for sure and so whether or not he he was originally yarnamite he's definitely someone who has become um enamored in this um this religious thinking that's present in yarnum for sure um this idea of like there, there there's this holy mission that they're being part of and this is this is where the 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 healing church becomes the healing church right 
Okay. So originally, it's as far as we could tell, it seems like they were just regular doctors and things like that. And then Ludwig was really the one who really made the church, like them really into the church that we see them as today. This more militaristic, idea. more sort of uh, central sort of political power then? Yeah, yeah. So like you see, so like this idea that so far as like you have like these doctors, we're not just doctors, we're holy men, right? And this is the mm. idea with Ludwig is that Ludwig goes into the, again, as a good Bergenworth student, he knows what happens when we have a problem. Well, you go inside the underground ruins. So, he, <laughs> so it's like just find find stuff there because you never know what you might find. And he seems to go all the way down to Is, and he finds the Holy Moonlight Sword. And mm-hmm. the idea now now fans of like JRPGs and stuff they know like holy swords and things like that. They're just a common motif, right? Like you have the demonic or cursed sword, and then you have the holy sword, right? There's there's these two swords. Like Soul Calvary is a great example of this, right? Same thing. Okay. Or like so, Kingsfield, where you have like the uh, the Dark Slayer and the Moonlight Sword. Yeah, yeah, like it's this, it's this very common like JRPG motif, right? It's like it's like killing God as the final boss. Like, sorry, spoil every JRPG on the planet. <laughs> it's like it's always the idea you kill a god or some godlike being at the end, and it's the same thing here. It's like there's always this holy sword and cursed sword. This is the idea that sort of gets wrapped up into Ludwig, because obviously this is a Victorian era type of setting. It's like the medieval era has now become antiquated. You know, it's these those dark ages, right? Like it's such a uh the, that period, so awful and, and backwards and terrible or whatever. Well, Ludwig is very caught up in this idea of the chivalric era, so to speak. Um, yeah. He finds goes back to what I was talking about, but is when we actually go to the bath messengers in is you get weapons. Um, you get the, uh, Ludwig's Holy blade and stuff like related to that. So more sort of, uh, medieval knight fantasy. Yeah. Yeah. So it seems like is was very much a medieval type of culture originally. And Ludwig in going down there finds these medieval weapons. And the one that's most notable of course is the Holy moonlight sword. It's this sword, which again, like the original seems to be a silver sword, this, this is something that actually seems rather consistent, is that weapons which incorporate silver have this righteous property. Um, mm-hmm. this, this property that's, that's holy, and it has this power against the most corrupt beasts we see, like the lost child, children of antiquity, and we see it work against evil spirits. Um, it but, has it has strength. It has uni- it has properties, uh, good properties against and uh, the enemies related to Kanehurst. Yeah, yeah, and, and again, not just Kanehurst, it also works in the Chalice Dungeons with those same enemies, plus yeah. other, another evil spirit for specific to the Labyrinth. And the idea is that, and also blood lickers, and things that, basically things which gather a lots of corruption from having yes. lots of blood, or they're malicious, or things like that, things with lots of evil intentions. Silver Th- things has with, a things with Things with a lot of, would you say, Kegare? Yes, yes, like, like I said, cor- <laughs> when I say corruption, I'm talking about Kegare here, so... Definitely, for sure. So, did you think you would get two hours into this conversation without me saying it? <laughs> did you think you were safe? <laughs> I thought, I thought maybe, but no, no luck. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen your vids. You, you really, lo- you really fleshed onto this, and I think rightly so. Yeah, I like it, and FromSoft likes it too. So yeah, I like- clearly, clearly, FromSoft definitely <laughs> likes. Well, Japan in general likes. Like, you, you see, there, whether it's ma- whether it's name dropped or not, it's definitely something that's very common. There's a cave in Elden Ring called Still Water Cave. <laughs> like just, oh, this is the cave of the stagnant water. I, I, I went there and I was like, oh, okay. Just find the poison swamp now. <laughs> just walk to the <laughs> uh, No, but like, um, when you go to what's, uh, when you go to the, sil- when we go to the silver thing, the idea seems to be that silver has these qualities and this seems to relate to the arcane. For example, quicksilver bullets are obviously mercury, but the idea in mm-hmm. Japanese is mercury is water silver. So mm-hmm. when, when you have, um, so this is why you find it in a lot of, like a lot of, besides range attackers, you also have kin related enemies. And this is because again, they have lots of water in their, their beings. And the idea seems to be that water silver seems to be this derivative from it's again, this goes to this idea that, um, fish have trace amounts of mercury in their bodies, like more higher than the, the average living being. So it seems to be this idea that these like Cthulhu watery fish monsters, um, have, uh, more because in in having more arcane like sort of power into them they also have now more trace amounts of this uh quicksilver to derive from blood and this is the same reason why blood bullets bullets work right because we're deriving the quicksilver in our blood this arcane bullet power yeah. stuff and the idea seems to be that this carries over to actual silver and actual silver has similar properties and it works against malicious stuff specifically but it seems to also be the reason why you don't get necessarily get these very complicated weapons um with um again compared to like say you don't create a saw with silver right like you create just a regular no. sword yeah you make it a big sword 
because it's got to have the extra force to deal with these giant monsters. But it's the same concept, based, uh, in at the root of it, is this idea is that this pro this is why, like, say, for example, the church giants have silver axes. This is, again, like you say, this isn't something that's mentioned in the game, but it's mentioned in a uh, Famitsu article way back when. They confirm that, yes, these axes that the church giants wield, those are also made of silver. So... The Chilling Church adopts silver because of Ludwig, and probably a little bit of influence because Kanehurst also uses silver, but purely on the defensive. Because well, uh, uh, <laughs> might get a little uh, nasty if they start using silver against each other. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so uh, the, the same idea though is the idea that it uh, the silver wards away and exercises malicious blood, and this is the idea being used against beasts for it. Um, and and we this see sort it, of idea of uh, this this sort of holy crusade sort of that's the idea that is brought up into the well, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that gets into, folded into the church with ludwig yeah yeah ludwig seems to be the one that real again like i say ludwig is, seems to be where the church really gets its start because he's the one that brings mm -hmm. so much of this this sort of holy framework and mission with it we don't see any of this like we don't see anything earlier but then as soon as ludwig the first church hunter shows up we start really seeing this idea of the church being a thing yeah because Lawrence, yeah. German, they were just in it for themselves. That was just a scam. L yeah, Ludwig yeah, like, sees, like, divine guidance and, yeah. Yeah, like I, like, like I said, Old Yarnum is where we see the first church. We don't, But we can say that that might have only started setting up after they've been around for a while and Ludwig comes in, right? So now it becomes, okay, no longer do we just have our little, uh, like, let's say, medical outpost. Now it has to be a church. And now when we build New Yarnum, we have to build a cathedral, right? Is Lawrence out of the picture at this point? Uh, this, no, no. This is this is someone. This is probably not. He's probably around when Ludwig's still around, but he definitely disappears later on. Because the idea is that Lud Lawrence is the first, um, the first uh, cleric beast. Cleric so beast, to speak, yeah. Right? right. So you need to have the church set up first, probably, and you also pro will most likely going to be needing um, a little bit of time for Lawrence to then move out to get out of the picture at this point. Because there's a lot of like events and stuff that has to get involved. Obviously, we see the statue of him being made with the the experiments and things like that. So he seems to be mm -hmm. around for a while, and he eventually basically kind of like goes off and. Um, on a separate so, matter. Uh, we'll talk about that with the bloodletting beast. And stuff. He sort of uh, swapped German out for Ludwig, where he's still doing all the research and all the experimentations, and now he found this new guy who will just deal with the day to day of destroying the beasts. Well, yeah, like so. This again, like I say, like a typical Bergenworthian. Um, uh, Ludwig goes into the Chalice Dungeons. He finds the Holy Moonlight Sword. In the sword, it has this this ability, this cosmic power to turn into this giant great sword, right? Like where it has yeah. this giant, massive blade of the Abyssal Cosmos. And like we said before, this idea of like the great ones are the stars. So when you're seeing all these little stars in the blackness of this like cosmic thing, the idea is that that is space. And when he has okay. this sword, Ludwig closes his eyes. But in the darkness, again, this goes back to the idea when when like Willem wears a blindfold and stuff, and he like covers his eyes. This idea of okay, I need to stop focusing on the the i don't need to stop seeing with my physical eyes i need to focus on the my mind's eyes so the eyes within this eyes in my brain so i need to close i need to cover my physical eyes and now just see the dark i only see darkness now but that darkness is now going to give me an inner sight that's going to see into the the cosmos right and the idea with ludwig is he's not just seeing um when he comes to the moon when he comes to the moonlight sword He's not just seeing, let's see, what, how does the... He closed his eyes, he saw darkness or perhaps nothingness. The Japanese is a little bit more important. He, he In his shut-eye darkness or perhaps the void. So the term for void here is literally means empty space. Um, like an empty, like an empty sky, an empty, an empty, like uh, an empty, like a void. Again, a void. I sort of, I sort of, uh, isn't the, isn't the, I think the term for it is mu? Like the yeah. sort of nothingness? Yeah, well, yeah, that that, that 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 that's related to it. But what we're talking about here is is it relates to Buddhism, things like this. This idea of like sort of the the vo the void, which leads to sort of like um, a, a nothingness, which sort of encompasses all things. So sort of yeah. idea. And the idea here with Ludwig is that he's sort of reaching he's he's reaching the realm of enlightenment, so to speak, the cosmos, the the, the star world. So he's going. He's now connect in connecting to outer space, basically. He's now mm -hmm. also connecting to the cosmic world when he's holding the Moonlight Sword, because it has a connection to the spaces, and now he's able to sort of, um, he's now able to sort of use that power to help get, forge a connection when he closes his eyes now. So he's not just seeing, like, say, the back of his eyelids in darkness, he's now seeing the actual void of space, where the, the, the stars of the Great Ones are. And what he sees is, uh, he sees... The English puts it as a playfully dancing sprites. It's more accurate to say he saw um, he saw these things which mischievously twinkled and danced about. 
So again, twinkled is obviously very again twinkle twinkle little star type of idea. So yeah. like, again, that's the same term that, terminology we're seeing here. And danced about again, we think about like shooting stars and things like that. Um, and is given the meaning of guidance. So the idea is that Ludwig is seeing all these stars in the empty void of space, and one in particular is responding to him. And it has this again mischievous because again, don't deal great one. You don't want to. You don't know what you're talking to. <laughs> Don't know what your response is going to get when you deal with great ones. This one's like, okay, I'll play a little prank. It twinkles and it dances about. And Ludwig interprets this as being, oh, this is guidance from the stars. It's telling me that, okay, I got to take this sword. I'm going to take these swords. And we have to use it to fight the beast himself with something like this, right? Like, this is his answer. Again, it goes back to the idea with German is this idea of, oh, oh God, please give me a response. And like, well, God gave you a response, but you you, you took it your own way. <laughs> yeah. And you, and you pointed this out in your commentary. The idea is that, um, the star knew what it was doing. <laughs> <laughs> it knew what it was going to end up though. It just thought, oh, this is going to be a fun little prank. <laughs> and that's so, why it's uh, like, oh. The guidance rune is, it, that's just an image of like a man sort of bowing to a star or well, like well, the a, idea, a celestial like object. A, it's like, a, you, can th- you can think of it as a man bowing to a star. You can also think of it again, like you said, like looks like almost like a hand reaching out and trying. Because again, the idea with Ludwig is Ludwig wants to be a star. And this is why yeah. you see this obsession with radiance in the Holy Blades. Everything about radiant. They have this radiant badge. They, 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 their big thing is about. Again, this is before the DLC. So again, no one tell me this wasn't planned. You have these coins, which are part of the you get as part of the the radiant hunter's badge, right? The sword hunter's badge. These coins are noted in the. They, they say in the the English, the particularly luminous in Japanese. It's more. It's the same term used to mean they have emit a particular radiance. Again, goes back to radiance, radiant uh. hunter, radiance with executioners, which again connect to it. So again, this idea that. Um, there's nothing for sale on the beast hunt night, but they will serve as a guidepost, a guide, a guidepost, if you sprinkle them on your night's journey. So again, same idea here. Ludwig is using coins as a representation of his idea. They are hit, the radiance of the stars is his guidance. This is why the choir, when you see, you see in the church workshop where Ludwig was operated, obviously he basically helped found this, this institution. The church workshop is where the choir are like, oh! The cos- they, they, they look into Ludwig and they're like, oh, okay, the cosmos is in the sky. And that's why it's all connected there. All right. So that's Radiance. Uh, do we want to talk about the Executioners? Right. So, like, the Executioners basically emerge out of the ashes of the Holy Blades. Because what we see is, um, we see, like, there's all these experiments that are being done in the Grand Cathedral and all that stuff. You, you, you showed it in your commentary very well, the idea that Healing Church has been basically, um, it, it's sort of like everyone's getting sick. Bigger and badder beasts are coming out, and the church is like, oh, you know, like, well, we'll, we'll help curious so always we take you in, you bring you to your sick bed, you know, we're gonna bring you upstairs. Yeah. <laughs> and we promise there's nothing bad hiding behind the curtain. <laughs> C- come with me, Grandma. This isn't <laughs> the way, this isn't the way to the hospital. <laughs> it's like, no, 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 it's a very special hospital. And um, as we see stuff like the living failures get produced because they're trying to create like all these like bloat headed basically. So like the, the, the funny thing that DLC does, and this is one of the hilarious things is that when I've been doing analyses for um, Bloodborne, one of the things that I've been purposefully doing is I'm separating DLC and po- uh, pre DLC and post DLC. So that way, when I do these analyses, I can kind of get an idea how much was it. I've been finding surprisingly a lot of the stuff the DLC do- isn't really necessarily new. It's mostly fleshing out or trying to, fill in some like tiny holes that were sort of left um in the base game tiny um, and, and huge holes let's put well, that right well no, I, I would disagree there but that, that, that's where that, that that's a topic for another time but the idea is that okay. when you go through with the the dlc on a lot of this stuff some of the uh some of the uh what's it called the uh the things that get uh shown off with the post dlc is the choir is that <laughs> the choir becomes less and less original <laughs> As you look into the the stuff that the DLC introduces, because it's like um, a bunch of things that they they seem it's like okay, well it seems like they're the original. No, they're not really the originators of like the 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 arcane haze stuff. It's really more so you know there was like this prototype made that was based on the flamethrower, and then they kind of just like you know repackaged it into a nicer, fancier hole. It's like oh okay, <laughs> it's like Choir can't, can't, apparently can't invent anything on its own, um, <laughs> except for Call Beyond, which is a failure. <laughs> Yeah. But hey, it, it's fo- hey, it's following their footsteps because, as we see, the term for failure actually used in a call beyond is the same used in the research hall experiments, the living failure. So it's the same idea, a failed work, a failed creation, or something. Okay. So this idea is that um, the research hall experiments were trying to create these bloatheads because the idea was you're going to stuff them with water, and this is again the explanation for why there's such an, a focus and association with Bergenworth on water. This goes back to the ROM and cost thing, as you pointed out, and the idea is that, um. 
uh, the Lawrence and company are thinking, okay, um, if we stuff their heads with water, we can be able to sort of increase this sort of, um, uh, sort of create this sort of signal connection to the cosmos with their brains, and then that way they'll be able to communicate with the stars, and we have the clock tower and all that, which is all set up for that, and things are going to work out. And the idea with the Grand Cathedral is they're trying to do this on a mass scale, and they're creating, they're buried, all the, all the people are getting buried, and they become these seed beds for phantasms, which create the star flowers that we see, right? Um... So and that becomes like that giant like star flower tree at the center of the 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 thing to the clock tower. So s- same idea. What happens with the uh, the experiments though is it ends up creating m- the more that the blood am- administration is happening, the more that the treatments are turning creating bees, and the bees are getting bigger and more powerful. So Ludwig is supposed to answer that. But what happens when the hunters start becoming the beasts? And as we can see, the church hunters are becoming the worst and most ferocious and terrible beasts possible, in part probably because they're so resistant to um, this sort of uh, de-evolution that's occurring. Hmm. And as, as a result of this, things seem to more or less go haywire at this point, right? So Lor- if Lawrence hasn't left already, this is definitely where we start seeing Lawrence gone, because he's the first, as we understand, he's the first cleric beast, and he very likely is perhaps the huge reason why the experiments go off the rails, because as you point out, he is the, um, he's the bloodletting beast. The original name is more so like the owner or master of the beast blood. Um, the internal name is founder beast. Um, yes. So yeah, yeah, every yeah. Obviously, he's well, he's a beast that gets beheaded. Um, and we we didn't really touch on this, but the idea with the chalice dungeons is that the chalice dungeons aren't the actual physical places; they're more so dream recreations that we we conjure through yeah. rituals. Um, you sort of access the cosmic record, um, and you sort of recre- you create a, you basically in the same way that the game is simulating something. You, the player in universe, are creating a magical simulation, essentially. It's uh, a, it has it has certain physical properties like you can buy stuff from it and you can like get the blood echoes you keep them. Well, 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 yeah, well the idea is that it is reality. I said this is where yeah. I say like reality gets complicated in that um, it's as real as you are, right? It's as real as you are in the quote unquote real world. It's essentially yeah. creating a pocket dimension, essentially, but it's still a simulation. It is a copy. Um, so that's how you can see bosses you've killed in the Chalice Dungeons, because the idea is you are going to a piece of time where that character is in that location. So we see, for example, Rom, before we encounter the Bloodletting Beast, we also encounter Rom as the previous boss, um, preceding that in another layer, right? So the idea is that around the time that Rom is going down to the Chalice Dungeons to meet Ebrietus, um, mm-hmm. uh, we also have uh, Lawrence going down and becomes the Bloodletting Beast. And Assumably, he's going... he's going down there to find Queen Yarnum. Yeah, yeah, or something like he may not know about her specifically, but the idea is yes, he's probably going down there for a baby. Because what we see in both this story dungeon, the later one where he's headless, his body is still going deeper. I can't remember if you fight him in Thumera Ill or not, but I think it is actually Thumera Ill. But like the idea is that um, yes, he he's going purposefully deeper, and if you look in the root dungeons, he only spawns in those deeper dungeon areas. So the idea seems to be he was basically searching all the lower levels. Uh, frantically, in order to try to find Yarnum, basically. Or, yeah. or basically a blood baby, right? Because Kanehurst wasn't producing a blood baby, uh, Lauren, and Lawrence wasn't uh, and Lawrence wasn't able to find one in time. And he becomes the cleric beast, someone cuts off his head. Um, some pe- A lot of people like, attribute this to Ludwig, possibly. Um, and basically, they take his head back, and well, now they have a new Eucharist. Um, I, I, they, I forget what they call it in the English version. I think it might be like the, it's not like the holy, uh, because in the Japanese, the term is used as Eucharist or the holy body, um, and this is used to refer to the, uh, yeah, they they usually just refer to it as communion, so I don't know if the the localization ever calls it properly, but the idea is that, like, the idea is that this is the, their Eucharist, right, but instead of it being the body and blood of Christ, the idea is that it's just the blood of the, of the founder beast. The yeah. Lawrence says the bloodletting, and so they take they take his beast head and they get the blood from his head and they sort of put it in like the altars and stuff like that. And obviously they leave the head on the altar there as like this holy relic type of deal. So all that, and they use his blood in the as it becomes the source of all of their treatments going forward, right? And okay. From that, yeah, and from that point, and what happens though is that this helps create more and more beasts, which creates even more, more of a problem. And then we start seeing the hunters themselves are becoming beasts in their obsession with blood. Again, this goes back to blood drunkenness and things like that. And Ludwig is—it's—it's it's always brought back that Ludwig always has these—he's um, crestfallen basically when he's not hunting because there's always this sort of lingering. 
he it seems like Ludwig was sort of had this idea where he knew though he didn't want to accept it like he sort of like he's sort of in like this sort of intentional denial where like some part of you understands that you're being gip but you want to really believe in something so you kind of let yourself be fooled so to speak yeah and you and he has this sort of idea that he you know he likes the idea of being this hero and all this stuff and like there's stuff about like in when we're talking about the holy blaze the idea that they're this ancient line of heroes or whatever no 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 localization sort of goes way too far on that huh. it, the series just it's literally just saying like oh you know there's this time when there was like this where there was this a you know there's this time when you know it was an era where you could be like a chivalric hero and it's like oh that was forever ago now like it, it, it's just being very vague on the timeline on things so like it, yeah. it lets miyazaki maneuver things around but the localization sort of ideas like ludwig's this ancient figure it's like no he's not like you said he comes right <laughs> after german so like, <laughs> Yeah, it's just like... We're talking like decades ago at most. It's flowery language to which they sort of muckle and try to make it a bit too specific. Yeah, this this happens all the time with the localization, and it really screws them up here, because like Ludwig is supposed to be a relatively recent figure, you know, the mm-hmm. large, grander scheme of things. And with, as far as, um, as Ludwig is concerned... Things get, um, th- things obviously get out of hand when, like, he creates this organization about being these holy, righteous things, and they will find radiance and all this stuff. And, um, even though he never shares his radiance, <laughs> he, he's like, you know, this is my radiance, you gotta find your own. <laughs> like, I got my star, don't know. <laughs> um, but then, um, what happens is, like, Ludwig, Ludwig starts, like, this is where it seems to really hit Ludwig, in that he, he's, he's been mocked, he's been disparaged, he's starting to really, he kind of is afraid of it, but, you know, while he's hunting, he feels good, right? Like, the, the guidance of the stars kind of been live in him, you see, like, he, he, you get back health with guidance, because, um, as you attack back and things like that, because the idea is you have to go in the thick of it and really, like, push through and travel through, and you will, his idea is you will achieve radiance. Well, only thing he's managed to achieve is having his entire organization collapse under him, so. Yeah. And, and uh, this leads he, us into the executioners. Yeah. Yes, he is swallowed into the nightmare, like his mind, and now he, but his body still lives on in the chalice dungeons. Or well, in, no, no, in no. Like dungeons. I said, the chalice dungeons are simulations, so it's very likely if Ludwig, Lud, now it's possible Ludwig is still alive in the chalice dungeons. But when we're like facing him in there, um, it's not an indicator of yes or no because this could be a period okay. of time when he was alive. He he's probably dead though, because it seems like the the hunter's nightmare only takes you in when you're all dead. Um, this okay. is why Hunter of Hunters and stuff exist. The idea with the, the nightmare, because what happens is, is that Koss, after death, and this is where, like, things start really going haywire for Ludwig and everyone else, is that all these people are becoming beasts, right? So they're all getting, they're all getting hunted and they're all being killed. That's not it for the hunters, though, because when they're killed as beasts or blood drunk hunters or whatever it is, they end up in the hunter's nightmare, because Koss is a bit resentful about being murdered. <laughs> Her entire people genocided, her baby stolen from her, and her corpse just being left there on the doing so. And, like, with her corpse is her blood. And there's a lot of resentment in that blood. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, what happens is, is that Koss, um, we see this consistently in the series, in this, in this, this goes to Dark Souls and to some extent Demon Souls too, is this idea of strong emotions, especially negative emotions, like resentment and grudges, these create curses which conjure... Um, these cause curses which can conjure all sorts of effects, such as making you a ghost. So you have this, a lot of evil ghosts and caners are the product of a resent, a bunch of curse of the, gr- of the, of the dead who were, have a grudge against the people who killed them wrongfully. Um, and you see this a lot with a lot of the different, um, enemies in Dark Souls, same idea. So the point okay. is that you have all, all these, um, you have a great one who is extremely resentful. So she's got a really, really powerful curse. <laughs> And her curse creates this own dream dimension, the Hunter's Nightmare, which basically the the Fishing Hamlet people, they're brought back. And it seems to bring the spies back with them because they're technically residents of the village. <laughs> Though, uh, as we see, the Fishing Hamlet people are uh, very quick to uh, <laughs> to get back at them for uh, what they what the, their spying did. But, um, but it's the same idea is that the Fishing Village, they're, they're allowed to live. The Hunters down below in the ocean, a bottomless curse for a bottomless sea, they're basically forced to relive their own personal hells um down below right and the idea is that uh ludwig's is tailor-made for him specifically he fears that he was perhaps being fooled and tricked into becoming a beast and so he becomes the most awful and terrible beast among them all in his obsession to trying to stop and end beasthood and he becomes so rav he's 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 hunting other hunters um in the the river of blood right like so these these guys um, are basically, we see, like, the court bodies are, like, coming back up and stuff. And this seems to be another, like, part of the hell is that you don't really die, um, 
in the Hunter's Nightmare, you're just going to come back and you're going to keep going and going. So it's like this endless cycle type of deal. Yeah. Um, so Ludwig is sort of turns into this awful, terrible beast. He never became that in the quote unquote real world. But in this alternate reality that Koss has created, he she's made him this terrible, awful, horrible beast. And he ne- and the, the the sword is on his back as it was in life, but he never even notices it because of the way they turn him. And it's only when we start put the sword in front of him that he starts regaining some of his humanity. And he starts acting, but he's still, of course, driven to fight and hunt and try to kill and defeat us. And yeah. then, uh, obviously, we see him regain some clarity at the end there. And then, obviously, si- if you don't finish him off, Simon will. And, again, before and, and before his potential revival becomes relevant, we obviously stop the nightmare. So, like... Yeah. All so right. that all so ties in. Well, the yeah, executioners, yeah, but, then. Yeah, yeah. So, while this is happening, and we're now seeing, okay, the church is now discovering there's this terrible, awful nightmare that blood-drunk hunters and... Well, basically, anyone who is consi- cost considers a hunter, which, as we can see, can in turn... In turn um, it can also include an amygdala and um, the snakes that was being fed beasts by the... Uh, by the, the Matters twins. So, like, cost is not picky. Like, anything that it, she might consider that you are hunting beasts that you could be considered a quote-unquote hunter, she's gonna drag your soul into uh, the nightmare. So this is a now problem. The Holy Blades are collapsing in the real world, so that's another problem. So it's like, you're, you're, we're, we're all dying, and we're all going to hell if we die, so... <laughs> things are not going well. And then you have L- Logarius. Now, Logarius, and this is something that I'm co- hopefully I'll have an analysis out for this coming soon, but... Logarius seems to have been a Holy Blade. There's a huge controversy over his equipment because the the executioner garb talks about how you know it's supposed to be like the original outfit and attire and that all other church attire is based on but from all indications they are a later institution logarius finds a lost rune which happens to be the radiance rune and again it makes sense that radiance was lost because ludwig found guidance which was the source the stars yeah so like you see this exact same idea is that okay so they got rid of radiance basically and Lu- and logarius is like well you know what it seems we've lost we we, we somehow follow the path because you know isn't this like a prior like the entire idea with ludwig was this was like a divine mission like he was he was this man of god who was coming out of out of nowhere in order to save everyone and that if we all just followed this path we would all have like it would all be like sort of paved like this holy path to like a glory and like divine uh ascension right so this is, again, how Ludwig sort of subsumes the religion, and he starts recruiting Yarnamites who would buy into this, because this goes into their religious narrative of the Great Ones are gods, and, like, all of this is all this is all holy, and, like, we want to get rid of the beasts, and so now they have this holy framework around it. And Logarius seems to be one of these Yarnamites, which seems to be the explanation for why he has Thumerian traits, though obviously we know from content, so it seems like he was an old, like, Thumerian king concept um, mm-hmm. that kind of got recycled, because... We, we see in cut content, um, there's been several iterations of this idea of, like, a Thumerian king in the labyrinth, and mm-hmm. it seems that Logarius's model was the latest iteration, they couldn't be bothered to keep changing it. <laughs> um, so, uh, Logarius seems like to be the idea is that he was a Yarnamite holy blade, like so many others, and he's like, okay, well, clearly we, we went wrong somewhere. Okay, so I found this old lost Radiance that we have to go, and we need to return to Radiance. Well, Radiance, the, the rune is all about um, improving the, qual- the quality of blood vials and stuff like that. So it's like, okay, so the, the quality of blood is what we need to do so. So the problem with the blood is that the good and holy blood has been corrupted somehow. Well, how has it been corrupted somehow? Well, vile bloods, then. Vile blood. Well, this is the idea, is the vile bloods. But, so Logarius, being a holy blade, so he's a high-ranking member of the church, would have knowledge and information about... Um, he probably know a little bit about the history, even if it's not the complete history, he at least seems to know enough that he would understand the history of the, the Bergenworth with the, the traitors going to Canehurst, right? So he understands yeah. this, and he knows how they brought the go- blood from the Tomb of the Gods, and that was given, and that gave birth to the, the vile bloods, as, as, the, as they're called in localization. Um, and the idea seems to be that, okay, this is where the corruption originated, right? And as we've mentioned before, um, Annalise is a little ticked off about the church basically ignoring her. <laughs> uh, it's like, it's like, hello, we had this big plan. We like it. This was this great big evil plan. And you've kind of just left me hanging, Lawrence. Well, Lawrence is gone now. And um, in the interim, assumably they've had their own sort of skirts of the beasts happen with the well, uh, well, lost well, children of well, antiquity well, and... Uh... Well, here's the thing. The blessed children from antiquity are from antiquity. These are So the idea with Canehurst okay. is that Canehurst always had a beast problem, much like Yarnum. They always had a beast problem because they've always had a blood drinking problem. <laughs> <laughs> they, can't, they can't get rid of their blood alcoholism, so you can't get rid of the beast scourge. Okay. Right, so they've always had the disease, the, pro- the quote-unquote disease, right? So 
The problem is, is that regular beasts, they can hunt those no problem. So their knights were able to hunt those. But what happens if the beasts can fly away? Well, now we have an issue. <laughs> and they're also smart enough to know to hide among all our statues that we keep on just lathering around the place. <laughs> so the idea is that the, the, the lost children of antiquity are... or. The term lost child, for those wondering, the, the je- it's, a very lit- it's a literal translation of the word that I translate as, like, spawn. Because the idea is that it's, it, it's an old word that refers to, like, a, ba- like a noble's bastard child. But colloquially, it basically just refers to a monster. It refers to anything that sort of has a... It's, it, it came out wrong, right? Like, it's a, ba- it's a bad consequence to something. Okay. So, like, for example... Um, so the idea is, like, um, in Dark Souls 2, the, uh, the, the, the different, uh, sister, the, the, the daughters of Manus, or whatever you want to call them, right? The, the children of Manus. Those are also described as spawns of dark. So the same idea. Uh, There's, like, these, okay. these twisted monsters, right? So, again, it just seems to be another word that Miyazaki likes to use in place of, like, demon or something that means, like, a monster of some sort. Okay. Right? So the idea is that these are just beasts that have a, um, a, uh, a more bat-like form. And they're, like, they're these ancient monsters that Kanehurst has never been able to kill because they could just fly away or hide, right? Um, so that's been the idea. They've been around. And all the beasts we see in, the, like, the Kanehurst crest and stuff, those are regular, furry, hairy beasts because those are the normal beasts that got in. But the specially corrupted beasts, they become the lost children of antiquity. And that's why righteous weapons are especially effective against them. Hmm. Right. So... That's the idea there. So, like, Kainers has always had this problem. Um, but with all the, cor- like you said, it may have gotten also worse with the corruption thing, but they, they've, they've, they've had a long history of hunting beasts, so even longer than German. Like, this is another thing you have to realize when souls, when someone's, when something in souls says they are the first, there's always like an asterisk there, because there's always some, <laughs> there's some qualifier when there's something, oh, it's the first or the last or the blah, blah, blah. Like, it's like, <laughs> oh, it always happens in every FromSoft game. You always have to be like, okay, well, First, it's like, well, yes, from a certain point of view. <laughs> anyway, so the uh, the context for Kanehurst, though, is like, okay, all this stuff is going on in Yarnum. Uh, Annalise is very miffed. So some Kanehurst, we see one wandering knight named Leo. He's in the Chalice Dungeon. So we know that some, like, Kanehurst knights are, like, going just into the ruins and they're looking for corruption there. Mm-hmm. And, well, where else are they going to get corruption if not from the ruins? Because as we see, Leo's been wandering for apparently forever. <laughs> <laughs> but, um... The, the other answer is, okay, well, let's go to, um, let's go get it from the hunters, because those hunters have tons of corruption. They've been absorbing lots of blood echoes or left, because echoes are, um, left wills. They're the will, they're, they're, they're the wills, they're the, they're the soul, basically, right? Like, yeah. the idea is that the echoes in blood are the actual, the will of the, of the living being. So, like, when you have an evil will, that be, creates a curse, right? So, like, when you're, like, you have a grudge, that grudge in your, your wills of your, in your blood uh, creates this negative magical effect, and when it's like isn't positive the, and stuff, it has in li- in limiting effects, etc. Isn't the isn't the term what is it the ishi of blood or something like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yes. So here's the thing: there's a double meaning there because ishi can be written um, it can be written with both the meaning of just will and as well as a different kanji to mean la- like dying wish, last will, left will, as I like to translate it. Because the idea okay. is that this is the will left behind. So when you absorb blood echoes, you're just absorbing the wills of the blood. Your your blood, the physical blood is convert is being converted or extrapolating into um into a non tangible like sort of soul like energy force basically right. It's essentially like that, and the idea is that the two are one and the same. Blood and blood echoes are um. They're basically two sides of the same coin, is the, the idea, I guess. Mm-hmm. And that may be why the localization wanted to go with the idea of an echo of something. It also, it fits then very thematically into this idea of um, evolution, that you have will which exists within the blood itself. Yes, and that will has a direction it wants to go in, and that becomes yeah. the basis for metamorphosis and things like that. And the idea is that the corruption of the Kanehurst clan is a result of these left will. So Thumerians have more corruption in general, and the Thumerian royalty have the most, which is see, um, seen Queen Yarnum. Um, hmm. But the idea is that Kanehurst has been essentially doing the same, because they were old nobles of Kanehurst, and they've continued to do it. Now, it became muted over time, but Lawrence, by bringing them Thumerian blood, is now bringing it back into them. And they were going supposed to be being fed by feeding more on blood and trying to get more high-quality blood. It was supposed to help get them more corruption. That would have it turned Annalise immortal, and it helps make them get to the point where they can have a blood baby, as it's called. Yeah. But, instead of having this blood baby, um, what we're seeing instead is that Annalise has been left out to dry. So, in place of corruption, 
of blood left wills absorbed from a regular citizens or anything like that. They're like, okay, we'll get it from the church's hunters because the churches have been killing lots of beasts, lots of people, lots of stuff with echoes that have been absorbed. And those echoes don't, obviously, they're killing them. So these are people who don't want to die. So this creates a, at least a little trace amounts of little grudges and corruption, which now seeps into their blood, right? Mm. So now they're like, okay, we'll just get, that's why um, the church, I mean, the Canehurst is hunting um, mainly other hunters. And this is where, like, they sort of, the, the, Annalise basically now wants to get back at the, the healing church for basically leaving her out to dry. So, you know, like, it's basically two villains squabbling over each other because their partnership <laughs> tore apart. Like, Lawrence this... really fucks a lot of things. Yeah, well, Lawrence, spoiler alert, he's the bad guy in the game. Is this where we get uh, the Bloody Crow of Kanehurst? Yes. So, the Bloody Crow of Kanehurst is Eileen's old master, the first hunter of hunters. Oh, okay. So, yeah, yeah. So, like... When the Hunter of Hunters retires, it seems like he, he's been hunting hunters for a long time. So he's, he, he's an old man now, like German, right? Um, he seems to retire, but it seems much like German, he doesn't exactly hmm. want to die yet. And one thing that, that's nice about Kanehurst's corrupted blood, especially the Queen's, is that it gives you some, you know, it rejuvenates your life force a little, right? Like when you get low on health, you start, you don't die. You, you start regenerating HP a little bit because it you're not allowed to die, right? That's the idea. It's like you're, you're, kind, you're kind of getting some hints of immortality from yeah. the Kanehurst blood. Um this is something that manifests in the immortality of Annalise, but it also seems to affect those who drink from her blood and join the clan that way. So you have someone like um, the first hunter of hunters who seems to basically do that. And that's why he still wears the crow outfit we see. He just swaps it out for some of the knight armor on the, the arms, legs, and head. Um, he also wields um, like the Kanehurst weapons and stuff, but that seems to be the idea. And that's why Eileen seems so fixated on, no, this is my fight. Like I need to do, like this is her old master she's getting rid of, right? Yeah. And again, like a lot of people have obviously speculated about the first hunter of hunters because they thought, well, maybe the idea was that this was German's apprentice, old apprentice, right? And like stuff. And then Maria came out, and people are so confused because, like, wait, wait, so German is the so is like German the is German like the is German like having Maria as the apprentice then? So what is with the the, you, the bloody crow using the quick you, step ability and all that? So. Why do you gotta Why do you gotta call me out like this? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I, it's not just you. It's it's a lot of the community, and that's because. And this oh is yeah, like, this is not a theory. I did not. I just for the record in the commentary, I, the only things I really came up with on my own were the idea that the Guidance rune was an incomplete beast rune, uh, and some other rune interpretations, which most of them are probably wrong, and <laughs> maybe one other thing. But like, I, uh, th this was all readily available information created by other people. Yeah, but like the idea with um the 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 bone is that the bone doesn't mention gender in the Japanese version. And this is something that Japanese community has really mocked the English community for. Like they really <laughs> break the English community over the coals for this because it was something that, that that's very like, well, I shouldn't say they break the English community so much as the English localization over the coals for this. And that like, this is something that was like anyone who read who, anyone who approached it from the Japanese perspective and looked at the scenario where you have this, you have the doll, you have the, the hairpin. Yeah. It's out at German's workshop in the dream, but it's this is clearly the real world, quote-unquote, right? Like, you have the chest with the spare doll parts. You have the old hunter's bone with a single solitary grave that belongs to uh, German's apprentice. It's very obvious, looking at the circumstances, that the idea is that, okay, the doll is based on German's apprent apprentice, who appears to be based on physicality, a Canehurst woman, you know, white, thin, thin, thin uh, facial bone structure, um, gray hair, all that stuff, right? Yeah. And it looks so all that looks like it's very obvious. So it's not really a surprise in the, in the JP community as much when that turns out to be the case in the DLC. But the English community, they're left with this idea that oh, the the like one of German's first apprentice, he, and it's like okay, it's supposed to be a he. So everyone goes to okay, well maybe Bloody Crow of Canehurst because he uses the old hunter's bone. So maybe the idea is like he's supposed to be the one who originally had the use of the quick yeah. step and all that stuff. And it's he like, was buried no. there, and then he dug himself up, and he dug up yeah, his yeah, bone. Yeah, like this, which it's, it's such you a you already looted. Yeah, like, it becomes this really weird theory. And again, that's because it's not it, right? Like I said, like, the idea is very clearly, the idea is that he's one of the original hunters with German. Uh, he became a hunter of hunters. Uh, he eventually, obviously, Lee, he uh, retires. He gives it over to Eileen, who takes over in, in his place for that. But he ends up, clearly, he, again, this is a consistent thing we see with all the characters. They don't want to die, or they don't want to, they want more power or something like that. They always either want to live longer or have more power and authority to be able to manipulate reality in some respect. So... Uh, with that comes this idea that, okay, all, um, 
I'm going to now take some of this blood, and he becomes enraptured with Annalise's blood, so no longer is he just trying to live more, now he's just, he's fully into it. Like, he's got experience hunting hunters, so now he will hunt on her behalf and stuff like that. And that's why he's sort of this background threat that that Eileen has, has to now sort of contend with and why she's so focused on him. Okay. And then, so now you have Kane, so you have Holy Blades are falling apart. They're all going to hell. <laughs> on top of that, Kanehurst is now come swooping in and hunting them all. <laughs> so all the rest of the surviving hunters are just getting hunted and their corruption taken so they can take blood corruption. And Logarius is seeing all this and being like, oh, okay, I get it now. This, th- these Kanehurst people who are taking advantage of this chaos, they're the cause of all this. They're uh. their blood that was corrupted. So this is where Logarius gets in his head, right? Because what you have to understand, when you look at Logarius' motto, where they talk about, like, wisdom and foolery and all that stuff, what he's basically saying is, okay, good and evil and being smart and dumb don't have anything to do with each other. You could be smart, and you could do something that's the smart thing to do, but it's very evil, right? Like, that's the idea with Lawrence. Lawrence did, okay, it was very smart to team up with Kane Hurst and work together and do all this. Like, that was the smart thing. He... Glogarius is basically conceding that, but he's like, but it was wrong. It was evil and should not have been done. And we, we have to be righteous and good. And now we see how we have suffered divine punishment or whatever. Like, like the idea is like providence is now turned away from us, right? This is the whole idea with the, uh, the wheel of destiny, right? This idea that the wheel of fortune is yeah. going to, um, it's now turned against us because we are on the wrong path. And it will turn right back once we get back on the right path. And do you think follow... then that the uh, the wheel that they use, the Lagarius wheel, do you think that's from the Buddhist hell scrolls as well? Then it, it's possible, but it's the thing is, is that um, the executioners as a group are very steeped in mysticism, and this again ties okay. back to the Victorian era, in that there was a, a huge surge in the occult mysticism practices during is, the Victorian. Is era. Is that why they have the uh, the pyramid with the eye as their symbol? Yeah, yeah, it's the same idea, right? Like that sort of Alistair has the Crowley eye of sort of, yeah. Yeah, the eye of yeah, the Crowley eye of providence, Illuminati type of thing. Again, same idea. And the wheel of destiny again ties back to the arcana. So Okay. So it's the same exact concept there. And that's why um again, this all seems to tie into the idea that they become this fanatic they basically become the f- they become the true believers in the church, right? Like the healing church, all of them are just a bunch of Bergenwer students. They know it's all bogus <laughs> and like it's it's all it's a it's a scam, right? Like they're 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 the they're the like they're the small time cult that like tries to get its hundred followers to believe in them so they can keep paying them money. So they can yeah. afford their like their giant ass jumbo jet or whatever it is, right? Okay. So you have all that happening. Um, but the Logarius, he was, like I said, he was a Yarnamite Holy Blade. So for him, this, he bought into the, he bought into the Ludwig spiel like Ludwig did. And unlike Ludwig, he doesn't have the same doubts. He thinks that it's all, it's all legit. Like this is all supposed to be a preordained from the gods type of thing. Well, yeah. the gods want us clearly to go back on the right path of Radiance. He's discovered this right path by looking and finding the lost rune of Radiance, um, that the Ludwig and company threw out because he had guidance. Um, and then the idea is, okay, now, Kanehurst seems to be the problem. Now, it's a, it's a huge misunderstanding, obviously, right? Like, Kanehurst is just taking advantage of the scenario. But, Lug- you can see how Lugaria sort of sees all the little pieces, and he sort of starts connecting dots, right? And he just happens to connect them wrong. <laughs> the, prob- the problem is the church itself. He yeah. doesn't want to blame the church, though, because that would go against his religious prerogative, though. I'm just so wondering, like, oh, okay. I'm just, like, in, my, in the back of my mind, I'm being kind of quiet. I'm just thinking where exactly I'm going to slot in an image of the Church of Scientology into this conversation. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> sorry, I keep going. Just have, it, like, just have it, like, creep up, like, in the corner of the screen, like, <laughs> throughout, like, it just... Yeah, it's like, <laughs> you have this guy who, you have, like, with Lawrence, he's like, he, he just did this for to get blood and to buy jumbo jets, and that's like L. Ron Hubbard. But then you have these yeah. crazy guys who actually believe it, and that's like, you know, Tom Cruise or John Travolta. Yeah. I don't know. So yeah, same idea though. So all the, all the 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 executioner you executioners or the executioner unit because the one thing that people have always been confused about is how does this relate to the executioner enemies that you sometimes see like you see one in Yarnum towards the beginning area you see two in two or three in Hemlick and you see yeah. uh, like two in um, Forbidden Woods those aren't the same executioners no. those are a different those are completely unrelated those enemies in the Japanese name are more accurate they're, they're called executioners internally. Um, but the actual covenant is called the execution unit. So it's similar yes. to how the choir is more literally the holy song unit, they are the execution unit. So there, the idea is that they're supposed to be like this sort of like this this part of the church military complex, much like the holy blades, right? Yes. And this goes to the point that the 
the the holy the the executioner enemy is just like some of these experiments that became these big hulking monstrosities and they're like sealing them in armor and stuff like that and they happen to look like executioners so they were called that internally and then the the localization picked that up and made that the official english name but the japanese name is more accurately a dismantler or a dissector and you know the idea is you know you take these axes and you like cut them up <laughs> you know like yeah. dismember them all right the execution the ex so the execution unit its job is to uh, get rid of get rid of the corrupted blood, right? Because their idea is, in their fanatical thinking, if we get rid of all the blood corruption, then everything's golden. The tr everything will just fall into place naturally. Like, like we'll, the, the the gods will will naturally, through their invisible hand of divine providence, will guide us to to ascension and all this stuff, right? Like everything's gonna come up roses. So Logarius and company basically form is like, okay, we're gonna deal with the the vile blood. So he creates like the 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 wheels, which he doesn't use himself, because again, they're reusing an old model. <laughs> And, uh, again, the, the closer you get to the Logarius boss fight, the, 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 the worse, uh, the Executioner lore becomes. The farther you get from it, it's really amazing. Like, the backstory and the origins are like, oh, there's a lot of really good stuff. You get to the boss fight, though, and you're like, he's not even using a trick weapon. <laughs> anyway. But they, well, this is I mean, he go. turns it on fire. Sh okay, sure. <laughs> Burning like, why, don't blood. Use why don't we use a trick weapon? Don't worry, it'll be a trick weapon soon enough. Goes and <laughs> murders a bunch of people to curse it. Burning blood is another one of these FromSoft phenomena, which somebody has to make a video on, because it they keep doing it. Well, it ties back to my idea with the sunlight, right? Like, the sunlight has this power to, like, exercise arcane qualities. And mm. so you see the same... Uh, it seems to be highly... So it becomes highly effective against uh, stuff that lives under the sunlight, like beasts and monsters and stuff like that. And regular people, obviously. Mm. And then, but I think I yeah. think he does doesn't I think Logarius deals arcane damage though doesn't he? Uh, with the uh, with the the curse stuff, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's the same okay. thing with like Ludwig when he turns on the the arcane cosmic blade. It does arc additional arcane damage too. But the blade itself is what's doing the righteous damage because it's silver, right? So okay. Yeah. So like that's the idea. Um, Logarius for his part. Um, the idea is that basically they try killing everyone. Well, Logarius then has a problem, because they can't kill the queen. It's like, they stab her, she comes back up. They, <laughs> they, 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 they slash her, she comes back up. It's like, why won't you die? Um, so they're like, okay, well, the corruption is basically always going to be around then. Well, what are we going to do about this? Because she can always blood drink, and like she can keep doing what she's doing. So their idea is, okay, well, in prisoner, we'll like, put a helmet on her head, which they repurpose a Kanehurst helmet. Don't ask me how they find a Kanehurst helmet, which can be specifically repurposed to be like a man <laughs> in the Iron Mask scenario. This has never made sense, no matter what level of development you look at. So, <laughs> But then again, this has always been a problem with... Uh, one of the, the biggest problems with FromSoft world building has always been prisons. Because it's like, why are you locking up this guy with all his armor and weapons? Why? Just <laughs> why? Who does this? Why? I, quite, I, I like an Elden Ring... Um, um, well... I, I like the idea that you just have prisoner attire that itself has defensive properties. And then, like, <laughs> yeah. Well, then you have the Ever Jails. <laughs> yeah. It's like, okay. It's like, don't worry, we'll, we'll see you in another dimension. But you, you still gave him his weapons and armor. <laughs> yeah. It's like, why? Why do you keep doing this? Demon Souls, get... Demon Souls did it pretty well, though. Well, Demon Souls is the same thing, though. Like, like you could attack Freck in there, and he'll, like, fight back and stuff, I'm pretty sure, right? So, like, it's still, like, you leaving them with all... Like, you loot ah, literally sure. <laughs> weapons. And, like, it, it's, it, it's, it's always been a problem with FromSoft world building. They have never, <laughs> ever got in... They've ever, never made prisons make sense. Maybe he just anyway. smuggled... Maybe he smuggled his weapons in. <laughs> they smug... Just smuggle... <laughs> You like Just carried like, it? Like, you have, you have, Anna, you have like, and at least be, like, smuggling that blood. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, but the idea is, okay, so Annalise gets her head locked up so she can't drink blood, presumably, um, but they don't seem to realize that she could just, like, absorb it into her being, like, directly, but yeah. you know what? Listen, listen, like I said, the whole thing is about, we, we're not going to be smart and evil, so that means we'll be good and dumb. <laughs> <laughs> That's is it. Like, that, once you realize that, that, like, the entire point of the execution is to be stupid, a lot of their, their stupidity <laughs> makes sense. <laughs> well, it's more so about not caring about intelligence and focusing more on being good, but yeah. Yes, but yeah, that, that still does change the <laughs> But, like, it's okay, we dumb, we good. <laughs> um, the... So, the, and Logarius, his idea is, okay, I'm going to martyr myself by, like, sacrificing myself so I can hide away Annalise. She'll be this great secret that will seal away, and she won't be able to access anybody, so all her servants are doing so. And that's, now, 
And then, like, you know, the bridge to Kanehurst gets destroyed, so, like, no one can get to Kanehurst. Uh, Lovarius is defending it as, like, the, the stalwart defender. He, uh, again, this idea of, like, strong emotions, he basically cursed himself into being, like, an undead type of scenario, where he's, like, this undead, like, guy just sitting in his chair, like, mm. I must defend against anyone who tries to, like, break in and stuff, right? So, yeah, same idea. And then the church, the church is like, oh, my, thank God, we have a PR win for once. <laughs> and they're like, oh, yeah, Lugarius, he's this great martyr. He helped save all of this, right? Like, he, he totally, like, we're, we're totally still a legit church. We promise. <laughs> they canonize him, make him a martyr. Yeah, yeah. Indoctrinate like, should... new, newcomers like Alfred to believe this stuff. Well, the, the thing is, the church basically, the, the, the executioners seem to basically run themselves. Like, they're kind of like a monastic order almost. Like, they're kind of got oh. quasi-independence. Because, like, they have their own secret workshop and stuff that they operate out of. And, like, Alfred was a regular hunter. But then he somehow got inducted. He sort of somehow came to discover the Logarius teachings. And then he went down the rabbit hole and never came back. <laughs> so, like, the idea with, like, um, the church is basically they said, Okay, we are going to lift up the executioners for the good that they've done. Because they have done this wonderful service of giving us an, an out for all of our screw-ups. <laughs> We could just blame everything on the the Kanehurst clan and call it a day. And you kind of see it, like, the graves that are set up as, like, this monument to the executioners who fell. It seems like there was, like, six or so executioners who died and were never... Rec- obviously, we loot their corpses at Kanehurst, but, like... The idea being is that there was these executioners, and the little Garius gets this giant monument. And there's this altar with, like, a little bit of blood on the cloth there. Yeah. Indicating that they're doing like a Dark Moon Knight scenario where like they're taking body parts and like offering it up to Logarius as kind of like this, oh, Logarius. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, it's like, because the idea seems to be that Logarius is kind of like a, a, almost like a Messiah type figure. Like he's like a, like a Christian saint almost. And that he, it seems like the idea is that, oh, he's still alive. Like he's like among the stars. And he's like, he has his, his is this the will of, of the great master Logarius? Like he is somehow like, he's now like almost like a god now where he's like, like sort of influencing things with like divine providence and all this stuff. Right. This okay. just seems to be the idea from Alfred's dialogue. But in truth, uh, Logarius is just like an undead guy over there. Um, and uh alfred and company they're just like making offerings of all these hunters because again the idea is that okay they exterminate the canehurst clan and they locked up annalise but there's still a bunch of those hunters it's kind of like the dark wraith scenario from dark souls where it's like yeah, okay but yeah. there's dark wraiths and there's these blood hunters which are you know out in the field you know doing the blood hunting you, you, you didn't get rid of them so the the executioner's mission continues they're still trying to hunt down the last of these hunters like say the bloody crow of canehurst which eileen ultimately confronts because he tries to go after seemingly the lawrence blood because you know high quality blood i was never able to connect the dark wraiths to uh to canehurst because like the ghosts operate exactly like the ghosts in uh in uh new londo operate but I, and i was talking about in the commentary how the lost children of antiquity like you can sort of connect them to the drakes in the valley of the drakes sort of function similarly as like these flying enemies that don't quite fly and i was like yeah did, did he just replay through this area and just Reskin it as Kanehurst. Uh, Miyaz- like, that's Miyazaki. That's Miyazaki. Like Elden Ring literally redoes Crystal Sage. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like yeah. It, it, this happens in all. The, this happens in all the games. Like there's always going to be references to past games, at, le- at least in the loosest sense. Like yeah. Fair Lady is a very obviously r- riff on uh, uh, Straya. So like, mm-hmm. like you, you'll find the you'll uh, if we if we went down the rabbit hole of connecting <laughs> FromSoft games to other FromSoft games, we'll end up in the theories of oh they're all actually all in the same universe. Oh hell no. Anyway. So, yeah. uh, so executioner, so executioners give the PL one. This seems to be around when the, um, the old yarn and burning incident happens as well, right? Okay. So, uh, we have, uh, we have the, we have old Yarnum, the, in order to access old Yarnum, you have to go to a grave, basically. It's this giant mausoleum with a single giant grave, which you open, it creates the way to. So it looks like they built on top of it, this little, like, mausoleum monument to sort of, like, uh, honor those who were abandoned and fallen and, you know, because old Yarnum was burned and was basically left for dead, right? Jura obviously doesn't let anyone want to come in anymore and all that stuff, but that's the basic idea. Um, is that um, they basically they they went scorched earth trying to get rid of um, all the beasts that they themselves created. So yeah, uh, this is also where we start seeing the the um, the the mensis ritual um, and the choir um, come into the picture now because by this point, executioners have now basically um, have now basically given the church the much needed PR when they need they needed. They needed some excuse to somehow tell the the residents this isn't our fault. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, now that they have that, they've built the monument right next to the old Yarnum thing, celebrating the executioners, the old Yarnum's being respected, quote-unquote, for all those who have fallen or lost, even though they basically just said, okay, we're, we're abandoning this, uh, this site, this is, <laughs> this is no good anymore. Uh, and things are Dig not over it, we're done. Well, Mens- well, the problem that becomes is that, Mens- is that Mensis and Choir create a split in the church, and this becomes the thing that defines the church ever since. The Choir control the church mainly, but mm-hmm. the Mensis seems to more or less act as like this dissident faction, which hides out in Yahar Ghul and is trying to um, subvert and control the official church policy as run by the Choir. Because right. the idea is that the, the Choir is not a public... They're not supposed to. They're not supposed to be known as the leaders, right? They're the secret brains of the church, right? Yeah. The idea is supposed to be like, as Alfred says, you know, the the residents of the old counselors. It means the old leaders of the of the healing church. They live up in the upper cathedral ward in the upper stratum. And again, you again, it goes back to this idea of like levels. The idea is that they want to become the upper stratum with close to the cosmos and whatever. So they live in the actual upper stratum of the church facilities. Mm-hmm. Whereas menses are located in the. In uh, Yahar Ghul, they have their uh, ritual in the Advent Plaza. Yeah, which they're is... more, and they're more obviously they have the more they're more obviously depraved and rough, yeah. like everything but about like it's also the... it's also just on a lower elevation in the world. Yeah, exactly, same idea. Because that again, it's the same idea of like the choir are this heavenly, clean, noble, yes. uh, very refined, and then like you get to Mensas and it's very crude and rough and depraved. Like you see some of the Mensas experiments with like the beasts and stuff like that, and like everything's like not very nice. So, same, I think, same idea here. I think this then takes us very neatly into the story, the main story of the game. Yeah. Uh, and we'll talk more about Menses and the Choir in a bit. But, uh, so, th- we begin the game. Uh, y- there is nothing in the Japanese script which can give us more information about the Blood Minister we meet in the beginning, is there? Nothing in the script. We get some environmental storytelling, but like all we know is that he is a again, like I said, ministers are blood treaters, so we know he's a part of the tr- of the healing church. Okay. Um, he's because the idea is that Yosefka's clinic. Um, I think Sophie in Sinclair lore has covered this before, but it seems like Yosefka's clinic was like an old like mayora house or something, like probably something like the like the old whoever like led Yarnum before the church took over. Like it seems like this was like probably their like mansion or whatever. Okay. Um, and then, like, there's, like, a big mausoleum out in the graveyard. Because it's a small graveyard. Because one of the things you have to understand is that Yarnum generally... Like, Yarnum used to bury people in the Forbidden Woods. Like, before it became the Forbidden Woods and all that. That was, like, their burial place. That's why all the the, the burial place for their gods. And then eventually it just becomes burial places for people the closer you get to Yarnum. Because, mm. obviously, as history progresses and the farther they get from their Fumerian heritage, there's less great ones being produced. Um, and more just regular uh, people. And eventually they run out of space, and eventually that they turn to Hemwick. And Hemwick starts, oh, hey, we'll take the bodies and we'll burn them. <laughs> and then we'll start doing some wacky experiments. Don't worry right, about well, it. Well, it makes sense, right? Because it's like you have this graveyard town, and this graveyard town needs more bodies. And Yardam's like, hey, we're running out of space to bury our bodies, so will you yeah. take our bodies? So it's like, okay, sure. <laughs> and we'll take whatever body parts we want, like the eyes or whatever we use for our rituals and our religious little cult thing, and then like we'll burn the rest, and then obviously the healing church starts doing this on mass, and they see, oh hey, we can use a- these ashes have some pretty nice qualities. We can take that off your hands in exchange, and da da da. Like you can see, kind of see how it becomes this sort of barter trade. But again, this the beast blood pellets, like so much contributes to the final collapse of the the holy blade era of things because just. And like I said, the split in the church, like there's just a lot of things that are happening at the same time. It just becomes this huge systems collapse, it seems like. And then the the choir tries to hold things together to keep their experiments running. And the menses, but menses are a huge problem that they're constantly having to deal with. And this sort of continues. And when we're, like you say, when the story begins in, in the game, we're just meeting this random blood minister. Because we're some guy, some foreigner that lives out there. I've been... Yeah. There's cut dialogue about the idea that you are a sick person and that you came here to cure your disease. This is nowhere hinted at anywhere in the final script. So it's you just seem to be a foreigner. You have a handmade note. Like this is something I see even a lot of people not too familiar with translation seem to know about is that the fact that this is a note that you yourself penned. It is it is it is something that is self written, basically self scribbled. Yeah, it, it is. a. How, how do they put it? It's a note written in a familiar handwriting or something like that. In the local or something like that, um, but like in in the Japanese, it's very straightforward. This is like something that was written by yourself. Okay. And, and it yeah. talks about uh, pale blood. Yeah, yeah. The idea is that find the pale blood and compl- and like I think the English calls it like transcend the hunt, and it means like to complete, to fulfill, to basically like the idea seems to be to bring an end to all of this. And right? when they when they say pale blood, they're talking about the moon presence. 
Yes. So the moon presence, the Japanese name is, uh, the term presence is uh, mamono. And this is a term I talk about a lot when I talk about Dark Souls. Ah, uh, yes. It, mamono. Yeah. I know yeah. that so term. It's a, yeah, it means like, um, <laughs> it means more literally a bad or an evil thing. Um, oh. Yeah, so, um, so, and so it tends to be translated as either demon or monster, or, so, like, a lot of JRPG monsters, quote-unquote, are mamono. So, for example, if you're familiar with, um, uh, if you're familiar with, say, the, uh, the Nier series in mm. Nier, Re the new Nier Replicant, uh, like, little remaster thing, uh, that, that game has the, quote-unquote, shades, those are mamono, and they are led by the Shadow Lord, so that is the, uh, the Mao, or the Demon King. Right, so okay. again, it's the play on the fantasy of you have the JRPG monsters, and he's led. They're led by the Demon King, and so you have to have the hero go thing. And obviously, Nier does its own little thing to do a twist on the formula. Same thing here is the idea is that Miyazaki likes using the term Mamono, generally seemingly to refer to general monsters, or in some cases like de demonic like beings. It seems to be when he's not using the English word demon, he's using the word Mamono. That's and interesting then, uh, because that that really reframes the game that you have this idea of the moon presence as a villainous enemy throughout the whole thing yeah, yeah, rather than being monster or moon demon that you yeah. like so whenever they're so when they're talking about like how does the english put it like something like um lawrence and um lawrence and his the the, the moon presence beckoned by lawrence and his associates oh, no the pale blood no yeah, yeah it's the moon presence yeah, beckoned moon by presence lawrence and his associates the pale blood right yeah um in the japanese it's more it's lawrence and so the term tachi is a suffix used and what happens is it, it's a pluralizing suffix, but when it refers to groups, so when you say, like, say, Lawrence Tachi, what you're basically saying is um, Lawrence and uh, and an unspecified, uh, at least one other person, right? So, like, it, yeah. it's an unspecified group. So if I mm -hmm. had a group of two people, I identify the prime member of the group, or at least who I think is the prime member, and then when I say Tachi, I can refer to those two people as that, right? Um, it could be a whole group of people, and the same thing would apply. So it doesn't really tell us if it's more than if it's one associate or more. You, you can at least infer that when it's saying the Japanese is saying something like uh, Lawrence and German, right? Because obviously German's one of the bi the big reveals that German's connected to all this is sort of something that the game tries to hint and sprinkle about um, up until the right until the very end, right? So yeah. it's something that it seems like they are purposely being vague about. And the idea seems to be is like okay, you have Lawrence and German. They are they're the one they're the ones who are associated with this. Uh, moon monster and that is the pale blood okay um so we go out uh squirts beast we die is there anything about the hunter's dream uh specifically that we are missing in the localization anything about how it operates that we haven't gone over well, one one of the things that, like I said, I talked about the doll and the idea of she takes the the idea with the doll is she takes the echoes, the left wills of others that are killed that we kill and take their blood echoes, quote unquote. We take yeah. their left their wills that they've left behind, and we and she helps us incorporate them into our will, so they can strengthen our spirit, our 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 essence to our blood, etc. Yeah. Right? Our attributes. So the idea is that we cre we have we create a stronger will by using the wills of others. So and this operation cleanses you of blood drunkenness in in lore, sort of. Uh, we don't actually see that per se, because obviously there's lots of hunters who have been in the dream but no longer do it for one reason or another. Some of whom clearly ended up blood drunken and sort of again goes back to the first hunter of hunters needs a hun hunters to hunt, right? Yeah. So. It's this seems to like it, it. It's possible that it may play a part, but it doesn't seem to be. It doesn't seem to be. Uh, cons let's say it's not necessarily a reliable. Um, it's not okay. necessarily reliable if it helps in any way. It's a so, it's a theory which makes sense, but it we don't need that theory. Yeah. yeah. Well, the thing is, we're still screwed. Um, because <laughs> because again, the idea with the the reason why I say Koss gets blood drunk hunters is because pretty much you being a hunter guarantees you're going to be blood drunk. Like it's just. Like the moment you start shedding blood and getting and start immersing yourself in it, you're sort of putting yourself on that path. Period. So yeah. it's not really about you being blood drunk that someone cares about. It's just that the blood drunk are the ones that are probably going to die first at some point. Okay. And like the idea is that like obviously if you're like a novice hunter, you haven't even killed a beast yet. Are you really even a hunter? <laughs> like so like if you die on your first thing, like Koss is probably like not going to care. But as soon as like as soon as a beast di dies, on it's like oh oh. Now suddenly, cost is all like well, I say cost, but again, her curse is all about okay. Now you now you count. Yeah, it's a it's a very it's a very uh it's a very unfair curse. Like I said, it includes a snake and an amygdala. Like, can you just imagine the random amygdala just snatching up people happens to grab a beast that one time and now it's screwed when it dies? Um, I sh 
uh, we we probably should talk a, just a bit about this. Cos is dead, but Cos it like once you transcend to the dreamlands, the idea of death becomes a very sort of mutable concept because Cos still exercises will, even in the nightmare where like the the orphan of Cos will scream and the lightning will be summoned. Well, okay, so here here's where I stand on this. Cos okay. is dead. Period. Like dead. Like okay, because Cos isn't Cos isn't say. Uh, the reason why the Great Ones are able to exist in death is because they transfer their consciousness from their physical bodies in the real world to the cosmos. And they are able to circumvent the normal thing. Because normally, when you die, your soul, quote-unquote, you obviously have your soul in your blood in the real body, but your soul, your mind, is now just existing in, let's call it, the cosmic ocean up ab- up above, right? <gasps> like, that's the idea. Cos, Mick, I just got that. Oh, well, go- Goss goes. So, but anyway, <laughs> the idea is that uh, the idea is that you have um, the idea with Koss is that Koss is has lived in our world, right? The real world, like Ebrietus. So when mm-hmm. Koss dies, Koss is dead. Much like anyone else that dies, Koss now joins the cosmic o- the, that cosmic ocean. But Koss's body and blood is still a great one. So it has a lot of power and it can inflict a curse. And as we can see, curses can manifest things like ghosts and stuff like that. In Casa's case, even despite the name ghost and ghost, it's not she doesn't actually produce a ghost of herself. She creates this dream di- she creates her own little sort of dream dimension in death. And what happens is when we see um so this is why I say Cos never directly intervenes to stop us during all of this. Because it's not really her consciously. Like, she isn't like she's this puppet master who's, like, waiting in the wings and she's controlling things, act like, consciously. It's her will, her instinctive desires which are doing this. And she has a huge instinctive grudge right now against hunters. And that's okay. why the curse is so... And she's got all that power in the world to spend in her blood and her will. So that powerful will with all that great one intellect and arcane power that goes with it is being spent focused solely on screwing over all the hunters who screwed her over. All right. What that translates to when you talk about, say, the orphan and stuff, is that the orphan becomes, um... German? The orphan becomes... Well, 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 yes, but... <laughs> that, 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 that's a, that's something for... But the idea is that the orphan is... When the orphan screams and you see the bolt of electricity coming down, that's coming down from the sky up above. So the idea is that the um, it hits Koss's body, and then it emanates from there, and it happens to become an attack for us. So it's completely accidental. It's just supposed to be the... the it's not like the orphan is trying, necessarily. It's just, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a monstrous baby thing. So okay. it just screams, and that scream translates to an attack because game mechanics. <laughs> but the idea is that you have this bolt of lightning coming from the sky, because the idea is that the bit... It's Koss existing as part of this consciousness in the, the record of all of existence, right? Because that's the idea with the cosmos. The, the, while blood exists on the physical side, being doing blood things, it's creating plants and rocks and, and people and, all, and transforming you into monsters and then no longer monsters and all this stuff. Like, while blood is doing all that on the physical side, on the conscious side, there is this mental aspect of blood, which is recording all this stuff. It's the stuff that gives us life and consciousness and mind, and we sleep, we go into these dream worlds, which we can start manipulating and stuff. But when we die, we no longer have control over these dream worlds. Our conscious mind just becomes... All that's left is the record of us and all of our actions up until this point. Okay. Right. So, everything everything that we have consciously... um done becomes part of this record so Koss is now part of that record when she dies her curse has now created a dream dimension there and you can even argue it's arguably from that consciousness that's just floating there with all the others in this cosmic record when that when but she she's no longer alive per se but when she when the her she quote unquote hears her baby crying her her mind her conscious her 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 feelings her thoughts her record senses that and that is what creates the bolt of electricity like that little jolt like shh, oh like my baby it's that instinctive connection between her and the body her curse created which again it's a simulation as we say it's as real as the real you in the real world quote unquote mm-hmm. so the idea is that her dead body in the the nightmare is sort of connecting to her consciousness which is lost in the cosmic record it's never going to like like maybe theoretically you could maybe drag it out of that ocean and have it repossess its body but like it's not like Koss can just freely do that as she wills it because it's not really she willing to do it she's just it's just her body acting on instinct when she hears her child's baby cry there's this connection with her physical body okay. that just you, we see it generate a electric bolt similar to how electricity gets generated between the synapses in your brain right like it's like 
Mm. The idea is that there's this feeling, it creates this jolt of electricity between the the, the mental consciousness of cost that exists in the abstract dream world's um, cosmic record, as I call it, and then the physical body that the dream, one of these dream worlds has created uh, in this simulation of the beach where she died. All right, all right. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's a that's a very complicated concept. To <laughs> but no, but I think I think it's good because the extent to which entities are operating in the world it is left very vague for good reason. It's like I think the story probably wouldn't work as well if we were just given a guy explaining this. But um, well, it like, is, it's just very boring to be told all this stuff. Yeah, well, <laughs> it makes more sense when you can see how it operates and did, and then sort of reverse engineer the rules. This is what makes. From soft storytelling so interesting if you mm -hmm. got told all the lore for a lot of the games you'd realize they're very simple very straightforward and in some extent to some extent a lot of times very basic um, yeah but when you're able to reverse engineer and stuff it becomes much more intellectually rigorous and interesting even just hearing me say someone who's going through and explaining it because i can point to you all the different evidence and the points and how it functions and how we see it operate visually it just it just becomes a more engaging experience yeah all right then um we were, talk, we were talking. Yeah, we were talking about the. Uh, well, we we, we were uh, finishing on the hunter's dream, and I was thinking we could go on to the menses and choir sort of split dynamic, yeah, yeah, okay. uh, because that sort of. Um, the idea is that like you have, um, vermin phantasm, East Lauren, you have Bergenworth, you have the Healing Church, and now you have uh, menses and the choir. You have these very different ideas about how to how to reach this goal of transcendence uh and we talked a bit about the choir and menses do you want to uh expand a bit on fir firstly the choir because the idea there is you have the orphanage right where all the best sort of prospects for the choir are groomed and sort of educated into this role right well, so what happens is, is you have the you have the research hall experiments, right? Like mm -hmm. all that happens. Well, that leaves a lot of or, well, you have lots of dead, you have lots of dead, beastified, and then dead uh, people, right? A bunch of people who were involved in these experiments, a bunch of dead bodies that are um, either beasts or they're you know living failures who were planted up there and nothing ever came of it. Um, yeah. So what are we gonna do with all the children now? All these children, all these orphans that are now left on the s streets of Yarnum because all their parents got taken into a cathedral and nothing happened. Well, this is going to become <laughs> another PR disaster, possibly. Well, again, this is the church being the church. They're like, well, never let a terrible tragedy go to waste. We will take in those children and we will start our own orphanage. <laughs> <laughs> and so they basically just convert the old experiment hall area into its and create its own little orphanage for all these children. And they basically indoctrinate them to be their own little as research assistants. Yeah. And so, like, and this is something, again, the farther you get from Willem, the more inhuman the the researchers of Ber Bergenworth's uh, legacy becomes, right? So, like, Willem, he was a guy who, you know, he had good intentions, it just was terribly misplaced to a very obviously fool's errand, right? Like, you're, you're just never going to be able to separate, um, you're never going to be able to separate transcendence from blood transformation. Like, it, it's, the blood, your blood is too fundamental to you. Yeah. Um, when, then you have Lawrence, who's like, no, 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 maybe we can use this, and the transformation can actually do a lot of good, and we can actually make this work a lot of things. So he's trying to think of how we can make trans, how can we can like keep on this transformation into great ones, and it could really kind of work. I think this could actually work out. Like this is like Lawrence's idea. Like he, he thinks that they, they, they're, there's something there. Um, then you get to the the choir, and the choir have basically been indoctrinated all this stuff, but not the important parts. Like we say, they disco they have to discover on their own. Oh, the cosmos is in the sky. Even though Ludwig and people realize, even like Bert, like Llewellyn knew this. Even like we see him with his observatories. If he's already researching phantasms and their connection to the stars, like anyone who's been to is would know this. But the choir, the choir, as we see, gets started when they are sent down as prospectors into the is tombs and they come back with like the is chalice as we see and yeah. like this is where things really get started because they get to start see oh okay there's this connection to the cosmos and they start seeing the church workshop and looking into ludwig because you have to see a lot of the choir people they love larping ludwig like one of the uh, choir's church prospectors he's called gremia in english but in japanese he's known as sir gremia like it's even written in english sa gremia <laughs> it's like so it's <laughs> like like you have this it's, it's it's the idea that he he's all bought into this whole ludwig knight nonsense right so <laughs> So like and like he uses the holy the Ludwig's holy blade and all that. So like yeah, like the choir like these Ludwig is a huge influence for them. Okay, and they're for, kind of the uh, they're sort of a true believer uh, sect then. 
to, yeah, to some extent, they believe at least so far that the, the, like, they buy into all the thing, like, okay, it's bogus and all these things, but they still think of the great ones as gods, right? Like, this is the idea of the choir, the holy song unit. For those that don't know, the term choir in Japanese can also be, if you change the kanji, it can be read the same way as the star song unit. In fact, funny, oh. fun fact, in the, in the, um, so the holy, because again, it goes back to the stars. So the idea, in fact, if you go into the, um, the design works for the concept art, they, someone actually left in, <laughs> that the uh left in the choir as the star song unit in the uh <laughs> in the Japanese version for design work so it's kind of funny <laughs> that is pretty so, good like, yeah yeah so like that's the idea though is that they're they they understand that the stars are the great ones those are their gods and the idea of their singing the holy song so to speak is that they're trying to communicate with because that's the point of like of singing in choirs and stuff is like you want to sort of praise and glorify god that's the idea of you having all this extra song and music in the mass to sort of liven up this entire thing where we all come together in the house of god in order to kind of sing the lord's praises spread spread his message all these things right so this idea is that the choir is supposed to function the same way they're trying to glorify the gods above and try to get their attention so that they will answer and spread their message and they will help un, un, um lift them up into the the holy divine realm of the heavens the cosmos right yeah so the idea with the 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 choir though is that okay they're the secret brains of the church well okay what happens to the the supposedly you know the not secret brains you know the actual leaders because they're nowhere to be found that's uh, <sighs> uh that's very uns- so yeah the idea it seems to be very clear that the uh, the choir realized that the their masters were not telling them everything, and when they figured that, they were like, "Oh, okay, well, you know, fair's fair. Uh, we understand. Like, you know, you're you're you've got your own ideas. You know, not everyone can always be uh can be like you know go to transcend into the become a higher being and all that. You know, gotta share those secrets with only those few. But you know, if you're gonna do it, so are we. So, <laughs> <laughs> and the idea seems to be that they basically you can uh think of what you will whatever they did with them and then uh they're now like they're like oh you know master you know master he gave me this very important message so like i'm just going to communicate to you oh don't worry you can't see him you know they're doing very important um very important church stuff right now so uh <laughs> uh you'll just be uh just listen to us we'll make sure to transfer the message and well don't worry tell tell us whatever your concerns are we'll make sure to carry it over to them <laughs> maybe my uh, how- maybe my protestant lapsed protestant upraised upraising is uh failing me here but wouldn't amelia have been like the leader of the healing church isn't that what a vicar is well she she is the official leader but this okay. is the thing you uh, the, the idea is that uh, um amelia is the the vicar right like she's this one of the successors to lawrence right but here's the thing the choir can like you just have to ha- give lawrence's locket to anybody and they can do it and from what we can see amelia seems to be an old high-ranking church member and she seems to more or less she like she's the public face right she's the public face of it but it's the choir who are really calling the shots they're the secret brains behind the operation in the church right now like that's the idea so um yeah so you have to we have to think like and as we can see amelia doesn't really able to do anything that effectuates any actual change like whatever the the choir has their idea they're doing they're only keeping the church and the whole organization and yarnum functioning as well as they can once they more or less get what they want they pretty much leave yarnum to its fate yeah and then uh amelia obviously amelia can't do any like she's basically just a puppet she can't do any all she could do is pray there and be like oh oh, please lord like oh if you have to do uh, right and and we see in the nightmare we see who apparently seems to be her original incarnation, like, because again, you can't get into the Hunter's Nightmare without killing Amelia first, if I recall correctly. So, um, um, it seems like the woman we see praying the same prayer with the same voice lines in the the Grand Cathedral before the altar, that seems to be Amelia in the Nightmare living her personal I th- hell. Reliving I, th- the- I think you can. I think you get the, uh, because you just have to go outside to the path that takes you to Old Yarnum. The amygdala will take you there. And I think the the eye of the blood drunk hunter doesn't it i think it spawns before you kill amelia let, right let me let me double check the yeah. eye of the blood H- drunk hunter if not we could just cut that out but blood drunk hunter uh once you've acquired okay uh grants access to the old once you've acquired uh, okay okay appears in the hunter once you once you've defeated vicar amelia and oh. turned the world state tonight well, that will... appears in the hunter's dream once you've defeated Vicar Amelia and turned the world state tonight. Players must have purchased the old hunter's DLC. Okay, yeah. So yeah, you have to kill Amelia. I was right. Okay, for her to spawn or for you to get the eye of the blood drunk hunter? No, no, for the hunter. The the it appears in the hunter's dream once you've defeated Vicar Amelia and to turn the world state tonight. Oh. So you have to kill her in order to acquire the item. So that's why I'm saying I'm pretty sure that's her. Okay. Same voice line, same location, same praying before everything. Has a black church hunter in her wing. Has the same gray hair with white 
uniform. That's interesting then, because I've yeah, been, yeah, uh, so. I've been, people have asked me that before in the comments, and I've like swatted them down, like how, how what a ridiculous proposition. Couldn't be. No, no, I, no, I, I I'm very, I'm actually, yeah, I, I'm, I'm fairly confident that is in fact the actual Amelia, and that's her living her personal hell, which is going back to the early days where she was also useless. <laughs> Yeah. Well, so congrats. When when you're getting like sniped in from uh, the arcane eyeball of hers, that's her. <laughs> now you know what her boss fight would have been in the modern world. <laughs> the black sky eye. I love that thing. When you have like <laughs> when you get into fifty, sixty arcane, that thing destroys. <laughs> it's really good. All right then. Well, to be fair, arcane. I've I've seen I've seen some of the arcane stuff like against Lawrence as a boss fight, like just freaking like call beyond like ninety nine arcane. It's like oh oh my. <laughs> Like just like go right up to him and go okay hit you with all the missiles he's dead <laughs> and, uh, but like so like that's the idea though with um with like uh say like amelia and the choir and stuff it's like amelia basically seems to more or less exist as a figurehead like the choir needs someone who can look legitimate sound legitimate da, 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 so they have amelia do that but they're the ones really running the show behind the scenes they're the ones who are operating they're the ones who are operating all the thumerian guards like the all the like giant guards guys like we see them patrolling upper cathedral ward and lower and the regular cathedral ward because that's where mm -hmm. they come from and then you have like the beast blood pellets obviously they're the ones that are doling them out then you have the uh like uh, just all the different like various little items and things and stuff. Like th like they're the ones with the like the blue elixirs because again they learned them from their masters and now they're carrying on the stuff. Like they're they're obviously wearing the Bergenworth uh the uniforms they wear. They have the special uh holy call. Like this is another thing to talk about. The reason why for oh we never we never talked about this with the executioners. <laughs> I completely got off track. The the reason why the executioner uniform yeah. is uh, um related. The reason why the executioner uniform has is um related it's the it's the original uniform which was then used and carried over into all other church uniforms but it doesn't make sense because the executioners come later the holy blades clearly precede them mm -hmm. and and everything well this is because the, the those two statements aren't exclusive it is the original uniform it just wasn't always the garb of the executioners it was originally the holy blade uniform and you can even see this in the dlc the dlc shows um ludwig's uniform it's the same cloak and cape with the same holy cloth on the back the the Dark yeah, blue or and the uh, under his skull, right? Uh, uh, oh yeah, also under Lawrence's skull, same yeah. thing. But Ludwig, if you see Ludwig's back, he wears the same executioner cloak yes. with that holy cloth. Yes. So, and again, we see this like, like that's the reason why, and it goes the choir carries this on. They wear they have the same fancier holy cloth that you see with Lawrence, and you see with um, Lawrence's skull. If I I think I said yeah, Ludwig's Lawrence's skull. skull. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm talking. Yeah, I'm talking about. Um, yeah, I'm talking about like Ludwig with the executioners and the choir and Lawrence's skull. You see the same thing. So like the choir are basically just using and the same thing with their eye mask. Again, the eye mask is connected to Wil to Willem. We see the statue of Lawrence in the uh, research hall has the same like blind eye mask. Again, the choir basically are aping a lot of Bergenworth's stuff because they were trained by the original Bergenworth people. Oh yeah. But they basically say they're the they're the most um, psychopathic of the Bergenworth because again they're just a bunch of orphans who are basically brainwashed from child to basically view everyone as just a potential research uh a thing for research to use and then throw away like like that's literally the history of the healing church and so is it any surprise that they become the most like literally like heartless <laughs> of any of them like like the, the the original like healing church leader generation like they they got like lawrence definitely lawrence and all of them got what they what they deserved yeah bad people bad people bad people all around <laughs> um and then uh then we get into uh, the the choir now are running things, and this is where we start seeing Mensa show up, right? Because Mensa yes. is now like, hey, what? like they they're like hey, they they seem to understand that, hey, wait a second, the church isn't actually being run by the original leaders; <laughs> it's being run by this by their apprentice. It's like it's like, hey, why can't we ever see the original leaders? Oh uh, no, no, they're doing very important. It's like, no, wait a second, like why why is it only you? Like they never come out, they never like. There's only Amelia here. How do we know that? And like they seem to more or less get it. And we know there's one defector from the choir. Um, what's his name? Like Damien of Mensis. Yeah. He's a formal choir member who seems to have gone to the school of Mensis, and now he's like, I will kill Ebrietus and everything that the choir stands for. Don't I worry. love anyway. I love Damien. I think that they get so much storytelling done with this character. Just like for for one, uh his placement outside of Rom's boss arena. I love yeah. that. Yeah, it's very great, right? Because, like, he's after Rom, he's after Ebrietus, he's also in the Nightmare. You can see he's been tr going after Ebrietus since before the choir brought her out of the ruins, so, like, mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff going there. It's also cool, because I think you can summon Damien, but then you can't get the choir prospector, Gremia, so... Yeah. 
Like, it's like, they're exclusives, too. So, like, yeah, there's a lot done with Damien. I like it. Plus, he, like, he knows all the arcane stuff, so you can kind of know, like, the choir was already, like, going all deep into the arcane, even way back when, and Damien's like, no longer. I can <laughs> see there's, it's a dead end. The problem is that he also picked the other dead end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a, uh, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of, sort of, d- 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 rotten branches on this tree of trying to evolve here. But, um, yeah, yeah. Mikolas and yeah, Mentis... The, 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 yeah, so like Mikolash and Mensis. So Mikolash, like I said, Mikolash doesn't seem to actually be a Bergenworth student. They're just LARPing. Now, here's a cool thing. We find two notes in Willem's study. Um, one seems to belong to Mensis. The other seems to belong to the choir and was given to Yuria as her orders. Yeah. So um, Mensis seems to be, if I recall correctly, this is this is them trying to summon the Red Moon. And this is, again, another contributor to why old Yarnum goes to hell. Because as we know, a lot of this, again, another big factor here is that, well, okay... So, when the, here we go. When the red moon draws near, the boundary for, oh, no, no, no. Boundary for man becomes vague, and then we bear our children. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. Uh, Mad Men. Toil, Sir Tip is I'm trying to find that, uh, trying to find that very specific. Okay, no, this is the choir one. No, I think actually you were right. This will... Let me double check because I need to make sure that I got the right note. Uh, Bergenworth notes. Because I don't want to get this one wrong. <laughs> uh... Okay, yeah, you're right. So the <coughs> so the mens so when you go to there's the two notes right, and then the mensis note reads. Um, when the red moon hangs low, the line between man and beast is blurred, and when the great ones descend, a womb will be blessed with child. When the red moon draws near, this is the Jap- this is a more accurate translation from the Japanese, the boundary for man will blur, okay? And the great higher one will appear, and then it will harbor our baby. So the idea is, this is their plan. They go to Bergenworth, they're studying, like, again, much like the choir, they're trying to study Bergenworth, but they don't have access to the old mentors to teach them like the choir did, so they go straight to the source in Bergenworth, and that's why they put on the student uniforms and all that crap, because they're all about, okay, now we're going to now LARP as them, and because we're now students. Now, Bergenworth's fallen already, as we, as we've talked about like at this point willem completely lost control all his students are crazy about blood transformations and they're turning themselves into goopy goops and spidery abominations and all this crap rom is out of the picture at this point um rom went down to after ebrietis probably again because willem wasn't having success with synthetic great one children so it's like oh well you know maybe i'll go to ebrietis and maybe she can help us get an actual great one child (laughs) the raw x ebrietis the secret pairing we never knew existed anyway um so then uh, Mensis comes in, they're like, okay, we understand now this whole, all this stuff that we can get from the choir. What if we, um, try to do what Lawrence did and bring in, um, Flora, the moon presence, and then she can help us with this. Cause we give her a child, right? Cause that's what Lawrence did. He got a, a umbilical cord. He got Flora to get involved. And then Flora, maybe we can, ha- again, goes back to Mensis' idea that, okay, well, the great ones need to first ascend us. We need to do kind of like Rom. And the problem is that Rom didn't do the proper blood transformation things right. But once the great ones give us the proper knowledge, we will then use that to have the proper blood transformation. So that way we won't become these beasts. That That's the idea. Yeah. Cause, cause that's the that's the that's the issue. So again, it's taking the Lawrence idea, taking the Rom idea, taking the Loran idea. Cause Loran was all about beast blood and thing. And unlike the Choir, who obviously take a lot of their thinking like from Bergenworth from Is, the the Menses latch onto Loran and saying, okay, see, Loran did this thing through beast blood. So it's obviously the blood transformation itself is fundamental. You just need to. And there is some precedence. There's cut content for a cut great one beast called um, Fauna. Um, so there would have been Flora and Is and Fauna and Loran, and there would have been a cool little of parallel, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Uh, so, like, and Fauna, uh, you know, animals, so it works with, um... Uh, Lauren. Works with, uh, beasts in Loran, and then you have, like, Is, and Is, obviously, has, like, the star flowers and stuff like that, so, like, the little, like, flower monsters that, like, Bergenworth brings up. So, like, yeah, there's just, there's tons of stuff that just would have worked with that. <laughs> and, anyway, it, it didn't happen. Maybe Bloodborne too. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. You never know. I, I'm just ready for the executioners to be in charge of the healing church in another town <laughs> next to Yarn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you think they're just gonna be like the following day? <laughs> no, well, well, think about it. If there's a Bloodborne two, who's going to? How are they going to succeed the premise? Well, get a new town that's nearby Yarnum, so that way you can have your return to An Orlando moment. Like you go through like this terrible arcane swamp with all these monstrosities, and then you see this crooked building. You're like, hey, that's weird. Then you walk in, and you're like, oh my god, it says Bergenworth, and this is the the re- the the classroom building from the Nightmare in the first game. See, I and think it- I think the way you do it. You make an armored core game, and then <laughs> and then like halfway through, 
you reveal you're like you're fighting a mech and then the mech sort of it it you like you're attacking it and you break the shell where the uh where the host of the mech is and inside that there's just a great one that's sort of been hooked up to it <laughs> and you do just like this big reveal of oh my god what but the hell is happened armored core prequel <laughs> no no you it's just this isn't actually an armored core game this is bloodborne 2 oh my god <laughs> You're going even deeper than me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sophie and I have talked a lot about this, where you like you begin this just... Maybe you don't call it Armored Core. It's just a mech game. But then you meet, like... Um, you meet, like, uh, mechs deeper on, which have, like, weird sort of biological arms. And if you pay attention, maybe it's an amygdala arm. And then you have, like, a boss fight that is just, like, Bra- the random living... Random mechs are named after Bloodborne characters for some reason. Yeah, like, yeah. That's weird. <laughs> and then you have a boss, which is, uh, which is the... Uh, the 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 one reborn you have that boss because that's the that's the like big enough that it could fight a mech and it's like yeah or like amygdala like you have like a giant amygdala versus yeah. uh versus a mech yeah and it's just like yeah guess what it's the future now it's the future it's bloodborne in the future oh god no I, I i would say it would be like okay who's left well the executioners still have their secret workshop they were never touched at all this so they could just take over the healing church and turn it into their own fanatical cult thing because they take it all really super seriously so you have a super you have a similar but very different premise because now you have the actual fanatics in charge yeah that's and then true. like it and then things go like in a completely different direction it's in a nearby town and all that and then they try to they try to have like this like the- theocratic military state in charge and they're trying to keep things under control with the beasts and all like like you could definitely you, that that that's the best avenue i see for a bloodborne too but anyway <laughs> Onto the actual actual Bloodborne. So Mensis, Mensis's plan. They take all this stuff from Loran and from the from Lawrence and from Rom and all this. And their big plan is okay. So we're going to summon the Red Moon, Flora, and then when Flora, the Pale Blood, comes in, uh, she will uh, she we will give her a child. And that child will then be used as the bargaining chip with which we will get our what we want, which is as Mikolash says, he thinks that Rom Rom's a halfwit and that she did not um, go the full extent that she needed to with the uh, with blood with uh, needing blood transformation things like that. You need the blood transformation to do this properly, um, and so uh, we'll just we just need to enlighten our thinking and we'll go the full mile with the blood. Yeah. Uh, in order to do that, we need the baby. Okay, where are we going to get the baby? Well, we get our hands on Murgo from Queen Yarnum, and there's obviously there's the Queen Killer um, enemy uh, and a lot of stuff, so that you can argue about how that connects with the executioners and things. But the the main point is that they ultimately get their hands on Murgo, and they get the they get a new uh, they get Murgo, and they basically try to do the summoning ritual thing. So uh, Flora comes in, and that seems to obviously create a red moon, which causes things to go haywire and get, agitates beasts and all that, and. Uh, th- but they, they, they don't seem to actually get in contact with Flora in time. Um, it's, this is a, always, this has been a thing that even Japanese community people have been talking about as possibly, um, a typo. Um. Okay. So, like, when we go down to, say, Mur- the line with, um, with, uh, Murgo for the eye chords, it talks about, sort of, this chord granted Mensa's audience with Murgo, but results in the stillbirth in the brains. This has always caused so much confusion for the English community. I was talking, yeah. talking to someone... Yeah, because there, there are people in the Italian community who are asking me questions about this, and it's like, this has caused so much confusion. I was like, oh, okay, I see what the problem is. Because what happens is that it says here, um, th- thus, okay, so the idea is that um, all higher ones lose their babies and so seek them, right? So this is the idea that Mensa's like, okay, so all the all the higher ones want a baby, so much like with the case, we'll just give Flora a baby, and this will allow us to get what we want. This is the idea. Thus, this brought a chance encounter with Murgo. So there's been two ways to interpret this. Some people think this, th- again, like I say, there's some in the Japanese community who think this may be a typo, and it was supposed to refer to Murgo's wet nurse, but the wet nurse doesn't have a name, so me- it just slipped Miyazaki's mind when he was just writing it down. He just left Murgo in there. Okay. And the other idea is that this just brings up, this is just in reference to the fact that um, they had to, they needed Murgo, so they happened to find Murgo in the Chalice dungeons with obviously Queen Yarnum and stuff, and so they they got the, they they took they got her and they took her baby, and then they were able to use her for all the the Mensis ritual stuff thereafter. Either way, the general idea seems to be from what we can see in the environmental storytelling is that when they were summoning Flora, Flora didn't get there first, so to speak, right? Okay. <laughs> um, the the wet nurse did. And the wet nurse comes in, and the wet nurse is another great one from all indications, with like spider phantasm things and all that. And uh, the wet nurse is like, okay, I want the baby, so they give him the baby. And M- Mikolash and company is like, okay, we want um, 
uh, we want eyes we want eyes on the ins- on the, on our brains and wet nurse is like uh okay i can do that <laughs> <laughs> And so we get the nightmare, right? So, like, the idea is that Mikolash is the host of the nightmare. He's the owner or master of the nightmare. The host localization seems to be a carryover from an older idea in the script where he would actually, like, kind of introduce himself as, like, your host, so to speak. Yeah. Like, he's kind of welcoming you, and this sort of just stuck around when the, the, the dialogue with him changed. But the idea seems to be that Mikolash is, again, he's the one who's basically at the center of the nightmare. He's not the root of the nightmare. That's the no. wet nurse and Murgo, right? So, like, the, the, they're the ones with the actual power. Um, and specifically the wet nurse, because the wet nurse seems to be able to make the deal. And the idea is that they want eyes on the they want eyes on their brain. So the wet nurse takes them quite at their word. They want eyes on a brain. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so again, this goes back to the idea. It's not that they resu- It isn't that um, they got an audience with Murko, but resulted in the stillbirth of their brains. It's they had this chance encounter with Murko, and that gave the defective brain tissue to Mensis. So that giant brain tissue. It's called such in another item description in the Japanese version. That thing that that uh causes all the spears and all this and all that that is in fact the brain that they received as part of their deal with handing over murgo so they gave a they gave a great one um they gave the wet nurse murgo and Mur- and the wet nurse is like okay here's your weird like brain tissue i don't know why you want this thing but <laughs> here you go right and here we have our own little brain di- so i'll take care of murgo in my little dream dimension and you can like use it with your little brain thing for whatever research stuff you want right it's and the they, idea behind the two churches. it just it just cobbled this thing together from the messengers yeah it looks like it's it looks yeah again and we see like we obviously see the uh mensis is learning from this right because they try to create because here's the thing they realize oh god we we made a mistake somehow <laughs> this did not work out the way we planned because um I've we can see they mistake. have they, yeah, they have a so like the the idea is that it's a defective brain tissue, right? Because again, you don't deal with great ones. They're like Faye. You don't know what how this deal is going to work out. No. The bra- the tissue is defective. It doesn't really work that well. Um, it's but it's rotten. The eyes are evil, cursing things. But like the me, get credit to Mikolash and company. They tried to make it work. You see them take dogs and put. They take. They try to put dog heads on crow bodies and crow heads on dog bodies. We see them take some of their own and start putting some of that brain tissue on them, and they turn into those singing monstrosities. So. Winter lanterns. Yeah, the winter lanterns. That's the idea. How do you? Uh, so that, how do you? Oh, sorry, I'm readjusting myself and I'm banging my desk. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, uh, how do you how do you then uh, account for the winter lanterns we find in the fishing hamlet if they're made by well they, they, they fell from above. Same That's thing right. With the... That's right. Because the uh, the cause Ar- orphan of cause boss fight is seen from the nightmare frontier. Right. Right. So here's the idea. Koss creates the Hunter's Nightmare, right? So there's the Hunter's Nightmare where all the hunters are. Then there's the fishing hamlet aspect, and then we see those same masts in the nightmare frontier, which is just the remote regions of the um nightmares of mensis which is where the church is atop the mount at the top so you have these uh, winter lanterns which obviously everyone's already pointed out they look like they're just like doll they're like they're doll models that's been stretched out and had the the monster head put on top of it i have no you can't i have no idea what the original concept was for this but it's very clearly they're supposed to just be members of the mensis crew that basically had the monstrosity and once again they're just reusing a model that they repurpose this happens all the time in souls yeah. and it usually explains 90 times weird oddities with some of their mo- their enemy models anyway um, the point is, is that with, um, it, again, they do all these experiments trying to put heads on different things. Like you see a bunch of eyes on pigs, again, swapping out the bird, the crow and dog heads on each other. And they got them in cages and sometimes not in cages anymore. <laughs> they just annoy us even. Imagine taking crows and, heads do- on and spiders. dogs and bloodborne and deciding, let's put, combine them. <laughs> yeah. Spider heads. Oh, well, well, the spider heads, that, yeah, those go with, like, the transformation stuff they're doing, like, um, transforming into great ones with the heads, but that that seems to be more related to Murgo's wet nurse than to the Mensis experiments, but point is, is that Mensis has been doing all these experiments trying to put heads and stuff, and that results, we see when they try to apply that research, they end up with the Winter Lanterns, and the idea is that, um... You have these giant monstrosities with, like, rotten flesh and eyeballs. It doesn't work, obviously. They're still just as rotten. There's no ascension happening there. Um... So then the um, the win- some of the winter lanterns, as we see, um, end up in the nightmare frontier, and some of them have apparently fallen as far as into the fishing hamlet. Um, yeah. And you also see, for example, some of the the stuff that's found in the nightmare frontier. The what is it? The despair, uh, the lead elixir, I think it's called. Yeah. You find some of those in the fishing hamlet as well, and that also seems to come from the um, the nightmare frontier. Obviously, it has a meta reference to the fishing hamlet because there's lots of despair that was there, but it seems to be something that was fell from the hunter's nightmare and that's the justification there okay yeah so you have all this happening so mikolash has a problem well 
they're in the nightmare, and nothing's really working, and obviously they've been in there for a long time, so his body's basically mummified and dead at this point from their, like, weird jank rituals. Um, and things aren't working out on their end, right? Um, on the outside, the choir obviously has a big problem, is there's a red moon. Um, and the red moon causes a lot of the issues with the old Yarnum and all the stuff that's falling apart, and you know, we talked about this already, right? Mm-hmm. Well, how are they going to solve this? Well, as, as we've talked about before, um, they go to Burdenworth, and Willem seems to... Now, okay, well, first I should bring up, they, at the same time, the choir brings up Ebrietis and Rom with her. So Ebrietis is obviously in the Chalice Dungeons and is with Rom, and Ebrietis' whole shtick is, uh, oh, everyone, why are you abandoning me down here? I want to join you up in the stars. Da, da, da. So she's constantly like just looking up, being all mopey and sad, and killing anyone that gets in her way that gets interrupts her being mopey and sad. So, yeah. like that's her that's entire her shtick. Well, she meets Rom, and Rom is like, oh my gosh, another person like me. I have I can have an actual friend. So she's all happy, right? Like the, her and Rom apparently become buds, and then. The, under the Grand Cathedral, they built this kind of pseudo-church. You can actually see, like, remnants of floor and columns, and obviously all the statues have been put up. And um, you can see remnants of an altar behind Rom's corpse back there, at the very back. Yeah, the, has the a altar of despair. Tree, like in the... Well, yeah, the altar of despair. So the altar of despair, there's an actual altar behind Rom's corpse. Um, and you even see a similar tree, like the one behind the altar in the Grand Cathedral. Like, it's, a, it's obviously a smaller tree, because it's newer. But the mm-hmm. idea is like, yeah, they set up basically their own mini church back there. And the idea seems to be they use the Is Chalice that Ebrietis now has, and basically did some blood rituals to basically summon her over here. Like, she basically, they basically like, hey, Ebrietis, we have your cup. And Ebrietis is like, ooh. And she <laughs> comes, climbs all the way up to here. And Rom comes with her, obviously, because obviously she's now buds and they're following each other, right? So then, those two are up there now. Now, when the whole thing with Mensis happens, there now is, like, this cooperation happening between Rom, the choir, and Willem. And the idea basically is, okay, when Mensis did the ritual, they took Willem's school with him. So, like, the reason we don't see the school in Bergenworth is because it got, like, teleported into the dream dimensions. Like, when we now see it drifting in the nightmare, it is literally, it's because the actual schoolhouse got like, translocated into the nightmare dimension that was being created as part of the Mensis ritual. Okay. When they did their deal with the wet nurse, right? So, this is the idea, and in its place, Rom creates the lake, which serves as this sort of, um, entrance to her dream dimension that she's created. So she transfers her consciousness to this dream world, so her body is left there to rot and die. Um, and she's now operating from this new dream dimension where she seems to affect the cosmos in a way that she creates a, a actual barrier that keeps the Mensis, ri- any more Mensis rituals from connecting. So it basically blocks all the great ones from having mm. the same direct sight with, um, with, uh, the, the real world, right? And she seems to more or less act as a buffer zone. So yeah, it's, it's important to note here that the entrance, you literally jump into the reflection of the moon. And it's like that it is in a body of water is also significant because body, bodies of water act as like bulwarks against uh, what, what's the yeah, terminology? They, they, yeah, the Japanese is a divide. So like the idea yeah. is that there is a divide. So like, again, this goes back to the idea of the co- the cosmic ocean, as I ca- to call it, in the idea is that the cosmos is divided by uh, by a layer of water that like encapsulates the, the, the world, right? Like the idea is that up above, there's this layer of water which divides the... Um, the cosmos from our world, and that's where we get rain and all this stuff, right? Yeah, and that would assumably be how uh, how Rom is able to hold back the uh, the do- the dropping down of the red moon. Yeah, she creates this lake where the old schoolhouse used to be, and she basically um, again maybe it's because there's resi- residual arcane power from like the use of the ritual there to translocate it. Whatever the exact reasons for them doing here on a meta level, it's because the plan was to have the schoolhouse there, but then they changed the schoolhouse to connect to the nightmare instead of the uh, to Bergenworth. Okay. So instead they turned it and then they put the lake there and then they, the classic Miyazaki, he creates an in-universe exploration which reflects the meta development. <laughs> so <laughs> like, yeah. So it's, it's very, you see same thing with Smo, same thing with so many things in, in, in from soft history. But the idea seems to be that, okay, so, uh, the ROM is now going into this, this dream dimension is going to now create this divide that's going to basically block out like, uh, signals from the great one. So that way, Flora doesn't know, isn't able to exactly communicate directly in the same respects, and um, uh, uh, Odin also gets gets kind of uh, gets kind of messed with because of this, because now all the pe- all he all the servants of his in his chapel that he was communicating with no are get cut off from communication, and this causes them all to go crazy because they're like, oh no, we're gone, where is he? Oh, we can't hear him anymore. 
So like all that all doesn't work out. So like this is again another reason why Odin benefits probably the most from um the choir uh getting uh the the Rom getting killed. So yeah. Uh when uh when so all of this is being done in order to counteract Mensis. And this is where Yuria gets uh stationed and her idea and she's left with the message um and the English sort of puts it in Let me find this. Is it the one that goes uh, the Bergen yeah, yeah, with spider? I have, yeah, I have it. No. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, the Bergen with spider, but the spider oh. hides all. So okay, so um, so like Yuria gets a message from from seemingly from her hi- from her fellows in the choir, and it says uh, the spider hides all manner uh, rituals certain to reveal nothing for true enlightenment need not be shared. The Japanese is more accurately um, the spider hides all the ceremonies do not reveal them. None need comprehend the enlightening truth. So basically, the idea is that they're saying, listen. Whatever you do, don't interrupt Rom from doing her thing. Let her just do whatever she's doing. No one needs to see the enlightening truth of the Red Moon like we have already. So, like, yeah. let's just don't. So, basically, she's just saying, Yuria, do your guard duty and nothing more. Um, and as we see, she does it. Yeah. <laughs> like, Yur- Yuri's that, that guy with the meme with the pizza. Like, he just kind of oh. comes in after, like, he comes back. Like, I always said, like, an alternate, like, universe where Yuria comes back from her guard duty. Like, at the choir, hey, guys, I did my job. And, like, everything's on fire and everything. Like, they're all, like, praying with, like, the celestial emissaries coming down. Like, Ebrietta's is still, like, all mopey over Rom's corpse. And he's, she's just like, oh, what happened? <laughs> see, this is one of but those anyway. this is one of those places in the game where I think From kind of messed up design-wise because... You you have this story which cannot conclude unless you basically genocide the entire town. Whereas, yes. you, like, ideally, Rom wouldn't have even been a boss fight. That's just like, Rom exists there, and you drop down, and Rom just looks at you kind of scared, and you just need to hit Rom once, and Rom dies, and Rom won't fight back. But, so, like, there's no way to fail once you've instigated the fight, but have it set up that way that if you leave Bergenworth, Damien will kill her for you. So that the plot still happens, but you don't need to take the initiative to kill her. Well, that would have been a good idea, and unfortunately, I don't think Damien as a character existed until the DLC. No, right? he, he's like, added with the started. DLC. Yeah, yeah. So, like, yeah. Unfortunately, that's something where, like, retrospect. It's like, you could have probably had more options there if yeah. they thought about summoning and stuff before. But, um... Yeah, that, that, there could have been a lot more probably done there. Uh, it seems like in the final game, the idea is that Rom is so focused on doing her, like, barrier-creating job that, like, she's upkeeping the barriers so she doesn't pay attention to us until we attack her. Because we're like, hey, hey, listen to me, you giant spider freak <laughs> thing. What are you... What? And, like, obviously, like, at that point, like, the gloves are off. It's like, oh, no, I'm being attacked. I have to defend myself. And then, obviously, things just <laughs> things just deteriorate from there. And granted, Willem seems to be totally okay with this. He's like, okay, listen, I've been sitting here on this this, uh, oh, this uh, balcony. Uh, okay with it. He seems to be completely out of his mind by the time we meet him. <laughs> well, yes, but his, his thing seems to be, hey, go over there, in there. Like, um, it seems to be the idea is that Willem seems to understand that at this point, like, everything's, like, shot. Like, he's been sitting here going crazy and, like, losing control of his, like, body functions. Like, he can't even, like, <laughs> like, that's all he can do with his mouth now. And yeah. so it seems like his idea is that, uh, uh, l- like, you know what, everything shot may as well, like, just end this. Like, why are we, why are we doing this pointless charade anymore? Like, obviously he's lost everything at this point. <laughs> And nothing has gone right for him, and his attempt to try. And obviously, the choir has done nothing. Like they've just they've allowed like Mensis to be. They they they've sort of stopped Mensis, quote unquote, from continuing their rituals. So now Mensis is kind of like, well, nothing's working out. So we have to kind of figure out what's going wrong here. But like they haven't done it. They haven't actually solved the problem or anything. So Willem's just kind of left out to dry again. Which again, <laughs> Willem could like join Caners in the club of just being abandoned by the healing church. <laughs> It's just like just don't, don't just don't deal with don't deal with anything related to Lawrence. It just doesn't work out. He's a bad um, guy. Anyway, he's a bad guy. He had bad people associated with him, and they trained bad students who murder them. Um, but anyway, so the idea with uh, with uh, Mensis now is like obviously the Forbidden Woods becomes forbidden. They basically try to prevent. Obviously, the choir still infiltrates like the village in the Forbidden Woods through the the Yosefka's clinic, the back door they have there, and they're still doing dealings and experiments and stuff there. But like, it's ostensibly forbidden from anyone else from going through. Obviously, mm-hmm. no one knows the no one alive knows the uh, the adage except for probably Amelia. And obviously, she's just doing whatever the choir wants her to do. And the choir are basically still doing their rituals. I mean, so they're doing their experiments and stuff, trying to because their thing is like, okay, we don't have to worry about communicating with the great ones until like we're actually like up there yet. So we'll like we'll do this like on our own at some point, and then 
Uh, in the meantime, the, the Mensis is basically like, okay, we gotta try to do more rituals, try to do more experiments, and they figure, like, Men- uh, Mikolash and company seem to have more or less, well, okay, not necessarily Mikolash, but Mensis school seems to more or less figure out that, okay, things are not working with the Great One we made our dealings with, um, what if we, like, create our own Great One, and that's where we get, like, the One Reborn, like, it's like an art, it's, it's their failed attempt at an artificial amygdala. Yeah. And, like, stuff like that is, like, the type of things that they were experimenting and working towards. And in the meantime, like, we see them, they create, like, experimental, like, beasts. Like, they strip them of skin and, like, cre- like all this, like, crazy, like, stuff. Like, they've just, like, they're, they've experimented on children. They've, like, tons of ritual sacrifices and things. Like, like, they've just, like obviously, they're just doing, like, the kidnapping and human experimentation angle at this point. Mm. They're basically the and healing then, church. But, like, whatever little moral sort of constraints held back the healing church is gone. This is just, like, peak desperation mode whatever yeah, like choir yeah choir menses are just doing their own thing like choir's big like choir's big focus is just keeping things together until they get what they want and then they like they don't care what happens to the rest of the town like they, they're just guinea pigs to do what they will but like they need to keep the town together because you know it's their it's their it's their research subjects they need to keep yeah. things running at least until that point menses menses don't care. like again menses is the same it's sort of the same spiel but they don't really care about what happens to yarnum because again they're just like using all this stuff now because as once they get their artificial god that they can talk to and it can do the thing do the job for them they're fine yeah. So like all all of this is like this this like you say complete desperation on diff on on different fronts. And then when we enter the scene, we're obviously just sort of um we're just sort of unknown to the happenings. We're just sort of caught in the middle of this conflict. Um. The the choir starts. Um. It seems like the choir gets to the point where they 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 start experimenting on themselves. Um. Where they basically decide, okay, we're going to turn ourselves. They turn themselves into the star children, right? So the celestial children or whatever they're called in English. And then the idea is that. Um, hopeful. They they start obviously they they repeat the research hall experiments. They start creating like these like uh, bloat head type enemies and start planting them in the ground again. And hey, they have some success after the red moon appears and like a celestial emissary shows up, right? So like, I yeah. mean, something works out. <laughs> um, they have uh, they obviously have spies like um ex- uh, you talk about Damien. I really like Edgar. I like Edgar a lot for what he contributes in terms of um the storytelling because he shows that there was a spy going as far back as when Mikolash was first like creating this dimension and they're like getting people in here and stuff like that so edgar is like supposed to be like stationed out there and you can this is why we get the choir bell and a chest in the rafters near the entrance and stuff so like like obviously that can only like give away that he's part of the choir right now so he's sort of just um he's keeping that hidden store but it's near the entrance so like if any of his buddies come flying in, he go oh grabs the bell and comes down he's like hey guys i'll help out i got my little healing bell with me yeah so like a lot of cool stuff happens there, but uh, but ultimately Mikolash goes crazy. We see from all the bodies left over that he revives during the boss fight. Like that's that, that's what happens with all the people that were with him in this dimension. So, um, we see like uh some blood. We see like the Yosefka blood vial thing, but it's not really a Yosefka blood vial. It's supposed to be a Mergo blood vial at that point. Um, oh. near the yeah. Yeah, that's the idea. It's like, you're supposed to get, like, this, oh, it's this, like, super special blood. It's like, okay, usually you get this from Yosefka. But at this point in the game, in the context where we find it, it's clearly supposed to be a Murgo's blood that they've extracted. And, then, like, again, they're still trying to do experiments and stuff with it. As far as the wet nurse will let them. Um, All right. But obviously, Mik- Mikolash goes crazy. And obviously, he's, like, as you pointed out, he's a mummy in the corpse. So once he's dead, uh, there's there's no hope for him. Like, there's no way he's, like, just going to go back to his body or... Nah. Um, even, even if he could, like, return to his body, there's no way he will, right? I've talked about this before. I would have wanted for when you've killed him in the nightmare, I would have loved that if you go back to the Advent Plaza, his corpse has, like, maybe crawled down the stairs and is just lying dead there. So, like, he snapped back, oh, cool. came back into his corpse body and was alive for maybe a minute before he came to, uh, to the ravages oh, of age. Oh, that'd be cool. Yeah. That'd be cool. But like, yeah, well, the, unfortunately, it's one of those things where you don't have an incentive to go back because then the game basically ends, right? Like you're just brought back to the dream hunter's dream. And that's true. That's true. So, again, it's, it's, one, it's one of those things where FromSoft has to consider, like, what are the, like, we could do all these little small things, but how many how many times are players actually going to be going back and seeing that type of stuff? Yeah. Like you may go back and see Gilbert that one time during the Red Moon or something, right? Because you maybe have a quest line or something that involves you coming back there. But how many times are you going to be able to go back to the uh, Dia Hargul once you beat Immensus? So it's like. No, it is what it is. Anyway, the... I'm trying to think what other... Is there anything we're missing? Uh, well, I'd like to elaborate a bit on the wet nurse and, um... And, uh, the idea of, um... A sort of re- resolution of the plot. The idea of silencing the nightmare newborn. Oh, okay. But, um... So then... About Menses in the choir, I think... 
I th- I th- yeah. So I think that that story sort of resolves itself when the uh, when we kill Rom, the Red Moon hangs low. That basically puts a stop to everything in the choir. They're all gone at this point. Um, transformed yeah, well, into the beasts. Choir, the choir were already experiment. We see the corpse with the a call beyond in the rafters. Like you can see the item thing and everything. Yeah. Um, in the rafters of the Grand Cathedral when you're fighting Amelia. So the choir was already experimenting on themselves and, like, basically offing themselves at that point. Like, they were already, like, going, okay, we're, we gotta do transformation now. It seems because they understood, because obviously the mobs are at the gate. Like, we see they've taken over the church workshop, and they're, like, literally oh, practically banging at the doors to the choir's area. Um, you have, uh, what's it called? The, uh, obviously Yarnum's been going to hell, obviously we see for a while now with the Beast Hunt Knights and things, and obviously the the villagers have had enough. So it seems like the choir seems to have understood that they were running out of time and was now or never, right? Yeah. And they were, but that basically, but again, their problem with their philosophy is this basically leaves them waiting on hand and foot, hoping that the gods will notice them, right? And that's the idea. They may have had some success, because as we see with the Celestial Emissary, like, that's some response from a fan, that's some response from a phantasm of a great one, um, entering the, one of their experiments and turning into, like, this super, and, like, we can see he does, like, this prayer buff thing. Mm-hmm. So, like, it's clear that they, they've had some success on this, but obviously we kill it before anything happens, so. Yeah. Okay, maybe another thing Bloodborne 2 could do. They could do, like, a Gwendolyn thing where you never kill this optional boss. Nah. Like, something interesting happens because of it. See, I think, uh, I think Bloodborne really sort of shot itself in the foot, sequel-wise, by getting rid of all of its main cast. Like, you have the well, doll... That's it. You have the doll and the executioners, like I said. That's, that's... Yeah, well, I'm talking about so, like specific characters. Because well, because yeah, in terms of specific they yeah. they in terms of like specific people they're all dead, yeah. Yeah, they they, they could they could have somehow kept Lawrence. They they could have figured out a way. Uh, I I'm a big fan of the idea that rather than him having been a boss in the DLC, that you kind of meet him just like Braidor, except he doesn't fight you. He's just like this defeated and just distraught and crazy old man who's just like super crestfallen, and you just have a choice of, well, do you leave him to his fate to wallow in the nightmare, or are you just going to put an end to him? Mm-hmm. Um, but they wanted to uh, they wanted to do a bu- big boss fight. I like that boss fight, but um, I think that's... Well- yeah. Well, there, 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 there's definitely something that you have, like, probably one of the biggest villains in the game, and he's an, uh, he's an, uh, like, he's a, like, obviously he's a strong optional, look, like, he's kind of, it's, it's one of these things where you, like, you have this big central character, yeah. and he's just this optional boss fight, which is technically a reskin of another boss fight. He's an optional boss fight twice. And he's like, yeah, he, he, yeah, twice. He's, he is the main character of the game, like, of the, of this grand story, he's like the guy who kicks everything off everything sort of rests on this guy being crazy and doing the things he does and he his comeuppance is just like a little footnote that maybe happens if you uh want to 100 percent the game yeah but it, um, it's 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 definitely it's an interesting way to do the narrative thing same thing like but willem at least i think it works more thematically with willem because like Willem's entire like the worst thing you can do from Willem is basically rob him of everything he's ever had and just leave him an empty shell. Yeah. So there's something I think there's something very poetic in sort of the understatedness of what you happen. We have this big rain figure and like he's literally just nothing. Yeah. Lawrence is definitely a bit weirder though because L- L- Lawrence is sort of a character that feels like like I said we don't really know too much about his backstory or who he is before he was a student of Bergenworth except for the fact that he clearly has less scruples than Willem when it comes like he's like master I I I I, 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 get, I get what you're saying about the fear of the blood thing but I think we can still use it. <laughs> <laughs> Look um, I, and, I hear you like, I yeah, hear you I'm gonna try it anyway. <laughs> I'm gonna try it anyway. It's like li- Hey, he's like, hey, I promise, I didn't forget the adage. I didn't ever, I ever did he ever heed it, but you know, I didn't forget it. <laughs> <laughs> he's just, it's just like weaponized incompetence. He's like, what? But, but I don't know how to, how to meditate, and you do it much better than me. I'll just use the blood. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, the, uh, everything in the healing church is weaponized incompetence. They just, don't, they don't know what the hell they're doing. Yeah, they're, they're completely out of their depth. <laughs> Hey, but okay, so you, you you want to talk about the newborn? Yes, uh, Mirko. Exactly, like uh, because when we fight Queen Yarnum, all of that power that she has, that's all Mirko. Um, yeah, that seems pretty clear from the way like the, the boss fight behaves with like the cries and some of the attacks. And yeah, like other it's clear that Willem's ba- like uh, Yarnum without Mirko is basically powerless. Otherwise, she could have just gone in with the wet nurse and mopped the floor with it easily. Yes. 
Yeah, the- yeah, like theoretically, if she had all the power she shows in the boss fight, then there would no be- need to thank us for anything. She would have already done it all herself. Yeah. So, like, it's Miracle. She's the one that clearly needs, like, she's the one who needs us to kill Rom and needs us to uh, kill the wet nurse and, like, put her baby to rest or whatever. Mirko is interesting to me in the same way that Ariana's kid is interesting to me, in that it seems like we have an actual infant great one. Yes. Yeah, with Yarnum, it seems like that was a successful, or at least the closest thing we can get to a success for an infinite great one. Wet Nurse is obviously all over having that baby and caring for it. <laughs> Do you... And then you have, yeah. Um, then you have uh, Ariana's ki- kid. Where Ariana, obviously, Ariana doesn't didn't want this. This was, no. this was not what the prostitute signed up for. <laughs> this is what that uh... was not the STD she had in mind. <laughs> <laughs> Ew, that's what Urton wanted, and um, it is amazing to me that we got that in the game where you can just. Because, like, it doesn't look like a child, but when you kill it and you get the umbilical cord, like, it is a kid. We are killing a kid in a little, in a video game. It is amazing. Well, it's like, hey, that... well, it's, like, it's, like it's like when, it's like when we literally see Ocelot get squashed between our eyes, but don't worry, he's invisible, so you... Yeah. <laughs> does, it, does it matter that you see the giant, every time that o- o- Oceros does his little stomp animation, does it matter that you see an arcane magic... A fire effect every time he stomps that specific arm <laughs> on that thing that totally wasn't crushed right there <laughs> and you still hear the baby don't worry you still hear the baby crying up until <laughs> the pained cries of a child up until like the boss fight ends like, sen- like don't worry it's still alive we promise you. censorship is so weird to me but um just quickly well, i think to be fair like they keep in mind like the, the the dirty the filthy woman in demon souls it was the same idea right like like oh i have this child he's right here next to me like i promise you he's right here and i'm talking about him and he's totally here and we're having so much fun it's like we totally didn't have to cut the model because we didn't want to cre- have deal with the implications of you being able to kill this kid <laughs> <laughs> he's just totally here and i'm very like it, it's, it's so weird with her too for the same reason it's like it's just this thing where they have to fi- they always have to find every time Miyazaki wants to kill a child he has to find creative ways in order to get do, doing it <laughs> but he he but he'll find Kuro. them he'll find them <laughs> well i'm amazed with what he was able to accomplish with kuro i'm like what with kuro yeah in the uh in Sekiro. yeah yeah same thing. I'm, like, I'm like i'm just like wow like wow yes I, I i was thinking like kuro was gonna have to turn into like some giant monster thing or something like <laughs> this, but no <laughs> But um, for I, but, I think so, so. You know, he's just sleeping, Acer. They never say it explicitly. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Kuro, Sekiro two. Do you have? The same well, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to dig up a comment I got a couple of hours ago. I'm gonna have to see if that's your alt account because if somebody said the same <laughs> thing where it's like, well, it's not explicitly stated that he's dead. What 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 do you <laughs> think the ending means then? Listen, but they have plausible deniability in court. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Ariana's kid, I think that's an easier one to solve than Mirko, because Mirko sort of bounces off into a broader topic. That's well, just a successful Mirko, kid. The problem with Mirko is that Mirko is like basically the idea is that Mirko, you are the, the game gets around you stuff, showing you stuffing it out by basically just having you listen to the audio of you stuffing it out, which you could argue is a byproduct of like the the wet nurse like gulping him down or whatever. Yeah, like when she comes in, like you hear the gulping sound with her, and that's that's the reason why like the, you don't see the baby or anything in the the fight or whatever is because like the idea is that okay, yeah, wet nurse takes in and absorbs the power, and and Lance McDonald's gone over this in better detail in earlier versions of the cutscenes. It's a lot more explicit. Oh. Oh, yeah. And he just kept on cutting it down and down. Like, this is a thing you have to see with all FromSoft games. It's basically, Miyazaki looks at something and he's like, hmm, can I make this more subtle? <laughs> okay, no, more subtle. No, more subtle. And so every time he tries to do something more explicit, he's like, eh, it just doesn't really work. I'll give the guy credit. He tries to really make it where stuff, as best as he can usually, he tries to make things where it makes sense in the setting for you to be told or shown something like this. And he doesn't, he, he's one of the person where he understands most people won't understand um, what he's trying to show, what he's trying to convey to you. But he still doesn't like going in the other direction where it's like, well, you know, you know, he's crying and he's whining. So he's super sad. Yeah. It's like he, he, he wants to try to show you in other ways that are um, more creative. It's like when uh, in the uh, in the sure ending of Sekiro where Owl walks in with Genichiro's decapitated head and he plops it down and it's all animated, but you never see Genichiro's head. Like, the idea, like, the, like, obviously there's always censorship concerns, but there's always this idea of how can I be, um, it, it plays into Miyazaki's toolkit of wanting to be more subtle about things. It's also, so like with Ocelot, it's also good know. marketing, because Lance McDonald will get you a hundred thousand different views of him just moving the camera slightly to show you. 
Or like him showing you like earlier cut cutscenes yeah. that you left in the game files or something. Or like say for me, I've shown obviously Quailax cut dialogue and how like the Japanese version of that one makes it very explicit about a lot of lore concerning Isleth, which is it's all there by implication. Yeah. But like it's stuff you it's again it's stuff that you kind of have to again you have to understand by knowing the scenario and doing some logic tests. Whereas if you look at the cut dialogue, it just flat out tells <laughs> you all this stuff. It's like oh that's an easy shortcut. But uh, f- for Murgo, um. First of all, I just, again, a brief aside, I really, I, I don't think Bloodborne really, uh, really capitalizes on the insanely creepy premise that you've, like, you have this cult that is reaching out to gods, and they manage to communicate with a god, and they finally summon it, but something else comes through. I think that's such a yeah. creepy premise. Well, like, again, this goes back to my point. It's like, you don't, it's this idea of, like, you're dealing with higher forces you don't understand. You don't know what you're talking to on the other end. Yeah. Again, this is sort of the idea when, like, oh, I'm society, getting like, goosebumps. Don't do, like, don't deal, <laughs> yeah, like, don't deal with a Ouija board or whatever. Like, you, it's like, it's like when you're, like, you're old, you get your old, like, gra- like, your old grandmother's like, oh, you don't know what to do. Don't on the other, like, it's the same concept, right? Like, you don't know what cosmic forces beyond our understanding of that other world are at the other end so just because you're like oh you know it's, it's cute or it's fun or you know we're just going to talk to god and he's going to give us a thing it's like listen you, you got to be careful here you don't know what you're messing with yeah it, it doesn't help like they, it they, doesn't they sort of, it's very understandable. it doesn't help that it's nighttime right now and we had that mystery shadow in the uh in the coffee break earlier <laughs> so what yeah, basically oh, happened like... is i i have the curtains closed so there's no outside light coming in and I'm talking to Logi, and all of a sudden, like, a shadow whooshes across the room, and we've decided that it was a fly that flew next to the light bulb, but I keep, like, if, if, you've, if, you, if you've heard me being, like, weirdly quiet after the, after the uh, around two-hour mark or so, that's because I keep looking over my shoulder to see through my hallway if there's some murderer waiting to kill me, and now we're talking about evil demon gods. <laughs> Just, don't don't worry, sir. You'll be safe. You don't have any vermin on you, do you? I mean, your avatar says otherwise, but <laughs> well, not my YouTube avatar, just my Discord one. <laughs> okay, so so okay, but that means so you have vermin on the inside. Oh, but um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we have the wet nurse, which is just we don't know anything about it other than it is a great one, which is just it's. It's not malicious so much as it is just it does not care about humanity. It is just doing whatever it can to get to Mergo. Well, it's a little, it's, it's a little malicious. It does give them a defective brain. Like, it's like, okay, I'll give you exactly what you asked for. Yeah, sh- sure, sure. But I mean malicious. It's not even going to work right. I, 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 I suppose malicious is, um, I, I mean more so well, in the sense it's, it's of. Not like an, it's not like an actively ma- malevolent force. No, right? it's. Like, it's not tr- It's. It's basically like again. The idea seems to be that they're basically they're the, the they they are they're very amoral, right? Yeah. They're humans who've now reached like cosmic proportions. So now like their their concept and precepts of human morality is now so beyond it. Like they're so beyond humanity, right? Yeah. So this idea of like okay, we're going to deal with you, and we can make deals, and we can reason, we can understand what you try to want, and all this stuff. But like we don't communicate the same language per se anymore, right? Yeah. And we we have the power where we have all the control where you know like yeah sure we'll give you this you want brain on the inside sure i'll give you literally what you want and it's gonna be sort of the genie's bargain where it's like it's not even gonna necessarily work right it's like i gave you what you wanted you didn't say it had to be pristine yeah but but that that's another interesting point though is it seems like the great ones are bound to like when they sign a contract they are equally forced to uh operate through like they they don't you can loophole it and give them like a literal thing that they want but you do have to deliver. You can't just promise it, take the kid, and then well, bail. Well, they want the baby. Well, they want the baby. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So but they, I, I mean, you, like... You need some, yeah. The, yeah, like, it seems to be the idea is that they, 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 they have certain things that... Like, they can't just freely create themselves a child, right? They need to have some interaction and relations with the humans on the other side yeah. in order to make it work. Yeah. So that seems to be where it comes into the whole idea of okay, we are going to be as generous as we want. Now you could be like Ludwig Star, and he's it's just like okay, I'm gonna just like kind of like pull a little prank, and I because I don't care what happens to you, I get nothing in return for this, right? Like so, I'm just gonna answer you. Most other great ones are like I don't want to deal with you. I'm sending a meteor and tell you to shut up, huh. and then. You get like, and then you get like those like, um, like Flora and like the wet nurse and stuff who are just like, I just want a kid. <laughs> like, yeah. I just want to, I just want a kid. Give me a kid. I'll give you that thing. And it's like, okay, I will give you what I want. Like I, I kept my word. You give me what I want. And like, they don't. And again, I think the thing, the reason why you don't see any more like them, like them, like 
like screwing over those that they uh that they uh that they make deals with is because they don't care at that point. Yeah. Like, it doesn't matter to them. So I think there's a there's definitely a case there's definitely a case to be made that the the great ones only honor their deals so far as their deals give them what they want. Anything beyond that is just not their concern anymore. Yeah, and plus, we, plus the idea is perhaps they maybe they can get more out of the deal in the future. Li- yeah, right. like with uh, like, like, Hunter Stream. Yeah, yeah, with Hunter like like the entire premise for like German is that German has basically been stuck there, aging endlessly. Just <laughs> like he's like okay, like Lawrence, you got to come back here with some results, or else I am literally just going to die. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's such a creepy thing too of like, yep, I'm just going to be stuck here for decades with nobody to keep me company except for this doll and maybe the this horrible moon presence monster just comes and visits me every now and then. Maybe. Well, the, uh, that's sort of what happens with um, the hunters, right? Because Ludwig, because like with Ludwig coming in as the first church hunter, the church workshop basically like sets up next to Ludwig's little workshop on the top of the valley, right? Like, yeah. I, I don't know if it's exactly the top, but like, you know, it's near the top, right? Like it's over old Yarnum, right? Yeah, yeah. And then the church workshop comes in and then we start seeing the cathedral and then the new Yarnum and all that gets over. And all that sort of overshadows German's old little workshop that used to just sort of sit on the hill above the rest of Yarnum and he would used to go down and like, you know, do his beast hunting. Like he, he's basically, he was basically an exterminator right he was the local exterminator of the town and he just happened to specialize in exterminating beasts instead of bugs yeah so they just call it's like oh hey german we've got this weird beast thing we've locked him up in the house could you help us do something before it breaks out so, oh sure coming down and like huh. you know he does the hunt or whatever right like that seems to be like the, that was german's like daily life he gets old so he now he's like i don't want to die like i'm getting old i'm not able to do the same things i want to do like i want to keep living and you know doing things and maybe you know maybe he and he and considering his obsession with beast hunting he may still want to keep continuing to help people of yarnum with a longer lifespan and more power right yeah and then like but now he's, he's found himself in this terrible situation where he's just stuck, like you say. He can't do anything really about it because he's basically stuck there in the advisor role. The moon presence is going to let him leave and hunt anymore. So he can't even do what he, he his, like his life's goal is. I just, re- so, I, I just realized, Logi, he's... Assuming he doesn't die of age, he should be alive, right? After we kill him, we just sever him from the dream like he would have done to us. And then he should wake up under the morning sun like we would have right um possibly we don't know exactly how this works in the detail it could be we can we can use him uh, in the sequel uh, we can use him in the sequel <laughs> put me oh, back into the God. dream put me back into the dream like german's like this this ancient like monstrosity like hooked up to the thing and they're keeping him alive with like bolt like archibald's like old bolt research or some crap like that like a frankenstein monstrosity <laughs> <laughs> well maybe he takes over the church with the executioners well, it's, well, it's uh, again. That's again. It's possible that they actually just find his body and they find him like half alive, this old, like decrepit corpse. And again, they just hook him up and they just keep him alive. Like again, there's possibilities there. But anyway, we don't know exactly how it works with the the dream dimension with the hunter's dream because it seems like at least when he looks at his dialogue and stuff, like he seems to feel like he gets rest because suicide doesn't work. Maria tried that. German uh, German knows that that's not going to work. You can't mm. just like suicide yourself out of these hell dimension things. Like you're you when you're bound here, you're bound here <laughs> until the great one says you can leave and that's never. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um it's it's possible that Flora still again, Flora, like when we kill him, we do sever him from the dream, but only so far as now he's part of the cosmic record. And Flora could theoretically just like drudge him up and bring him back into the dream simulation she has here. But it seems like she'd rather just use us because, you know, we're there. And like, you know, a little bit of a revenge for getting rid of her first guy. And she's like, okay, you're my new leverage. Yeah. So this seems to be the, 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 the there's definitely a lot of ways to look at this. But my, my thing with like Lawrence is that, I mean, sorry, with German is that the only thing he has is he's waiting for Lawrence and he, his only company has been, like you said, the doll, but also, like, the hunters who come through. And he's had to kill every single one of these for one reason or another. Yeah. Like, all of them have not wanted to be part of the dream anymore, or, could, or couldn't be because they became, like, going crazy, right? So, like, there's just all, there's the, all these issues that German has had to um, sort through on a personal level. Just between, like, he's been deprived of his life's work, he's had to kill basically everyone that he's ever possibly had a bond with, um... In order to basically leave himself alone, and he still feels selfless enough to be like, "Listen, <laughs> Flora's coming. <laughs> I'm gonna just like lay down your life. Let me kill you, and you can be free of this, and I will be suffering the hell." So there's there's something very interestingly noble about our resident crazy genocidal maniac. Yeah, well, he, out of all of the villains of the game, and like all the bad people, he seems to be like the most redeemable because it it does genuinely seem like with him and Maria. 
Maria just tries to keep you out of like like just get out. Don't don't involve yourself further with like you don't need to know the secret. And German is yeah, like with the, with the cut with the cut content you're talking about here. So just to clarify for people. No, no, no. I mean like when she when, when she stops you so that you don't have to uh so that you don't see the fishing hamlet. It doesn't see Oh, like, oh, you mean like after she's after after like when you like you, the cor- corpse should be left well alone. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, it's yeah. like Well, it's the yeah, yeah, it's an extension of that cut dialogue. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, she right. she's not she's not evil to you. Right. She like, like, she did bad things, but she's not stopping you because she's evil. Yeah, yeah. Her personal hell is to basically be trapped in her hunter as being like the guardian for the the hunters for the the seedbed of the hunter's nightmare, the yeah. fishing hamlet. Like her entire role is Koss has her be the guard duty of this terrible thing that she obviously she obviously never wishes happened and now she's the one that guards the secret. At the same time, this is also keeping her from being with the patients who she cared for in life. So like yeah. it's sort of like she's she's literally caught between a rock and a hard place of the two terrible things she doesn't wanna be uh be a part of, she's now part of. Yeah. And for German so, like, it's yeah. um uh, you know, he did a lot of awful things, but at the end he's just he's like dude, you can be free. You can just move on with your life. I'll stick around. Yeah, yeah. Right. So there, there's there's something interesting about that. Um, there's also the fact that you get the choice on whether or not to free him of the grip of the hunter's nightmare. Because there's obviously it's yeah. it's heavily implied at least that part of German's restlessness, where he has all these nightmares and stuff, and you hear him talking in his sleep and things like that. Like sometimes he's like, "Oh, Lawrence, I see you. Like, well, you why were you taking so long?" And sometimes, uh. Uh, like, I've, I've turned old and useless, and then sometimes he's like, oh, Burgerworth, someone help me, I can't be here anymore, oh! Like, it's, see, because it's weird, because it's like, if he's in a dream, where is he going when he dreams? Oh. So, like, that, that's an interesting question to ask yourself, and one thing that I've seen the fan base come up with is the idea that he is the orphan of cost. Obviously, people have compared to yeah. the, the cries of the bait, he obviously uses some of German's cry lines, which could in itself not mean much, but also the faces are very similar, strikingly similar. They both have, uh, like, a cape, dealy... Uh, and it's like yeah, there's the, I, I keep bringing that up, which like it sounds. There's also so, there's also cut there's also cut content of an umbilical cord, which makes sense if you realize the orphan isn't actually a true great one child. It's just Ger, it's German as the surrogate orphan of cost thing, and sort of like been mixed with the baby. Thing. Do we have an item description for it? Yeah, there there's a there's an item model, if I recall correctly, oh, of an umbilical that cord one. for the DLC. And they, that got cut, and that could be because the idea was, well, that wouldn't make sense because it's not a real Great One baby. Mm. It's German mixed with the actual Great One baby, right? So yeah, but like, th- like sort of like they took mm. like like the cape. I keep bringing up like, oh, they both have a similar sort of capey cape dealy, and like that sounds so insignificant, but it's like it's torn. Like it's such a no other cape in the game looks like this, especially made of flesh, right? Yeah, well. <laughs> But anyway, yeah, makes the point. There's also the there's also just the fact that the way the the like it's very it's very clear like looking at the way that it's obviously the orphan of cost never grew up that big. Obviously, no. the idea and it's like why are you having this giant child baby which has this obviously the shadow form which obviously it's sort of the actual seed bed of like the representation of the child. Then if that's the case, what's the boss that we're fighting then? If that um if that like shadow form of the orphan of cost is the actual like that's her actual quote unquote ba- missing baby that she she wants to have there then what's the actual like the non-shadow version that we're fighting and it makes sense that that is when german's like asleep and stuff he is acting as the he's going through another personal hell as the orphan of cost where it's like okay you took my baby so you will now be the replacement for that baby you will live in my my dead corpse wound for all eternity i will say though um german does not obtain rest until you release the shadow baby Exactly. Well, yeah, because that's the seed bed. Because again, this goes back to my point of every all of this will re- all of them will revive, and this will all repeat until the nightmare is destroyed. Yeah. So you could so theoretically you could just leave Ludwig, Maria, German, all of these people to suffer again and over and over, like all the other hunters. But then again, there's a question of isn't that kind of screwing yourself over? Because you're you, you're now in this, and there's no getting out of yeah. it. Yeah. It's also it's also such a fun way of like you can do all the bosses, but you don't have to you don't have to give these people rest if you don't want to. Yeah, exactly. Like it's like, do you really want? Do you really want the likes of Ludwig, Lawrence, German? Like maybe Maria. Maybe Maria. You feel bad, but even she. Like you, you have to acknowledge that even after giving up the hunting part, she's still complicit in the healing church atrocities in the research hall experiments. Yeah. Like it doesn't matter how much she wants to be a mother Maria. Like oh, I'm here to comfort you and love you. She's still being complicit in inhumane experiments. Yeah. 
So like, there's there's definitely a lot of blame to go around and say, do you want any of these? Do any of these people really deserve the rest? And that's a wonderful moral choice to leave to the player. Yeah. So I think I think that's great that like you have two big choices in the game. On on both of them have to revolve around sort of German's morality and how much you um how much you want to respect uh um him as a character and a man. Yeah. Unlike Lawrence, 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 he's just a mini boss. You get to fight that one time. He, he's just irredeemable trash. <laughs> yeah, well, twice, but yeah, but twice. Well, listen, he—you have to kill him twice, make him double the suffering. <laughs> <laughs> All right then. I uh, I suppose it's just time for like I I threw out like a questionnaire for people. Like, is there anything you want to bring up with uh want want me to bring up with Loki? And we've talked about most of it, so I'm okay. just gonna scroll through some questions here. Uh. Uh, 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 changes to the moon presence name. We talked about that. Tsuki no Mamono. Um, mm-hmm. Is there... Uh, 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 oh, is there anything... Uh, any issues with gas coin clothing description? I want to know if there's any issues having to do with foreign uh, lands in Japanese. I found it interesting uh, that he said Umbasa along with another NPC in the beta. Uh... Uh, so it looks like okay. So this goes into okay. So let's start with the first thing with gas going. Yeah. The only thing that off the top of my head that I'm let me double check. Okay, I don't have gas coins items in my notes here for for this. So all right. Um, yeah. The only thing that's really worth noting is this idea of the holy shawl. Um, there's this talk of holy shawl in the localization very consistently. The Japanese only refers to a holy cloth, and that's because it's not referring to the entire shawl. It seems to be referring to specifically that one rectangular cloth that hangs off the back that you see with the executioners, the ho- the holy blade uni- which is also the holy blade uniform, which you also see in the um, the tomb prospector set, which you also see, of course, with the choir set, and like you see with all the church uniforms. It's this consistent idea of what marks you as a church hunter is this singular cloth with this specific design, and this as as you get lower in the ranks in the church, the design gets shorter and smaller. And then what happens mm. with Gascoigne is he takes that hanging cloth and he turns it into a scarf. Oh. Oh, that's so interesting. that's what happens when he's talking about... Yeah, so that's the idea. When they're talking about, oh, it's his whole... Like, they take the holy shawl and they use it as a scarf or whatever. The idea is that it's not talking about the whole, like, cloak and garb and mantle and all that stuff. Like, it's not talking about all that. It's just talking about the holy cloth, which seems to be that singular rectangular... Um, like cloth wrapping thing they just let hang off the back yeah yeah so that that's the only thing it's worth talking about with Gascoigne and obviously the idea of him wrapping using as a scarf is sort of to signify how he's no longer really affiliated with the church he's kind of just doing his own thing at this point yeah because obviously he's like he's been like you know he's all about like beast in the world. <laughs> as for uh <sighs> like all that as for him saying Umbasa, there is nothing to that line which has any significance on the final game Bloodborne was a Demon Souls, not like it wasn't Demon Souls two, but it was like, it was a, it was in the world of Demon Souls centuries later. Well, I, I, see, see, I di- I disagree with that actually. It, I don't think that was ever a thing. I, well, again, I think this is a- we. There are doc. There are like folders in the uh, in the in the in the. Uh, so so the thing is, uh, it, it it existed as that. At least to Japan Studios. I don't know if From has that because there are f- there are some folders they had which list the game as Demon Souls Two, but I don't. We don't know if that means that that was the pitch or whether that was just like the way they conceptualized it as like oh, well, oh I, this I, is. I, a- I think it was just the I think it was just the code name because they were returning back to an old publisher and they were and yeah. it was like okay you're the guys who gave us Demon Souls so just give us another Demon Souls like okay, yeah we'll yeah on this, that, that's I, what I, I mean think, that I, it was I just it was, it's it's I, another I, Demon when, Souls. Yeah, when Miyazaki, well, I think when Miyazaki says this was never going to be Demon Souls two, I believe I take him at his word. Yeah, yeah, me too. Me too. I, I, don't, I don't think it was ever. I don't think it was ever planned to be a Demon Souls. I think what happens when you see stuff like, oh, uh, this character says Umbasa or something like that. I think the idea was much like so many other From Software games. I think they were going to more heavily reference Demon Souls because again, it's them returning to an old publisher which they did Demon Souls with after doing Dark Souls and they got super popular. And they're like, oh, hey, we would like you to come back and do stuff for us. And they're like, okay. Miyazaki's like, okay, well, I want to do like more references to Demon Souls because you know I'm cheeky, like that. That <laughs> I'm a cheeky boy. <laughs> well, yeah, but, and that just ends up getting cut over time. Like I know there's some people who are like, well, no, it's actually secret it was planned, and there's like all this stuff. I was like, uh, a lot of this stuff is like really flat and circumstantial, and we have to just understand from software is incredibly self-referential. Ev- like we were talking about earlier in this podcast, every game you can find so many connections and ways you can connect things to it. But like when you get down to it, in like when you get into the nitty gritty, these are ultimately very different games with different cosmologies, different worlds, and and uh, ideas they're trying to explore with them and stuff like that. And it's just like trying to trying to like 
connect them this way, it, it, it just doesn't work. Yeah, well, I, I'm willing to go as far with the theory as to say that it was a, it like, it was a game that took place in that universe, but it was never Demon Souls 2. Because we have no, I, 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 I don't think it was. I don't think it was even taking place in the universe. Personally, I, I, I think on like I think when you get to like stuff like Umbasa and stuff, that's just them again using carryover. Sure, things. They, they, they've carried over lines in past games too. But again, I, I'm willing to agree to disagree. So. Yeah, 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 sure. I, I'm just going off like we have the we have that fight on the uh, on the beach with what is it called like the Great Beast or something like that. Which uh... okay, so there was a there was a there is a cut item which uses a beach, which is um. People have tried to compare that to the beach in Demon uh, Souls. Demon Souls at the end there, but like, like it's it uh, again M- goes back to so, from software is very self-referential. Yeah. Like maybe they were referencing that beach, maybe like loosely because there's ruins and it's a beach, but like or or maybe the, the, maybe yeah. it was just a beach. Yeah. yeah. Again, I, like 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 you say, it could just be a beach, but like again, it's one of these things where it's like. Like, because if, if you actually look at the area, like the back half, it, what it seems like it's part of the underground ruins, but they're above ground, because again, they're constantly building up, right? Yeah. So the idea seems to be it's a part of the ruins that was in a mountain, and it just so happens that, because you can see, like, parts of the ruins sticking out on the mountain behind you, besides just the entrance you leave out of, and, like, there's a bunch of these surrounding ruins, so it looks like there was an exterior, like, building thing, and that collapsed, and so there's just, like, the remnants of it, and now there's just this, like, I guess the water line rose, and the beach is now, like, coming in and stuff like that, so, like... It just seems like a bun- It just seems like this was an idea they had that they they cut, and people just know the similarities because there's ruins and a beach. Yeah, and I'm like, and then they uh again maybe it was a maybe it was again it could be that it was planned to be there was a reference idea because again there's from software is very self referential but does that mean it's in this it's the same beaches in Demon Souls? I'm like, uh, 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 like and then they repurpose the beach idea for like oh the orphan of cost fight, yeah. Well, well, yeah, well, well, yeah. Again, like same thing. But they, like you say, they repurposed it for that fight because that was an idea they didn't get to go with in the original game. And here's the thing. Again, if you want to say it's the same thing from Demon Souls, why is there a giant mountain in the way now? Like, yeah, you you have to come out of a giant underground tomb complex in the mountains. Like, are you telling me that after all this history with Thumerians and stuff, that beach is still there above ground after all these layers of hit? Like, it's just there's so much <laughs> there's so many hoops you have to go through that even if that was the idea, it's very obvious why they cut it if it ever was because it, it wouldn't have worked yeah. either way. So like I'm, again, I just, I just I just don't think it I just don't think it holds water. No, I, I I absolutely agree that it is there is no I don't see Bloodborne as a sequel to Demon Souls as it currently stands. I think maybe it was like at some point it may have been like a sort of kind of took place in the world, but I don't think there is any significance to the theory. Um, I, I, again, and uh, for, to clarify my position, I think at most it was just the the the, develop, the publisher wanted a new they wanted a new Demon Souls like game yeah. because Dark Souls was so popular and they they obviously now are now getting from software back for this title so they wanted something that was kind of like Demon Souls and let, let's be honest Bloodborne is basically it, it's the, at at its core it's just another Souls game so. Yeah. It has a bunch of its own unique flares and stuff to it, obviously, compared to, like, say, Sekiro. Sekiro, Sekiro I don't even consider a Souls game. It's, like, its own thing, basically. Like, the only thing it has in common with Souls is they both have checkpoints. It's, like, <laughs> they have more differences than similarities at that point. Um, but, like, again, so my, my point is that, like, you look at Bloodborne, I think they were like, okay, we want something kind of, like, whatever you did with Demon Souls and Dark Souls that made you so popular right now, do that again. And they're like, okay, the, and it doesn't have to be your Demon Souls too, but they were probably referring to that internally because they didn't have idea what they were going to call, like, what else are you going to call this project? Uh, they were also calling it, I think, later on Project Beast or something, yeah. right? So, again, I think I think the idea was just that they knew it was going to supposed to be their kind of spiritual successor to Demon Souls in the same way that Dark Souls was with their, their publisher right now, and they had to figure it out. And that's my position on there, so, again... Yeah. People can people can argue whichever they think is more likely. I also uh, there's another name. It used to be Colt, uh, but I uh, I can't tell you that because uh, it's it was given to me through breached NDA. I'll tell you after we record. Okay. Um, well, we better cut this section out before f- fans start asking. Okay. No, I want them to uh, ask. Leave comments oh. and feed the algorithm. I'm never gonna tell you though. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really okay. it's a really boring name, but uh, yeah. Um, another question here is. Um, uh, is there more to the Chalice Dungeons? We kind of talked about this already. Uh, I wouldn't mind a look at the translation errors versus localization attempts. Um, I feel like we kind of went into this already. Uh, same with the next question, which is like, uh, what happens when you... Like, themes which are lost in localization? Um, well, what happens a lot with localization, because this, this is the two-pronged problem with the localization. 
the one hand is when they get stuff just flat out wrong. Like, it's just like, there's just no rectifying this. Then there's the stuff like, say, like, one of the reasons I say Dark Souls 3 is localization, I go, meh, is because I can argue with them. Like, there's, there's a few things that are, like, serious, like, major, like, crazy, like, I can't believe you got this wrong errors. But there's stuff where it's like, it's not too many, like, it's a handful at most. And the rest is just like, okay, like, I cannot see what you were going with, but I think that's just extremely misleading, right? Like, the word, like, like localization loves flowery language yeah. from, um, when it comes to the FromSoft games. Like, you see so much flowery language and dramatic tones, and when you read it, say, in the original, it tends to be very, like, straightforward, simple, and honestly pretty mundane. And the localization is trying to pretty it up or dramatize it or so, in some yeah. fashion. The, uh... Like, they'll come up with these, like, you, especially, like, when you say, like, oh, or, or um, some say Yarna might be next or something like that. Like, they try to come up with creative stuff. And again, I'm not intrinsically opposed to that. I think localization should be free to say or whatever they do so. My issue is that when you try to write all this poetry, that you don't incor- think to incorporate accuracy along with it. And that can cause huge problems, especially in these types of games. My, my issue, this was something you raised, uh, my, you, you brought to my attention, is the... Um... Is that uh, is Solaire's line that well the flow of time is stagnant versus the flow of time is convoluted, because right, him right. saying the flow of time is stagnant like he's one of the first NPCs you meet it's very early on in the game and like him saying that there like yes it it just this clarifies exactly the sort of thematic issue that is occurring in the game and it reinforces it really well. But when he says... Well, yeah, like, there's videos coming up now which are just discovering this theme now. Like, they're like, oh, it's it's hinted in, like, El- Dark Souls or whatever. Yeah. But, you know, it's very obvious in Elden Ring. It's like, no, 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 it's always been obvious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like, but, but... It's been it's been understated, maybe. Like, Elden Ring is definitely where it's most out and out about it. But it's always been present and stated and clarified. Like, it's always been, like, a major thematic point. In these Absolutely. Games. But then, like, because because of this localization change, uh, you... this This sort of gets missed and then in dark souls 3 they like okay you didn't get it the first time how much clearer can we make this right right like the dark souls 3 is all about stagnation yeah this is stagnating this is that is stagnating like the entire game is like hey how long are we going to have to keep this stagnating for like that's sort of the <laughs> point right it's like <laughs> dark souls 3 is just a requiem for dark souls it's just like let it die already <laughs> yeah um <laughs> Um, but, um, but yeah, but that's the exact point. It also creates this huge problem is that everyone frames the, the time is convoluted issue is that worse is that it's created in, it's created this in the collective consciousness of the English community, this idea that, um, Dark Souls is just this series that, you know, it's supposed to be opaque and not to be understood. And it's this hopelessly overly complex yeah. lore that, um, you'll never be able to understand. And, you know, let's just like throw out whatever theories we have. It doesn't matter if they make sense or they're contradictory or whatever. Like, you know, it's just whatever. Well, it's like, no, like there's, there, Miyazaki has a very put a lot of thought into these all these game, the games and he's really thought through what he's trying to convey here what he wants to do not, not always done perfectly mind you like I said there's always possibilities for typos in the original script always possibility that things just don't work mechanically or because of budget constraints or something or what have you but like there's always a lot of thought into doing these stories and telling a, a hit and telling a, a story which is very cohesive and pretty much simple i think sophie put it right it's like when you get down to it bloodborne is a very simple straightforward game with very simple straightforward themes it just can be very hard in order to, you have to do a lot of digging in order to figure that out and the localization just doesn't help on that front yeah but uh, i i like the flowery language i think the vows and thens oh, and yeah. the, i i love that stuff well, I, again, that, that's always going to go down to personal preference. I'm sure there's some people who don't like... Uh, like, I'm a, I, like one of my problems with, say, with Dark Souls and using some of its um, old English language is it makes some characters who actually speak in archaic dialects. And I was obviously like, Gwendolyn ah. supposed to speak in it. Like, Gwendolyn's supposed to speak in this very refined, archaic, godlike dialect to make him sound bigger than he... Because, like, even his illusion of Guinevere doesn't speak like this because he's trying to make himself more godly... Um, and give this idea of legitimacy for obviously lore reasons in that game. But the idea is that um, that doesn't come through as much when everyone is basically speaking with an old English tongue or something like that. Yeah. So, um, so like that, that gets stuff like that gets muted, but like generally speaking, I don't have pro- like, like say, um, let's go back to Solaire when he's saying stuff like, uh, uh, like, uh, if only I could be so grossly incandescent or something like that. And if I remember right, the Japanese line is something means something to the effect of like, um, like, he, like if I could just like have this own like like warm light or warm heat or something to that effect, mm-hmm. um, and it, or like bright, b- like brilliant warmth or something like that. Like the the grossly incandescent perfectly conveys all of those in- that stuff without using those w- same words, and that's perfectly fine. It's a it's a it's a line that I will always remember from the English from the English actor for. Yeah. And it's it just it's a real and I think that's a good line. So like stuff like that are great. Stuff like say a lot of patches of dialogue. Like there's tons of there's tons of things where the localization does good with their flower flowery language. Like I say, the issue is not the poetry; it's the accuracy that goes into it. Yeah. 
All right. Um, so, what, what? Any other questions? Uh, a couple of more. Um, translation issues on cut content. Is there anything significant you want to bring up there? Oh well, one thing with the doll is something worth it noting because it seems like some. It seems like in the Bloodborne localization, there was a lot of cases where if there wasn't a if the, if the if the localization didn't deem the change in the script to be big enough, they didn't change it themselves. Okay. Um. Because there's, like, for example, there's this line from the doll, which it talks about, I think, is something like nostalgia or something to that effect. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, when you, isn't it when you kill Maria or when you give her the... No, no, okay, no, 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 it's when you give her the haircut. Okay. And she says, like, wait, what is this? I can't remember. It's not a thing, only I feel a yearning, something I've never felt before. What's happening to me? Um, like, something like that. Uh, it's, she does actually say a yearn, and people always kind of interpret this, oh, she's, like, feeling some, um, she's feeling some connection to Maria or something like yeah. that, right? Or, like, it's a Pinocchio um, thing where she's feeling, uh, sort of a human feeling, right? Well, well, the, actually, because the idea is that in a cut dialogue, it was referring to nostalgia, and this is where, because the, the idea of, like, a yearning, a nostalgia, sort of this, it's, it's bringing memories back sort of idea, right? And that's what the localization line is supposed to be implying. But if you look at the Japanese for the final game, not the cut line with the old voice actor they use. Mm -hmm. I think that was Annalise's VA or something like that. Um, it, whatever it, it was. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, I think so. Something no, like no, that. no. The, the, the Aveta used to voice, uh, Aveta used to voice Annalise, and I think it was False Josefka who voiced the doll. Okay, okay, okay. Anyway, but the idea was like her old VA had um, this line that was basically the same, except it referenced n um, nostalgia very directly. And this seems to have carried over into the localization line fr from that old version, and that never got changed. But the Japanese script did change, and that changed it to, I, she doesn't feel a yearning, she feels kindness. So the idea is supposed to be, you, get, you are the first person ever to give her a gift. Mm. And that is something that moves her so much, she actually, a doll, cries tears. Hmm. Like, that's the idea. She's so emotionally moved by your act of kindness. Because, again, she's going on about, you know, do you, you know, do you love me? I love you because I've been made to love you. Isn't that what God, like, gods do? They make their creations, like, isn't that what the creator does? He makes his, crea uh, his uh, creations love him that way. Like, isn't that just by design? So I love you, but do you love me? I don't know if you, right? So, like, you, you give her, like, she has these sort of, feet, like, she's sort of this thing where she just sort of has a role and she plays that role, right? And she'll happily play that role because, you know, she loves you. She that, that, That's just how she is. That's how she was probably made, yeah. right? Um, but when you actually give her that hairpin, and it's, it's obviously something that used to belong to Maria, but it no longer has a, it no longer has a meaning like it did in the cut script of it connecting the doll to Maria. It now has this meaning of you're giving something that fits her. It suits her. It would suit her hair. And by showing that you had so, you put so much thought into your gift to her and that you are in fact giving her a gift with so much meaning, she is moved by that personally. And that kindness gives you. And that's why when like she prays at the end, she's like, oh, you know, I also, like she'll, some, if you do this to her, she'll have an added prayer where like, I also hope like the hunter will be happy or whatever and maybe remember me or something like that. Like, yeah. So there's, so that, that's like stuff like that seems to change. Again, I talked about the thing with like the host of the nightmare with Mikolash. That seems to be a carryover from old cut scripts where he, he seemed to introduce himself more as kind of like he was your host to the, to this occasion or whatever. So yeah. same idea. You talked like three hours ago. Old, uh, yeah, yeah. We talked three hours ago about like the players starting in Hemwick and you said you may, you may go back there uh, in an earlier draft of the script. You, you would meet Mikolash and he'd like talk to you throughout the game and then you would meet him again in Hemwick. He'd jump into the water and you jump into, and that would be the entrance to the Nightmare of Menses or the Nightmare Frontier. Well, well, here's well, here's here's something that's actually worth noting is um, Mikolash is actually the name for Willem in the initial draft. But yeah, so like Willem's internal name is Mikolash's husk. So huh. originally Willem really? was Mikolash, and Lawrence was going to be your in the Alpha draft, like <laughs> way 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 back when. Lawrence was going to be your best friend yeah. that you met, I guess, on your journey to Yarnum, and like when you took the blood or whatever, you get knocked out for like two weeks or something. And basically, Lawrence, like after like a few days or something, decides to go out and tries to find stuff to help cure you from your coma. And or whatever. when you wake up, you come out and, and you're and just looking for him. Yeah, you're basically looking for him, and everything's about like chasing after him and stuff like that. And like, um, uh, I'm trying to remember exactly. There was going to be like this, uh, this like Bishop Herbert or I Norbert. I can't remember if it's like. He's Nor Norbert in Eng in English, but in Japanese he's Herbert, if I remember right. I have to double check. Why change it? Uh, <laughs> Why did they I change know. that? <laughs> anyway, I have to double check. But um, well, basically the idea was that um, yeah, you were like gonna go to him, but he became the cleric beast and like different like they they, they were clearly like they had a very like simple idea earlier on. And it's obvious that they were like okay, 
like any like early draft of the script that obviously got completely changed <laughs> as time went on. Like as always, revision. There's no good such thing as good writing, only good rewriting. So. <laughs> you know, now that you bring it up, Willem and Mikolas, like their VAs, they do sound kind of similar. I have no idea if they're the same. Though, I, I, so they're I they're not the same. I'm pretty sure they're not the same. But they they do sound so similar, like their voices. We are born of the blood, made men by the blood. Undone by the blood. Ah, cos. Or some say cosm. Do you hear our prayers? Mm. Who knows? Yeah, but, um... The, uh, the, yeah, but that was definitely the idea that Mikola... I, I think that's also why you don't see any reference to Willem in earlier cut item, in some of the earlier cut item descriptions, too. Mm. But, like, like there's a lot of stuff that got moved around. Like, if I remember right, Ebrietis was the original Koss, if I remember yeah, right. Yeah, it's internal name Ebrietis is Koss. was Flora. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, which is interesting. Again, go, there's also, of course, like, great, this is interesting because, the, like, there's going to be a Flora, but there's going to be a great base uh, fauna. There's also a reference to a, fl- a destructive flame great one, um, which ends up in Elden Ring in unexpected ways with, uh, <laughs> with the giants in there. So, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I was very surprised. I was like, oh, they brought this back. <laughs> no one's going to pick up the reference except, like, it's always this thing. Like, there's so many things in, in, in FromSoft games where it's like, unless you're, like, a dev or you're, like, really in the know for, like, dev of, like, the internal workings with these developers, like, there's no way you're going to pick up half of these references. Like, they, it's very clear they do a lot of this stuff for themselves. Are you talking about the, uh, the giant with the eye? Oh well, yes, those giants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. Ones. Well, yeah, also, have, like, the, the flame of destruction. also those giants in uh, with the stomachs on with the stomachs. They're from blood. They're from demon souls, <laughs> right? Well, it's like the the yeti thing from uh, uh, Northern Limit that they were going to yeah. have there. Yeah, similar. I don't know if those were going to be giants, but like for sure, like it's definitely the same idea of having like a giant enemy with um with a uh, 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 a mouth first. I thought of you when I first saw those enemies. I was like, ah. Ah, I'm gonna talk to Loki about this. <laughs> well, well, oh boy, we're gonna have, we're gonna have a long Elden Ring podcast. I feel at some point. Oh boy, well, this is a four hour conversation. So, oof, <laughs> oof, Elden Ring is gonna be quite the quite the chat. Yeah, maybe, maybe it won't be about localization. We could just talk about the game. Anyway, um, I I, so, I hope uh, that answered your question, th- Jesus. The commenter's name was Jesus who asked this. Oh wow, I, I'm so glad to be, I'm so glad that that Jesus decided to stop by and ask me a question. And that commenter. That was Jesus Christ, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> All right, so next. Uh, uh, oh, uh, Pale Blood is a big one for me. So we talked about how Pale Blood is the moon presence. The term Pale Blood. Do you have anything on this though? It it it's, it's, it says what's on the tin. Pale Blood. All right then. It's blood which is pale. So. <laughs> Oh, uh, it's a pale blue color. So, like, there's nothing really I can say. Miyazaki's commented a bit on this, this idea of, like, he's talked about different inter- ways you can interpret the line and stuff. Like, for example, when you talk about the message in the the hunter, in, like, the message in the middle of Yahar Ghul, where it's like, look, a pale blood sky, or something like that. You can read that several ways. Oh, it's the sky of the pale blood. It's a pale blood sky. It's the, it's a pale blood sky in that it's a sky where it's it looks like it's pale blood, because the blood's been all drenched into the the red of the moon, and now the rest of the sky is like this, this like, pale blue color. Yeah, it's, There's tons it's of like, ways like a corpse, it. kind of. Yeah, 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 like a, cor- yeah, like a corpse's color. Um, there's nothing really in the the name. Like again, most of the translation things come with the moon presence itself being a moon monster slash demon. So yeah, all right then. Uh, maybe do you think it's possible that the original Japanese was like pear blood? No, that's not how Japanese works. So no. Damn it! You it, it's not it's not written. It's written with it's written with regular um with regular script. It's not using katakana in order to spell pale blood phonetically. So uh, okay. No. Yeah, that's just not gonna work. Again, you can always make the argument, I guess, that maybe Miyazaki had the translation already in mind or something. Like, it's always possible he gave that as a key term. Like, you have to translate this way. But it's like, again, like, that's that's where we're getting knee-deep into speculation yeah. territory. It's much simpler to just work with the, the Japanese script and then, like, sort of work from there. I think this is one of those translation things which, like, the term pale blood, it's so nebulous that I feel like people want the reveal of what it means to be, like, this big revelation that changes everything in the game. Even, and not just the, that random boss you meet at the end. Yeah, well, I, I, the thing is, though, even if there is some meaning to it, 
I don't think it's going to significantly change how you look at anything. I think it's just going to be like, oh, pale blood. Because pale blood is like an old English terminology used to talk about, uh, like, when, uh, when, you know, people are scared of the moon or something. Like, just, I'm making that yeah. up. Just like, it's going to be something boring like that. Which you, yeah, which, and you're going to read it and you're going to be like, oh, oh, yeah, like it's happening in the game. Oh, yeah, huh. Uh-huh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, again, I feel I feel like it was all supposed to just be a lead-up in order so you wouldn't know exactly that it was going to be a Cthulhu monster you have to kill at the end. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, like, that, 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 like, like, that seems to be the, the big shtick. Okay. Um, another question is uh, the difference in the naming of the Bloodletting Beast. You talked about that. Uh, yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, some people have asked me about, like, if Bloodlet, like, if, the, if it's possible, like, the localization may have, if they chose Bloodletting for any specific reason. Um, I'll be honest, I think it's just them wanting to be creative, especially considering it's a Victorian setting, and obviously bloodletting is a, a very popular during this era and stuff like that. I, um, I, I really like the name. I, I think, though, that it creates a lot a lot more ambiguity than there should be. Yeah, yeah. well, this again, this is where the flowery language can shoot yourself in the foot, because it, it's now creating lots... It's trying to be very clever and creative and, like, fancy with a bunch of things that it doesn't really need to, and this causes... Like, yeah. Again, it's just it's just the master slash owner of the, be- of the beast blood and things... Of the, of the beast blood here, and it's, like, it's very... Yeah, again, it's supposed to be very. It's supposed to be this very clear, straightforward reveal of oh, so this is where all the beast, the whole, because the idea is that that the beast blood is the whole is what's being given out from the skull and the church, and that's the quote unquote holy body, the Eucharist, the 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 stuff that's being used for communion, quote unquote. So all right, uh, why are there so many factions or groups called the executioners? We talk again. We, yeah, we, we went. Yeah, over yeah. There. Um, oh, I guess one thing we didn't clarify, there's also the Executioner Gauntlet in the chest in Kanehurst. Yes. That is, again, this is another, this is, this is, again, referring to an actual Executioner. He is part of a family line of Executioners um, that stained their hands with blood so much over the generations that all those resentful spirits um, in the blood are, like, triggered whenever blood splatter, like, whenever, like, uh... Like blood uh, is sort of like invoked with a catalyst through the the mercury bullets and like the and stuff like that. So like again, that's the same again same idea. It's it's an executioner has no connection to the executioners, the execution unit, the covenant that Lucarius found. Yeah, we have three executioners. They're all very different. Yeah, yeah, they're three different things. The re- and th- again, this is again, this is a lot on the localization. They decided to just call the execution unit the executioners. I don't have any problems with that in and of itself. It just can be very confusing. It's obviously different from the executioner being talked about in the gauntlet, and it has nothing to do with the executioner enemies. Those that was an internal name that the developers in Japan were throwing around for themselves, um, because obviously the design is very similar. And then it got carried over to the. Um, it got carried over into the English side for their official name. When in the Japanese, they they're officially called the Dismantlers or the Dissectors, however you want to train. And again, this ties into how they're helping in Hemwick because they're helping in like the core where like all the bodies are getting dissected by the witches and stuff like that. So they're like they're like on the church again, part of this church thing. And then you also see them in um, Forbidden Woods because obviously um, choirs doing some research there. So they put them on the outskirts uh, around the, outside the village so they can do like they can clean up the beast they're creating in the forest so it doesn't become a problem for them later down the line obviously villagers still throw the choir out <laughs> yeah but but anyway so, but same idea so like it's again it's this idea these they're just these agents and as we can see in the hunter's nightmare they seem to come they go back even they go way back to like the research hall days and stuff like that where they're like creating these like arcane abom- and this is why we see them like wrapped up in the armor and like doing the, the stuff as we see them because like we see what happens when they're kind of quote unquote free yeah all right uh I wrote down, uh, this isn't really a real topic, I wrote down Kegare just to remind myself to talk about it, and I did. So, gold star to me. Uh, and f- Yeah, so oh, that, that's something to, to clarify for people, though. Like, um, blood dregs in Japanese, when I talk about, like, their at least is trying to feed on corruption, those are what blood dregs are. Yeah. They're blood corruption, Kegare. And then, um, uh, that's the same thing as the, it's called the corruption rune in English, yeah. right? For the yeah yeah it's the same thing and uh, it's impurity for the leak which is like it's it's the same thing it's like vermin it's well, the, it's it's the same thing okay yeah but th- see the thing is the impurity rune if I recall right is the stagnation rune. yeah yeah so like yeah uh, finally so, like, um, the this is one I wanted to ask you about uh, amygdalas what what is this what are they do you know they seem to be lesser great ones as in. Oh. So great. So one thing that we need to know is that in the Japanese version, when it talks about great ones, I think they they're called like various beings. Um, 
in the uh, in the English version. Let me double check. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Fragments of the lot. Oh, so when we're looking at like uh, Great One Wisdom, fragments of the lost wisdom of the Great Ones, beings that might be described as gods. So they're just called beings. In the Japanese, they're described as all kinds of beings. Yeah. So it's not the idea that there's this singular entity. So this is a, this is actually very important to kind of clarify. There isn't a singular entity to way to define a Great One. It's just a general catch-all term for these beings, which are somehow above us. They're not human. So they're referred to as great ones. And there's these enemies, which we call kin, because they're related to great ones, but they're kind of borderline. We don't, they're not really, they're not as strong as great ones, but they're not as weak as us. So like, they're kind of in this nebulous idea. So this idea, it's a very nebulous term that's referring to, it's a, it's a catch-all term for this very broad idea. It's just these beings, which are above us. And they can take the form of like spider-like beings, a fish-like beings, all these different Cthulhu tentacle monster-like beings, like all these different various stuff. See, I had this, uh, I had this fun theory because Abriadis, uh, you have Abriadis and you have Ram, both great ones, and they seem to manifest smaller versions of themselves in those little slug children for Abriadis and the little spiders around Ram. Well, the thing is, Rom spiders seem to be former. They seem to be similar to the wet nurses thing with like patches and stuff. Is that um, yeah? You have uh, humans, uh, Bergenworth students, who decided they were going to become phantasms for Rom One Earth because they had Madman's knowledge and stuff like this. So it's very clear that they're supposed to be like crazy yeah. humans who turned into phantasm stuff, right? So um, oh, and so also like, uh, sorry, also Koss and the crawlers you find in the Nightmare Frontier. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, it's it's unclear if those are supposed to be like related directly to Cross, or they're like less like they're att- they're other like it's very clear that Cross came from Lorraine mm-hmm. again going back to like the connection with Mensis and all this stuff and just the timeline of things it just seems makes most sense especially considering she wants to spend all her time in water and she probably lived her entire life in a desert so it makes yeah. sense but uh I I, but I wondered if uh the amygdalas are that for something else that we don't see and, I, and my thinking was oh is that Urton because you can't see Urton ever and you have to have a really high insight threshold to see the amygdalas so maybe if you could get to like 10,000 insight, you'd be able to see Earth and there's like this giant sort of amygdala thing hanging over the world. And that was like... Well, this is interesting because we know the amygdalas go back at least as far as uh, Loran. Yeah. Because, um, and we don't know, in Odin sort of vague and like I, 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 I've even theorized that Odin might be the sun in the same way that Flora is the moon. Oh. Um, it's like, yeah, well, yeah, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get into that. But um, <laughs> the, the idea... <laughs> The, so like that that's like a working theory i've worked on because it, it's just interesting this idea of this the great one who seems to be he seems to be so grand so above it all so evolved so to speak that he literally is nothing <laughs> like he has no form so to speak he's blood itself yeah so like he's sort of like he's like the closest you can get to like perfection which also I- interestingly makes him so um especially vulnerable to all the yeah. weaknesses the other great ones <laughs> have like rom so like so, but but like, hey, he's the one who most easily is able to get a child when he gets the right uh, person under his purview. So like, yep. So like, okay. But anyway, but the 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 idea with like Odin and the amygdalas, amygdalas are interesting because they're, they're obviously very mass produced. There's something we've obviously we, we see them in relation to Yarnum, like the old like it seems like a lot of the the ones buried in the um, the graveyard for uh, Yarnum's graveyard outside. Those seem to be some of those elder gods because we see lots of statues of them along with mm-hmm. statues of celestial children. So it seems to be the idea of you either became a star, you either became a star child, so you liked the choir, you were something, you were a kin that was pretty close to becoming a god, or you became an amygdala. It seems like oh, that's also um, possible. And the idea seems, yeah. So it seems to be this idea that amygdala seem to be a fairly common type of great one. And I've, I've seen one theory in the Japanese community, which was which seems to be gaining a lot of traction, is the idea that the amygdalas are. Um, sort of like this mediator um, entity, like they're this mediator cast of great ones, and their idea is to mediate between our world and the other world. So like they're physically there, so they aren't subject to the same limitations as obviously raw, like Rom. So like they, it's not like they're being held back or whatever. They can go to the physical world and interact with it to some extent, because um, they're 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 that quote unquote close to it still. Um, but they are, um, but they're they're still they're still like turn invisible because of Rom's like. Um, interference and stuff until the until like obviously the red moon is able to appear because Ram is dead and all that, and then there's also the idea that um, because there's this um, because they are just sort of mediators that's why they sort of snatch you up and they're like okay like do you have something that I can throw you into this okay you, you belong in this dimension you belong in that dimension etc like like they're just sort of like the care the the courier so to speak yeah 
Yeah, that also makes sense. Did you you know yeah, it's they are they have the same terminology that Alant had in Demon Souls, where they're like failed to be, right? Yes, internally they're referred to as um, a failed to be like wicked or evil god. Yeah. And then um, uh, at, at the very least, if I let me let me pull this up because I because I remember right, they're referred to as wicked gods, and the one reborn is the one that's referred to as the with the. Failed yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the half baked like devil. devil. <laughs> oh, yeah, that, 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 that's another translation, huh? <laughs> oh, boy. Okay, so, like, okay, yeah, so, what we have here is rebo- the, the the one reborn is the failed-to-be-wicked god, and then um, when you're looking at the... Yeah, and then... Isn't it the... Um... Yeah, and then the, just... And then, yeah, this idea of an... E- like, this idea of an evil god with um the amygdalas is they are this lost paradise apostle, evil god, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So again, it's this idea, kind of this fallen angel. Um, it's evoking like fallen angel from Paradise Lost, and um, yeah, it seems to be just this idea that they're like this kind of servant cast among the great ones. Yeah, <laughs> even as gods, you have you have e- 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 even when you're at the highest strata, you're still stratified. <laughs> There's another thing to note, though. They have the same yellow googly eyes as the uh, as Alant did in 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 the Great One, and that proves that this is Demon Souls too. And with that Clearly. said, <laughs> <laughs> you just had to throw that in there. <laughs> yeah. No, I but uh, but I looked it up. I'm pretty sure these are the exact same eyes. It has absolutely no significance. Don't read anything more into it. But I think those are the same eyes, or like I wouldn't be surprised. It, they look very I similar. Be surprised? I mean, like uh, the channelers in Dark Souls One use uh, what's his name? Uh, 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 Ridiel's uh, R- right? Uh. Yeah, Rydell's uh, uh, voice lines for "Hey, please help me." They just reverse the line when they're doing the oh, 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 they're doing the crazy frenzy <laughs> thing. So I'm like, "Oh, the prisoner became the imprisoner." <laughs> uh. <laughs> uh. So like, hey, maybe you never know. Uh, that's... You never know what they're gonna reuse in from with from. Uh, no, I can't. I can't wait Did... for the uh, Elden Ring DLC if we get one to just be like. Here's all the other stuff we never used. Now we're gonna stop doing these dark fantasy games, and we're gonna make Armored Core again. Leave us alone. <laughs> I can't wait for Armored Core to just play like Dark Souls. Oh. I can't wait. Loki, please don't. I can't wait. Listen, we know our Armored Core games have been hard for us to use. So, <laughs> so. Also, do we stop recording? <laughs> uh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um. Did you stop recording? No, no okay, yet, good. So. Okay, so Loki, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at Loki underscore DS. That's Loki underscore DS. You can also read my website. I cover a lot on Bloodborne, on even some of the stuff that I haven't talked about here isn't yet published. You can read some of that over there. You can also uh, read my stuff on Dark Souls and Demon Souls, and we'll, we'll see what happens with, with Elden Ring in the future. Yeah. This was supposed to be like an hour to hour conversation, but we had a lot oh, to talk about. <laughs> very important Th- thank you so much for having me on i really appreciate it well it's it's always great we we always talk but we never do voice chats anymore we need to do that again it's always fun talking to you well uh, well yeah well to be fair i am i i, I to be fair I, I we need to find the time so. yeah that's true thank you so much uh i'll leave links in the description people follow up on that i'll also leave links to my other stuff and uh you can follow up on that logi thank you so much for coming I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. See you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye.